Instead, he went first to Louisiana to Barclay Air Force Base and then to the Strategic Command in Nebraska. To them, that underscores that this threat is ongoing, that the president wants to monitor it from a safe location to make sure that, in fact, there is not a second wave. Uh, hence his presence with the best minds of the U.S. military and the best technology. I can tell you, speaking to people in the, uh, in the intelligence community, in the legislative community, in the executive branch, they've concluded several things. One, note that all four flights that were hijacked were bound for California. The terrorists wanted the maximum amount of fuel on those planes to cause the worst damage. Secondly, all four planes were Boeing 757 or 767s. Folks at Boeing tell me that they have the same flight deck, that if you can fly one, you can probably fly the other. The hijackers avoided Airbuses or 737s. So there's a strong belief that the terrorists had training in flying airplanes. And in fact, they went on to underscore with me, the investigators, that it's difficult, in fact, to fly a plane right into the World Trade Center at that speed or right into the Pentagon at that speed. You have to know what you're doing. And knowing American pilots as well as you do, the notion that one of our own would do something like that as opposed to try to ditch it uh, is inconceivable to the people I've been speaking to. Uh, lastly, they are very concerned here in Washington about our psyche, our nation, and how we view ourselves. They want to be able to say to the terrorists, you gave us your bet shot, you hurt us, you killed some people, but we will be back stronger and better than ever. And we're going to return to a normal life as soon as we can. That's going to be difficult. You just read all the various cancellations. Uh, one I know about personally, the Congressional Medal of Honor winners. There are 149 still living in the United 249 still living in the country. We're going to meet in Boston this weekend. That's now been canceled. No tougher band of men than those. But they realize trying to get there and conduct themselves in a convention would be extremely difficult. Tim. Uh, uh, financial centers may very well be closed the rest of the week. Brian, back to you. Tim, uh, here's Karen Hughes at the FBI, I'm our first briefing of the day. You all on the activities of the federal government in response to this morning's attacks on our country. As you heard from President Bush a short time ago, the federal government is acting to help local communities with search and rescue and emergency management operations, to take all appropriate precautions to protect our citizens, and to identify those responsible for these despicable attacks on the American people. While some federal buildings have been evacuated for security reasons and to protect our workers, your federal government continues to function effectively. We have a federal emergency response plan, and at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. We began to implement it immediately after the first attack in New York this morning. We contacted American forces and embassies throughout the world and place them on high alert. The United States Secret Service immediately secured the President, the Vice President, and the Speaker of the House, and they are all safe. They have also secured members of the National Security Team, the President's Cabinet, and senior staff. As you know, President Bush was in Sarasota, Florida when the first attack occurred this morning. Air Force One has now landed at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, and the President is in a secure location. He is in continuous communication with the Vice President and key members of his Cabinet and National Security Team. Vice President Cheney and our National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice are in a secure facility at the White House. I have just come from there. The Secretary of Transportation and other members of our White House senior staff are gathered at a command center there, and we are coordinating with other branches of our federal government. The Secretary of Defense remains at the Pentagon, and the Secretary of State is en route back to Washington from his trip to South America. President Bush is conducting a meeting of the National Security Council as we speak. They are meeting President Bush from his location and other members from different locations in Washington and other locations. As many of you have been reporting, 
the Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. International flights were diverted to alternate locations outside of the United States. Transportation Secretary Mineta has directed the Federal Aviation Administration to suspend operations until at least noon tomorrow. So no airline flights will operate until at least then and until the FAA announces that operations will be resumed. Secretary Mineta has also issued orders controlling the movement of all vessels in United States navigable waters. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has activated eight urban search and rescue task forces in New York, and four of these highly trained teams are at work here in Washington at the Pentagon. Every federal agency has implemented continuity of operations plans to make sure the government continues to function effectively. While the markets closed today because of the situation in Manhattan, the United States financial system has continued to operate. Banks have been open all day. The Federal Reserve has operated regularly and continuously. The Department of Health and Human Services has mobilized medical personnel and supplies to provide help to local authorities who are working so diligently to respond and try to help the victims of these terrible attacks. President Bush has committed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to identify and bring to swift justice those responsible for these despicable attacks. The Department of Justice is setting up a hotline for families who fear that their relatives may have been victims of one of these attacks, and we will be announcing that telephone number shortly. Our fellow citizens and our freedom came under attack today, and no one should doubt America's resolve. President Bush and all our country's leaders thank the many Americans who are helping with rescue and relief efforts. We ask our fellow Americans for your prayers for the victims, for their families, for the rescue workers, and for our country. Thank you all very much, and we will continue to update you as information is available and confirmed. Uh, Tim Russert, are you still with us? Yes, sir. I, I have to ask you a style point. Uh, we've got the president in an underground bunker in Omaha, Nebraska, and the person calming the American people is Karen Hughes, uh, a White House staff member. Uh, is it fair to ask, where is uh, Dick Cheney? Where is, at minimum, the National Security Advisor? Uh, counsel to the President, Karen Hughes, exactly right there, Brian, briefing from the Pentagon. The first question you heard being asked of Hughes as she walked from the podium was, why isn't the President coming back to Washington? Is he coming back to the White House? Uh, Ms. Hughes will say, I'm sure the President's conducting a national security meeting right now. That's the highest priority. I have little doubt that we will hear from the President of the United States uh, certainly th late this afternoon or this evening. Uh, it is absolutely mandatory that he address the nation, and I'm sure he'll do just that. Uh, whether or not he should be doing so now, whether he should come back to Washington, I guess there'll be a lot of armchair quarterbacking and second guessing. But clearly, at this moment, at this crisis, uh, the nation yearns for leadership and will be wanting to hear, and I assume we'll be hearing relatively soon from the President of the United States. Will, will it be said that this is a case of forgetting who the customers are and uh, that you've got a nation full of shaken up people, some kids have gone home from school and uh, as you mentioned it might be nice to to see that the top levels of government are are functioning and up and running. It, it's, uh, it's, it's very disconcerting and rare to not know where Air Force One is headed. How many times does that happen in a lifetime? Uh, certainly not in mine. Uh, I remember certainly some of the uh, seismic events in my lifetime, the assassination of, of John Kennedy, uh, certainly was one, the bombing, Oklahoma bombing. And it is essential at those times of mourning and healing and crisis and tragedy uh, that we be, in fact, bound together as an American family. Uh, but that's why I want to underscore when I asked people the question why the president had gone to Omaha rather than back to Washington, they said um, we're not going to comment on any kind of security matters or precautions, uh, but if 
We did not think there was a possibility of a continuing wave of perhaps more terrorism or violence. We wouldn't have taken that precaution or that step. Uh, we're going to have to wait to see uh, just exactly what played out and why that decision was made. Uh, Tim, uh, th these times also call for perspective, and I'm afraid uh, the perspective is being made up as we go along here. This, there's no roadmap for this time. Never. You know, when we think about Pearl Harbor, an analogy that's been used all day long, 2,400 Americans died at Pearl Harbor by an enemy we knew. It appears that today's death count is going to be in the thousands and injured far beyond that by someone that we can't put our hands around their neck. Although, Brian, many of the people I spoke to today are convinced that something was going to happen in the United States by a terrorist, they are stunned, absolutely bowled over by the magnitude and the precision of what we watch today. But they also think, because of the magnitude and precision, there will be footprints, and we will be able to ascertain who did this uh, and, and, and with some sense of certainty, and then I believe you will see the whole force of the United States government and Democrats, Republicans, Independents, one nation saying, never again. Tim, I said to somebody earlier, the, the anger that followed Pearl, Pearl Harbor was manifested in the, the scene you saw like in uh, uh, Times Square in New York, young guys elbowing each other out of the way so they could have the honor of signing up to volunteer and go overseas. How do you reckon the anger will be manifested this time? Oh, it is absolutely there. Everywhere I've called, everyone I've talked to, from United States senators, the high-ranking officials, the former officials, the first thing they said is, can you believe, and I'll say it, those bastards use all the fuel they could get to hurt as many and kill as many people as we could. Uh, it, people are outraged by this. They want to bring someone to justice, and there will be enormous pressure uh, to do that. The key now is for the president and his team to reassure the nation that we are safe, we are secure, but we are going to be unrelenting in identifying and punishing those who did this to our fellow Americans. Uh, some will say that uh, for, for that to happen, we got to see uh, the American president. And uh, Tim, perhaps you can expand on this. We say, uh, without hyperbole, he's in a, he was seen going into an underground bunker at this uh, uh, Air Force base in Omaha, Nebraska. Perhaps you can repeat, why Omaha? It is the strategic command center, Brian. It is the nerve center of all our very best technology. Uh, it is where any kind of attack would be orchestrated and, and, and begun. Uh, normally the president obviously would communicate by hotline or telephone or nuclear code. The fact that he is there underscores how seriously he and this administration are taking this crisis. The fact that Dick Cheney and Condoleezza Rice, the National Security Advisor, are together in a situation room in the White House underscores how serious this is. Uh, I believe that we saw Karen Hughes because people were looking for guidance, looking for information, wondering, we had heard from the mayor of New York, the governor of New York, where was the federal government in all this? We now have heard from a staff member of the president. I believe before too long we will hear once again from the president of the United States after he completes his national security meeting. It is not only important, it is his obligation. Uh, he is the commander-in-chief of our nation, a nation under attack, and we are looking for, for guidance and for ultimately uh, for results. And no president uh, since FDR has been handed such a uh, formidable domestic challenge as the one this young president from Texas has just been handed, Tim. And these, these are the times when Americans make flash, visceral, gut decisions. Do I like him or not? Am I confident that he is running the country or not? Do I feel safe? Is this a good time to raise children? Did he lead us in right. this crisis, period? You know, suddenly, Brian, the Social Security lockbox and all the finger pointing over tax cuts is all so meaningless, so unimportant. This now is Americans under attack, and we are looking to a president to lead us at this critical time. And it's how people make their judgments and take the measure of a person. And George W. Bush, I would assume, understands that ever so completely.
Tim Russert, thank you so much. And I imagine you and I will uh, be talking a few more times here as the hours and days play out. Our Washington Bureau Chief, moderator of Meet the Press, Tim Russert, from our Washington Bureau. It is 4 o'clock p.m. in the East Coast. This morning, people in the city of New York thought that an aircraft had accidentally run into one of the two twin towers that made, past tense, made up the World Trade Center in New York. Later, a few minutes later, a second commercial aircraft hit the second of two towers. In this picture, confirming the worst fear, and that was a coordinated terrorist attack. It would not be the last target of the day. The Pentagon was hit by a commercial aircraft. A fourth hijacked aircraft has gone down in the state of Pennsylvania. This is a live picture of the damage at the Pentagon. This country has been under and was under for some time this morning a coordinated and serious overseas terrorist attack. The President of the United States, based on the last report, was in an underground bunker uh, in an Air Force base in Omaha, Nebraska. The Vice President and National Security Advisor are said to be linked to him by either video conference or conference call during a national security meeting. And thus far, the briefing on the status of the federal government has come from Karen Hughes, the former local television reporter turned communications expert for the campaign who was a counselor to the president in the White House. Ms. Hughes assuring reporters without taking questions that all was well and all appropriate steps were being taken on the federal level to make sure the United States comes out of this okay. That is to say, uh, with a uh, minimum of damage and loss of life. You are looking live, however, at the southern tip of the city of New York, the island of Manhattan. Lower Manhattan has been transformed, some say, forever. The World Trade Center, the two gleaming towers, 110 stories each, are now gone. They were a part of life and city, certainly a part of the skyline of the city, now both of them having crumbled and fallen away. Again, each hit by a different commercial airliner in a bizarre, almost unbelievable uh, act of uh, coordination, act of terrorism, and according to the president earlier today, act of cowardice. This still photo shows the flames from two fully loaded fuel tanks rocketing through the newly sliced open midsection of the top of one of the World Trade Towers, the tower that hadn't already been hit. Later on, while television news cameras were trained on the buildings, the collapse came, first one and then the other, some say after secondary explosions. It was as grim, as grisly a scene as anyone can remember in the continental United States. People were seen falling from buildings from the uh, windows of the Trade Center during the collapse and the death toll uh, is being predicted to be uh, perhaps in the thousands. One of the hospitals bearing the brunt of the uh, injured of the deceased in Lower Manhattan, St. Vincent's Hospital in Greenwich Village, our own Monica Novotny has been there on the scene for us all day. Monica, what's the situation right now? Well, Brian, St. Vincent's is one of two major trauma centers in the area. The other is Bellevue Hospital. This is where the most seriously injured victims are being brought. The latest numbers from St. Vincent's are as follows. 256 patients have been brought in thus far. 25 of those are in critical condition. Three of those victims did pass away. They were massive crush injuries. Two actually died in the emergency room. One did make it up to the operating room, was in the middle of a procedure, but simply could not make it. Massive crush injuries. However, the concern here is that this rescue effort really has just begun because these numbers are so low. 30 of the, of the victims are firefighters and police and rescue workers because, as you can imagine, the work that they're doing out there is so incredibly difficult. As far as coordination goes, this hospital can handle two to three times what they're dealing with so far, but because they are a trauma center, they are trying to keep only the most critically injured victims there. 21 patients so far have actually been ferried across the Hudson and to Staten Island, just south of Manhattan, so they are really attempting
attempting to spread out the victims to the various hospitals to keep the workload uh, in, in some force reasonable because, again, the worst prediction now that we have heard from hospital spokesmen is they believe the digging will, conti will begin and continue throughout the night, and that is their biggest concern. They have six units in the field at this point. Uh, the injuries so far include several severe burns, also people who were hit by falling debris. There are many people with fractures coming in. They also say many inhalation injuries. Apparently there was rubber burning in the basement of one of the towers, and the smoke had made its way up the elevator shaft, causing some very severe inhalation injuries to people in that building. Now, as I stand here, ambulances continue to roll in with the victims. That has not stopped. The community reaction, though, Brian, in this neighborhood has been unbelievable, incredibly strong. Most stores in the neighborhood are are closed, but many people are sending over food and drink for all of the staff and rescue workers who cycle through the hospital. The neighborhood, I took a walk around, it's already full of signs, handwritten signs. People are asking for blood donations. I spoke to you earlier and we talked about the fact that hundreds of New Yorkers had lined up at the hospital earlier today to donate. They'd actually come up with these makeshift signs and were organized and lined up by blood type. Well, city buses have come through now and they are transporting those people to other hospitals, to other facilities where, actually, where they can actually take the blood because obviously the folks at St. Vincent's are busy with the more serious work. I also took a walk over about a block away from here. They have set up a patient service center for people looking for loved ones who were either in the buildings there or perhaps on the planes. Uh, so that is just around the corner from the hospital in coordination with the hospital at the New School University. And I, now, Brian, of course, is the most difficult part as the stories will be told. I saw one man, a young man in his 20s, his name was David. He told us that he was on the phone with his mother at the time, she said this was after the first plane had hit the tower. She was on a floor above that. She was on the phone saying, we're going to die here. We can't get out. And then the phone went dead. Also another man in a red T-shirt. He was in his 40s walking inside the building just saying simply to the folks working there, I'm trying to find information about my son. He works in the World Trade Center. So the story is just beginning to come in at this point. And also we should point out that the folks who are working hard at all of these area hospitals have links to people in those buildings as well, because while New York is considered such a major metropolitan area, for many people who live here know it is a small city. There was one nurse who was actually in the hospital emailing her husband immediately after that first plane crashed into the building. He also worked on a floor above that crash. Within a few minutes, of course, those emails stopped initially. She did not know why uh, until she tuned back into the news. So. People are very personally affected here. The staff at the hospital reacting with disbelief, but rolling up their sleeves and getting to work. That is the latest here from St. Vincent's Hospital in Greenwich Village. Brian, back to you. Monica Novotny, thank you for that and for your reporting all day uh, as we continue to, to gauge reaction and uh, almost uh, uh, find out people's uh, uh, advice on how uh, the U.S., the administration, should proceed here other than... Uh, the uh, almost uh, axiomatic traditional rallying around the president that Americans have uh, so often done when times have turned tough. We're joined by uh, the former chair of the Senate Armed Services Committee, the uh, veteran uh, former Georgia Democratic Senator Sam Nunn. Uh, uh, Senator, thank you for coming on. Good to talk to you again. Thank you. Uh, your, your thoughts uh, today, having watched this coverage, and what is foremost in your mind, Senator? Well, solidarity here at home with the president, but below the president, also governors, mayors, and those on the front line. I think we all have to recognize now in this era of terrorism and vulnerability at home that our front lines are no longer just our fighting troops abroad, but also our policemen, firemen, and our health officials. The public health system here in America is on the front line of defense against this kind of uh, attack, and it certainly it would come into play if we had a weapon of mass destruction. So we are in a different era, but uh, it's up to America to basically show solidarity at home and really expect solidarity abroad in condemning this act from all over the civilized world. Pre the president, Senator, is in a tough spot. Uh, how, uh, uh, how good uh, do you think the council is he's getting? He, uh, he said he was trying to put together the, the best collection to be around him. Uh, it's considered that his relationship with his vice president is probably the closest in modern history, that he has the most 
active uh, and well-experienced vice president of modern history, uh, but uh, he's in a very tough spot in terms of reacting. It's been said today that America's in a state of war. We just don't know who the enemy is exactly quite yet. Well, he is in a tough spot, Brian. I'm not here. I didn't hear every word, but I, I think I've got the drift of it. And we do have a good team of people together. Dick Cheney has a lot of experience. Uh, President Bush is certainly surrounded by people with uh, considerable experience, Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, Secretary of Defense. So we're in good hands. We have our military. We have our dedicated people out there on the front lines, as I mentioned, who are health people and who are firemen and police. So this country will rally together. We've done it before, and I think we'll rally behind the president. He is going to have to be visible. He is going to have to give uh, uh, signals to the country about continuity, about protecting our way of life and our values, about being calm and making sure we don't overreact because that's exactly what uh, the terrorists intend for us to do. They'd like for us to basically uh, panic and, and so overreact that we actually change uh, America. And we will not do that, and we must not. Uh, Senator, are you troubled at all by the president's uh, choice of locations, uh, this, this bunker in Omaha, Nebraska? I'm not troubled by where he is. He needs to be secure. I do think he needs to also be visible, though. I think he needs to have uh, contact with the American people frequently. He needs to get his best experts around him to help advise him, and he needs to get the right kind of spokespeople out there, uh, not simply the standard people, but people who can tell us about the health uh, and the rescue missions and things of that nature. So uh, protecting him is part of, uh, of what we have to do, but also he needs to be uh, certainly in communication with the American people. Wherever he is, he's president of the United States, and uh, with our modern communication, the location's not nearly as important as the decision. Well, thank you very much for uh, your views, your expertise on this horrible day for all Americans. Uh, uh, the veteran uh, Sam Nunn, Democrat of the state of Georgia, uh, veteran of the U.S. Senate, that is. Uh, Senator, thank you. Uh, we mentioned earlier that uh, everyone had been in their own way kind of uh, Girding for bad news, uh, the old expression, the title six degrees of separation comes to mind. Uh, we were thinking about uh, how, how people may learn uh, bad news about those close to them or faces, names we may know in the public eye. It appears that uh, Barbara Olson, the wife of U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson, a well-known, um, high-visibility conservative commentator on television, was on board the commercial plane that uh, crashed at the Pentagon today. Um, evidently, uh, uh, there was a report uh, that she had actually placed a phone call from the plane, so far unconfirmed. But Barbara Olson, a uh, longtime attorney, happens to be married of, uh, to U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson, uh, who uh, argued the uh, Bush case before the Supreme Court during the election standoff it's been confirmed, was on the aircraft that uh, crashed at the Pentagon uh, today. Uh, with another angle on all of this, as we continue to look into what uh, happened today, uh, Lester Holt is standing by. Lester? It was an office off at Air Force Base in this underground command center. Uh, I think we have the, from our browser the, the website showing a little bit of an inside look at this center. It's a, it's a two-level, 14,000-square-foot reinforced concrete and steel structure. This is the place where, on the president's order, they can transmit important information to strategic aircraft, submarines, and missile forces. What we're saying is they can run war from this place. In time of war, they can seal it off to the outside world. It's got its own emergency water sources, power supply, rations. Uh, it's it's uh, hardened with electromagnetic pulse protection from uh, from any nuclear weapons, and, and not to sound alarmist, I'm just telling you the capabilities of this place, and it is a place where the president can be in full contact with whoever he needs to talk to, uh, with not only secure voice communications, but uh, satellite uh, video transmissions as well. He can essentially run the show from there in about as secure a place as, uh, as the U.S. can afford him. Plus, of course, it is in the center of the country uh, where the uh, military has run its strategic operations uh, all through the Cold War. So this is the place that the president has chosen. And, uh, Brian, as you pointed out, it, it is certainly, if nothing else, symbolizes the, the fact the administration, uh, the government, believes this threat may be continuing and ongoing. 
Lester Holt, thank you. Uh, and uh, let's see uh, where would we like to. Uh, we, we're going to dip in on some of the coverage, and it has been a day-long effort in a city that is in full crisis mode uh, by our New York station, WNBC-TV in New York. I thought we'd listen in here for a while. Uh, generally, we're also curious as to what is still burning that creates the extraordinary smoke plume uh, there on the ground where the Twin Towers once stood. Let's listen in again. This is the coverage of WNBC-TV here in the New York area. Lines. He's flown for them for 22 years. The most recent years as a captain on a 767. Jim Oganowski, speaking of his brother, John, who was the pilot of American Airlines 11, which was the first plane to hit the first World Trade Center building this morning. Poignant moment when he said, I keep looking at the cornfield behind me and hoping my brother will walk out of it. Now, now. Chuto is about 50 or 60 Palestinian teenagers or young guys uh, in the streets who are angry at the Israelis. Mr. Rahman, who uh, anywhere in the world, in your mind, has uh, such a large grudge against the United States that they would want to carry out such an act? Again, as I said, it would be very imprudent for me and irresponsible to try to speculate at this point. Okay, but can you say definitively that there is no Palestinian organization well, I, that I, at I, least... I, that, no, 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 I'm, 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 I want to put a finer point on it, that, has, that, that even has the kind of uh, sophisticated coordination and planning and perhaps even weaponry uh, to coordinate something uh, that is... Listen, I, I would say that... Uh, President Arafat made a statement to that effect. All the Palestinian organizations did the same thing, including Hamas and others. So I uh, have no reason to believe that there is Palestinian involvement in it. And as I said, whoever is responsible, whether it is Palestinian, American, Jewish, Christian, Hindus, they should be punished for this crime. Mr. Rahman, uh, if, you, if you wouldn't mind hanging on just a second. Mr. Eagleburger, you've uh, heard Mr. Rahman. Uh, do you believe that the uh, protestations and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the quick statements to avoid blame are to be believed? From, from the Taliban or the Palestinians or anybody? Well, I think you have to parse it out. First of all, we all know perfectly well that the Taliban has been housing and comforting Osama bin Laden for years. Uh, whether they had anything to do with this immediate event or not, the fact of the matter is they're responsible for having mothered him for a long time. I suspect that it is, I suspect, I'm reasonably confident that in fact the Palestinians did not have anything directly to do with this. But we missed the point to a degree when we talked this way. First of all, uh, I'm afraid I think uh, a number of Palestinians, more than just children, assault on the United States and New York City, especially four airlines, four flights, apparently hijacked. We don't know all the details about what crashed where, but we do know that four airlines, apparently, at least three of them hijacked, two American Airlines and two United Airlines, uh, one out of Newark, two at least out of Boston, in a coordinated effort and in a terrorist attack on the United States Capitol and on its financial center and the largest city in the country. New York. And Bill, as, as I look at this, I mean, we, we've all been down in that area. You can recognize bits and pieces um, of, of this area, and it encompasses such a broad area down there. It's, it's a huge area that this, that this covers. Uh, it's just amazing to look at this, and that the rubble is, is, is really so flat, considering the, the immensity of both of those buildings. Terrorists tried to bring down the World Trade Center, of course, on February 26, 1993. Six people were killed, a thousand injured. They hurt the infrastructure as that crater, who will ever forget that crater, in the parking garage with that rider truck loaded full of explosives. Mm. They wanted to bring the building down, and today they have succeeded doing it by hijacking apparently two commercial airliners and within moments of each other flying them directly into the World Trade Centers. Um, I said this was a local, national and worldwide story. I want to talk a little bit about local. It's hard to imagine if you didn't get out of the building as we said that anyone survived, but the hospitals, 170 hospitals in the city, all busy. 600 people in local hospitals, another 150 critically 
wounded. Jay, Dr. Jay Adlersberg here with us, our, our doctor here at Eyewitness News. What happens when, in that kind of situation? What kind of triage goes on? What, does the, what do the medical staffs do in a situation like that? When there are so many people coming in, Bill, the first thing to do is to meet the ambulances at the gate to the emergency room, determine which patients are the sickest, which patients need to be uh, resuscitated if they, they come in without a, a pulse, uh, which patients require surgery. It's called triage. Everybody's familiar with that term, and it's done uh, as if it were a war zone because so many casualties are coming into these hospitals. And Jay, the likelihood in this kind of situation of the injuries is going to be cuts, mm. burns, smoke inhalation. Can you think of any others? Oh, a major trauma is broken bones, uh, crushed uh, limbs, uh, uh, what are termed flail chests, uh, puncture wounds to the chests. Uh, these are things that are seen in combat, uh, and uh, the opera and most hospitals have an emergency plan to deal with mass casualty situations such as this. And I'm sure every hospital in New York responded uh, with that plan in mind. Uh, most of the uh, uh, emergency uh, uh, injuries went to the operating room, I'm sure. Uh, the cuts uh, were dealt with uh, uh, as anyone would uh, deal with uh, cuts, uh, some suturing, and the and smoke inhalation dealt with appropriately. Right. Well, Jay, one of the, the main hospitals that is dealing with so many injuries uh, is St. Vincent's, and we have Lauren Glassberg there. She is on the phone with us right now to give us an update. Lauren, tell us what's going on right now. Well, just a couple of minutes ago, Mayor Giuliani and Commissioner, Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick addressed the news media that's been gathered here throughout the day, and the mayor really commended the doctor the physicians the they're not saying a whole heck of a lot what they are saying is that they now have accounted for the presence uh, of all of the joint chiefs the service secretaries uh, and of course the secretary of defense those are people who have been accounted for um, what we are now learning is that um, a new part of the Pentagon that uh, is has just been occupied was one of the areas that was terribly hit uh, we believe there are going to be quite a few casualties from the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps in particular, uh, as well as the Defense Intelligence Agency. Do you have any, under, any idea what the num quite a number of casualties means? Uh, no idea whatsoever, Peter. Uh, you consider the density uh, in the Pentagon. There are 20 to 24,000 people that work there. Uh, it took out one huge slice of it. Uh, so you have to do your own arithmetic. Uh, if you look at the size of the gash over my shoulder, uh, you have to believe that there are many, many hundreds of people who died. And what have the briefers had to say this afternoon, John, about the state of alert in the, uh, in the world generally, with all U.S. forces on such a state of alert? I'm sorry, before you go to that, we're just looking at a picture which gives us, I think, the best view yet, if this is an accurate drawing, um, of... of of what the degree of damage or penetration of the plane will have been to the Pentagon. I'm not sure that's absolutely accurate, but by the way, ABC's Ann Compton tells us the president may be on the move again, and ABC's Charlie Gibson has information as well. Charlie? Well, Peter, there's going to be hundreds, I guess, and we don't know the number of personal stories that are going to come out of this, people who have died in the World Trade Center or at the Pentagon or on the airplanes that were hijacked and crashed in various places. We now understand the wife of Ted Olson. He is the Solicitor General of the United States. Mm. America came to know him because he's the man who argued the President's case in front of the Supreme Court, George W. Bush's case in front of the Supreme Court. He was not yet President when the case of the Florida election was being disputed before the Supreme Court. Ted Olson's wife, Barbara, who is a former federal prosecutor herself. She was on the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. We had heard this from friends of the family. Regrettably, it has now been confirmed. She apparently was able to make a phone call to her husband, the Solicitor General, Ted mm -hmm. Olson, and tell him they were being hijacked, that all of those on board the plane, that is American Airlines Flight 77, that had taken off from Dulles Airport heading for Los Angeles this morning, a 757, uh, that had 64 people aboard. All of the passengers had been herded into the back of the plane. Uh, she was able to get a call out saying they were in the process of being hijacked and then shortly after that uh, the plane crashed into the Pentagon. Uh, she was herself, as I say, a former federal prosecutor. She had also become familiar, I think, to many 
uh, in the viewing audience of television as a commentator recently over the situation of Gary Condit. Indeed, I'd had a chance uh, to talk with her a couple of times on Good Morning America just in the past couple of weeks. So we're going to hear hundreds of these stories of people who were killed in, in the various venues that were affected today. But uh, this one, obviously, is very painful, the wife of the Solicitor General of the United States. Peter. Thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, and I, I think in the whole day, this is the first name we've had of anybody who's died. The first name, the first personality, I mean, to hundreds and thousands of families around the country. The names and personalities are all from many familiar people they fear are in trouble, who know they're in trouble, who've been confirmed they're in trouble. The desperation of people at some remote, at, at a distance from people in trouble is just a horrendous thing to report. But I believe that's the first name we've had all day of being able to identify somebody, Barbara Olson, who, as Charlie says, was very often on television, the wife of the Solicitor General, Ted Olson, uh, who died in the suicide attack on the Pentagon. John McCrethy, you still there? It's Peter. Yeah. John, come back to the briefing, if you would. I'm, I'm not sure we've heard everything from you on the briefing itself. Uh, they just are expressing their frustration and at the difficulty of getting rescue workers inside the Pentagon, Peter. Uh, part of the building is still on fire, uh, and the fire is moving to sections of the Pentagon uh, along roofs and along various pipes. Uh, so they're having a real difficulty getting in there even to search for bodies at this early time. That is what they are focused on at this point. I will tell you, Peter, that Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and most of the chiefs uh, have been in the National Military Command Center all day uh, since this terrorist strike. Uh, and you have to leave it up to your own imagination, the kinds of things that they are contemplating uh, in their hours uh, after the strike. Okay, John, thank you very much indeed. John McCrethy, who's been at the Pentagon all day and was in the other side of the Pentagon <coughs> when this aircraft was crashed into the Pentagon today. We now know with all of the passengers on board, at least in this one phone call, herded to the back of the plane. Uh, who went from being passengers to hostages in a, in, in a matter of, of seconds and minutes. Um, and John, who was working on the other side of the Pentagon, has said a couple of times that just on the other side of the Pentagon, you just felt this huge, just knew exactly that something had gone by. And when he first described the, the width of the gash and the height of the gash, six stories high, 200 feet wide, uh, which you can't appreciate on television, quite frankly, as much as you think you can. And, and we've had several reports in from Arthur Raditz at the State Department, um, which I think most of, the, most of them we've had on the air so far, which was the State Department ordered U.S. embassies around the world to close for the day, but it's up to the individual embassy, given, on the, given the situation that they think uh, is appropriate in their region. Many have closed for the day. Uh, Secretary of State Powell, who's been in Colombia, uh, is on his way home tonight, but we do not know actually where he is at, at the moment. I told you just a moment ago that Ann Compton, who's been with President Bush all day, uh, believes that he is on the move, or they are on the move again, and one can only believe, I shouldn't say that, one can only, we didn't think they were going to go to Nebraska, we can only imagine that there's this pressure to get the President back to the nation's capital. And um, the State Department was evacuated at the time. Uh, this world, there's actually been a worldwide caution about terrorist activity out and about uh, universally uh, since the 7th of September, but it had absolutely nothing, nothing whatsoever to do uh, with what happened in New York City and in Washington today and what potentially happened, we we're told, at Camp David based on the information from one passenger who called 911 from the United Airlines that crashed near Johnstown, which said that they were headed in the direction of of, of Camp David. The New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange have both announced that they will not trade tomorrow and they will make a decision tomorrow on when trading will resume. The country has, in many ways, come to a halt, not completely by any means, because every politician has spoken and had a chance to speak today has made the point that if you if you change too much in the country, you're doing exactly what the terrorists and their allies would like you to do. Linda Douglas on Capitol Hill. Linda.
Peter, uh, we've been uh, trying to confirm all day and have confirmed that indeed a very small group of congressional leaders has been taken to a single secure location, absolutely no disclosure yet of where that location is. Uh, they've uh, been meeting uh, together and also have been briefed by Vice President Cheney uh, and are trying to make the decision about whether to go back into session tonight. There is a, a strong sentiment among many members of Congress that it would send a very strong message to the rest of the world if the Congress were to go back into session tonight. Many of the members I've spoken to throughout the day say this is a system in which your constituents are supposed to be able to come to the nation's capital and walk right up to their elected representative and have a conversation. That's the message they want to send, although if they went into session tonight, it would probably be to say a prayer and simply leave. Uh, the the uh, small group of leaders that is uh, in this uh, undisclosed location is uh, going to be uh, conferring with the president may have already and uh, there is very tight security now uh, Peter about their whereabouts and, and President Bush is on his way back to, uh, to to Washington at the moment they're about to take off from this Air Force Base in uh, in, in Nebraska but Linda I, I given just what we heard Senator Biden say earlier today you know there's this expression on Capitol Hill to show the world that the country is up and running Do you think this is pretty likely before the day is over I wonder why the why the Senate leadership is still uh, out of sight, if not out of mind. Well, this is on strong advice from the security forces in the city of Washington, the Capitol Police, the Secret Service, uh, the military, and they've been talking to the CIA. Uh, the two Senate leaders, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier in the day, uh, Senator Daschle, the majority leader, Senator Lott, the Republican leaders were immediately taken out of the Capitol and taken to an undisclosed location. Then later on, other leaders were rounded up. Uh, helicopters came and landed on the Capitol grounds to pick up a few of them and took them out. They didn't have much choice about this. Mm. This is advice they're getting. One more thing, by the way, about security, Peter. There's going to be a briefing for all members of Congress who want to attend, uh, an intelligence briefing at about uh, 5 o'clock. Senator uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton has just shown up to the location where that briefing uh, was going to take place with her Secret Service very much in evidence. Thanks very much, Linda Douglas. So we're going to look for a manifestation sometime tonight of uh, congressional will a con congressional will to show the world that the United States is up and running, but we have no confirmation of that. And I, I must confess, Linda, you, Douglas, you still there? Yes, I am. I didn't realize at first, because nobody ever said it that specifically, that the, that the leader of the Republican Democratic parties in the Senate had been taken out of the city to a secret location. They had just been moved down the street. Yes, that's right. We have been told that they were taken out of the city. Helicopters came and picked them up on the ground, some of them. We don't know which ones got into the helicopters because it was just too far away for us to see and took them out of, uh, out of uh, Washington. But okay. it could be to someplace very close. Thanks very much, Linda Douglas. We're going to go to Lynn Sher and talk about the aircraft involved today in just a minute. Before we do, just want to give you some other examples of how this has affected the country as a whole. The Emmys. Uh, which were going to be held in Los Angeles, the Latin Grammys, which rescheduled uh, uh, their award ceremonies uh, for tomorrow night, I think the Latin Grammys, uh, have now canceled or postponed their particular celebrations. We told you earlier or about some of the other examples, but uh, aside from looking at that list on the screen itself, think of this, aside from the work stoppages, this is the first time this is the first time since D-Day in 1944. And good afternoon. I'm Keith Koontz along with uh, Ann Nyberg at uh, News Channel 8 Studios in New Haven as we continue uh, coverage on this uh, coordinated day of attack on America. Just a terrible day at the World Trade Centers uh, in Washington and outside of Pittsburgh today. Absolutely. An act of war has been staged against America. And we are trying to make sense out of what is happening across the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, as you say, a developing story and will continue to be. Air traffic halted in the nation for the first time in history. And we're getting word that planes will not take off in the United States until noon Eastern time tomorrow, if then. And we've had a lot of uh, developments here in uh, the state of Connecticut, among other things. Governor Rowland says uh, government operations have been uh, relocated to the state armory. You guys going in? Yeah. Come with you. You know, but I don't want to get too much closer because the more buildings that come down, then we're not going to help anybody. All right. I think we should. Yeah. Where's the incident come out? Just, yeah, okay. Let's just wait right here. Let's just station up right here, okay? All right. Why don't we set up? Can you hang IVs from this pole here? Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. We just heard another explosion. They're handing out gloves and masks. The consensus is it's too unsafe to go in there. I'm Carolee Salerno from the Fox 61 Newsroom. We break away from national coverage to give you the latest on what Connecticut is doing in the wake of this attack on America. Governor Rowland is holding his second press conference of the day at the State Armory, and we join him now live there. To step up to the podium. Hi, Carol Lee. This is Shelley Sinland here. We are at the State Armory. We were told that Governor Rowland will be out momentarily. If you can look behind me, we have a, a lot of the governor's commissioners. We're told that they've been meeting behind closed doors for a few hours. Of course, some of the big questions here that we hope to get answered by the governor is a lot of state buildings were closed today. When will they open up? What is on the agenda for tomorrow? Bradley Airport, we're hearing on a national level, according to the FAA, that air no flights will resume at least at the earliest at noon tomorrow. That's another question that we're hoping the governor will answer for us tonight. Um, he addressed the media earlier this afternoon, and his main point then was to keep people in Connecticut safe and to make sure that people who were in New York City this morning can get home. Um, he had talked earlier this afternoon about having buses waiting by in New York City. There was some problems with the train. Service was interrupted. He had talked about having buses there waiting for them so that it would make it easier to get back. Now, I tell you, I've been a reporter for 10 years, and today is a day where we, too, are in mourning. The feeling here is one of shock. We are stunned. No one really knows what to say. Um, Governor Rowland is now approaching the podium along with Lieutenant Governor Jody Rowe. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, take a few moments and uh, update you on Connecticut's response to the tragedy which took place in New York and Washington, D.C. First of all, as I said earlier today, our hearts go to the families, the victims of this horrendous attack. And as I said earlier, our prayers are needed now more than ever. Over the next several days, our focus will be on helping the people of New York cope with the aftermath of this attack. But I want to assure the people of Connecticut that we have no reason to believe that any people, groups, or institutions in the state of Connecticut are a target of today's coordinated efforts. Let me assure the people of Connecticut that we are safe. Our schools are safe. Our buildings are safe. But now it's time for us to lend a hand to our neighbors. We are standing by to assist New York in whatever way we can. I've talked with Governor Pataki twice this afternoon and talked about medical personnel, equipment, any assistance and volunteers that we can bring to the city, anything that we can do over the weeks to come. The scene at the site of the World Trade Center is still chaotic. We've taken steps, however, to stage personnel and machinery in Lower Fairfield County to be ready to respond when the call comes. We anticipate the need to help New York in the rescue and recovery operation. Our National Guard has deployed heavy construction equipment to Fairfield County so it can be moved into New York City as quickly as possible. We also have a number of helicopters on standby for transporting people and equipment to the site of the attack. We have had some casualties being moved to our hospitals here in Connecticut already. Hospitals statewide are preparing to accept those that have been injured if that becomes necessary. Trains have been running twice an hour out of New York City to stops throughout Fairfield and New Haven counties. Those trains are returning to New York for the most part empty. In some cases, volunteers are filling into New York. Obviously, one of our biggest concern is Connecticut residents who may have been working in the World Trade Center building or near the scene in New York City. It's going to take many hours and in some cases perhaps days before we're able to have a full accounting of those who may have been killed or injured during today's attack. Public safety officials in New York will be coordinating the rescue and recovery operations over the next several days. New York City officials will also be working to set up information chain that will enable people from Connecticut, from New Jersey, and New York to check on loved ones. I know how difficult it must be now for people who are waiting to hear about their loved ones. 
people who have been working in New York. But because of the extent of the damage at the scene, it's going to take some time before we're able to come up with answers. Our own Department of Mental Health, our Department of Children and Families, has sent special mobile teams to locations throughout Lower Fairfield County to provide counseling services to those who've been involved or witnessed the attack or have a loved one from New York. I would encourage people, residents across Connecticut, to call our info line, 211, if they have questions about crisis intervention or counseling services, how to talk to your child or children about this terrible tragedy. I've also sent a team of our deputy commissioners, you may have seen them leave earlier today, down to Stanford to provide us with the best information as our residents return from New York City. They're keeping us updated at this command center each and every hour. I'd like to take a moment to thank the people of Connecticut who've offered to help during this tragedy. They've offered their services. We've had construction companies that have offered equipment, hospitals and staff who volunteer and are standing by for help. We're in the process of sending some 80 and 90 of our medical people, military medical people, directly to the site throughout the evening. Thousands of people who have volunteered to donate blood to the Red Cross. Earlier this afternoon, I distributed a phone number to all of you in the press with a website address for individuals, residents in Connecticut who would like to donate blood, which will be severely needed over the days to come. There's going to be a huge demand, and I know that Connecticut residents will respond. I encourage them to be patient as we stand in line to donate blood to respond to this tragedy. Again, I'd ask the people of Connecticut to pray for the victims of today's attacks in New York and in Washington. This is the most horrific act of violence ever committed against our country, ever committed against the people of this nation. I know we'll do everything in our power to seek justice for those responsible. But our main goal now is to help the surviving victims and to help bring comfort to the families of those who have lost a loved one. Again, I want to thank my commissioners and all of our emergency personnel who will be working many hours over the next several days to aid our neighbors in New York City. I'd be happy to take any questions that you have and try to clarify any points that I've tried to make this evening. Mr. Davis? expect the trains will continue out of Manhattan into Connecticut until 8 p.m.? We're expecting the trains to continue uh, about two per hour. And you just heard the latest from uh, Governor Rowland from the State Armory, where he has been all day. This is his second briefing of the day. The governor has mentioned that he has uh, several state services available for families who have possibly relatives or loved ones who might have been in that area. Uh, the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Children and Family. Many uh, workers have been sent down to the Fairfield County area. Two trains will continue. Um, in front of there, the platform is down below, and there are several police workers now on that platform investigating what we were told are reports of a suspicious package. I can tell you that trains are still running here, however, so we don't really have an indication on whether or not they are taking this very seriously, whether they know if, if they were told that it was a bomb or something less serious. We don't know. I can tell you, though, an Acela train just passed us by, so at this point, trains are running on the platforms, and the train station is still open. Now, I can tell you in the last hour or so, we have been witnessing some very tearful reunions as people have been returning home to Connecticut from New York City, their loved ones waiting for them after what has been a very tense and emotional day. We met two people here who were actually in the vicinity of the World Trade Center, and their stories are just dramatic. Here's what they had to say. We're running for our dear lives, just running, grabbing. I grabbed one of my co-workers and just dragged her on the floor as fast as I could, just running, because she shoes were all over the floor. People were jumping out of their offices, burning. Suits were burning on fire, flames everywhere. The Twin Towers were on fire, so I called my girlfriend and, to tell her, and like not even a minute later after I hung up the phone, the second plane came right into it, and just everybody on the street was just like in awe on the whole thing, and just everybody was going crazy, and then I went inside, and then it was just like, I had heard the Pentagon and everything, and then it was bigger than just New York City. 
amazing stories there. Now, both of those people actually live in New York City near the World Trade Center, and they say they were just too fearful to even go back to their apartments and see what's going on in the area, so they came here to Connecticut to be with family and loved ones. I can also tell you that there is a group of EMR ambulance workers, paramedics here at the train station. They say they are here just for protective purposes in case any of those people coming back from New York City need help. They don't expect to see any serious cases. They're here to tend to what they call the walking wounded. Of course, we'll continue to monitor this situation with the so-called suspicious package, and Anna and Keith will have an update coming up. Back to you. Oh, right. So many stories, Andrea, and we're going to be hearing from uh, two people who are actually landing yeah. in New York uh, momentarily about what they saw as the, one of the right. towers fell in New York City. Right now, we want to go uh, down to Stamford, the uh, Metro North Station there, which has been very, very busy, as uh, you've no doubt seen from the pictures. Uh, hordes of people are leaving uh, Grand Central Station in Manhattan, trying to get out any way they can. Trains, Metro North trains have been running uh, continuously since uh, the middle of the day. Let's go live to Aaron Cox. Now, Aaron, have you seen any of uh, what Andrea described as the walking wounded coming off any of those trains? Only if you can say people being dazed and confused and just absolutely relieved to be back in Stamford or anywhere along the shoreline tonight. As you can see, in fact, a train is just pulling in right now. You can see folks are getting out of the train after a difficult day in New York City. We also want to update you and tell you that the State Police Command Center, as the governor has said, is now here set up in Stamford. That's on the other side of the train station. Also, as Andrea said, medical crews are right here at the train station ready to assist people if they come off. We'll show you some video of that. The crews have been here since early this morning. In fact, we've seen some of the, the number of ambulances decrease within the last hour or so. We're down from a dozen to a, just about four ambulances which are here. Everyone coming off these trains is relieved and every one of them has a story to tell about what they saw and how hard it was to get out of the city. My family is scared, so, you know, it's, there are multiple reasons. It didn't seem to me a smart thing to do. We were watching, and a few minutes later, we saw the second one go out. Then I was on the train, and I thought I was shook up, and a girl sitting across from me had been in the second tower, and she said she saw bodies falling from the first tower. I highly doubt that any of us will be going to work in the world tomorrow. We also want to tell you that helicopters have been bringing some of the injured from New York City to Stanford Hospital. They've flown from Manhattan to Stanford Hospital. Mayor Dan Malloy telling us that this afternoon. We want to tell you that trains are running to Grand Central Station at this hour. Remember, some folks who work here in Stanford or Norwalk or South Norwalk are trying to get back to New York City tonight. But, of course, not many folks taking advantage of that and getting on the trains here tonight. Ann and Keith, a lot of folks coming down here who normally wouldn't pick up their husband or their wife from a day of work. They're all coming down here today because, remember, their cell phones didn't work. Sure. So some folks showing up for that regular pickup and hoping praying that someone's getting off the train. Back to you. So, so Aaron, we know uh, a lot of trains are coming from Manhattan. Uh, nothing being allowed into Manhattan at this hour, and we don't anticipate that, correct? Well, actually, Keith, the, we just heard an announcement, and they said that the trains are running into hmm. Grand Central, but not many folks getting on. Earlier, they had only been going on the Harlem line, Harlem Hudson line, up to Mount Vernon, but we just heard the announcement that they're going into Grand Central, but not many folks are on the all train. All right, Aaron, thank you so much. We've been talking all day about how Connecticut is coming together, as the governor has asked, to help the people of New York City and yeah, of Washington, D.C. Blood drives will be held all over the state, and you can 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. Uh, you can go and give blood. But also also, that is interesting. Um, all Connecticut hospitals are on alert. In fact, they're right. they are canceling uh, elective surgery. They're even uh, those people who really do not need to be hospitalized. They are getting them out of there so that they can ex accept some of the wounded that they are expecting to be coming in from New York City. And we've also uh, certainly a lot of uh, schools involved. Uh, a lot of uh, parents work in in New York City. So this has been a, a tragedy that has affected uh, so many people in Connecticut. Uh, I want to go now to uh, our reporter Sarah. Sarah Welch, who uh, has re interviewed a, a victim. Now, Sarah, uh, give us a little more information. Was this somebody who was in Manhattan near the Trade Centers when all this happened? Well, Keith and Ann, this gentleman from Oxford, Connecticut, was in one of the World Trade Center buildings when the explosions occurred. And it was just absolutely heartbreaking to speak with him as he was escorted by his family this afternoon. He told us of the absolute horror and pandemonium as people desperately tried to get out of the building. 
10 or 2. I was on the 24th floor. And uh, the first plane hit, and the building rocked to the right and back. And I opened the door of the uh, conference room, and I saw the plane go by, and people falling. It's all right, Dad. And, uh, and uh, then we started to go down the stairs, and uh, this, we got down to about 16, and all the doors on the World Trade Center, they lock. So I got, we got down to about, uh, probably about 15 or 13, or 14, and I said, you know, it was just a traffic jam for people trying to get down. And I said, everybody back up, back up. Everyone was yelling, back up. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. I just want to get home. I want to get you home. And uh, we went back up. I'm starting to calm down now. <laughs> we went back up. Do you want to stop for a second? No, no, no. I just want to go home. We went back up. We regrouped. Brandy, where's the car? The firemen started coming through. And uh, they let us down. Company 22 in New York City. Freaking heroes. <laughs> Not one of them had fear in their eye. They all just kept going up, and we got down to the bottom in the plaza. There was bodies everywhere. They were all on fire and broken. It was just the most horrific thing you've ever seen in your life. And uh, and uh, then we got out, and uh, I had a thing of oxygen in my hand and a fire extinguisher, and I almost carried it three blocks before I even realized I had it. And. Uh, then I just bumped into this guy, and uh, we just started walking, and we walked up from the Trade Center to 33rd Street, and uh, everybody was lined up trying to hitchhike out of the tunnel. It was like, you know, and this guy pulled up in a, in a uh, pickup truck and drove me all the way to the ferry, and I got home. Absolutely heartbreaking story from this gentleman who was in one of the buildings when the explosions occurred this morning. You know, after he got into his car, his wife hugged me and said she was just so grateful that she had her husband home and that he was safe and that their family's prayers went out to so many other families who are now caught up in this tragedy. Keith and Ann. You know, Sarah, uh, one thing that that gentleman said, and it is just uh, gut-wrenching to listen to him, is I just wanted to go home. And that's uh, a lot of people we, we are seeing coming out of New York City on board the train. And uh, as we're talking to you, um, we've just been handed uh, the New Haven Register. It's obviously a special edition. If, if, that, if a special edition from the New Haven Register, if we can just come in, come in yeah, on this, can this, if you can. The Register, obviously, a, a morning paper, but uh, has come out with a, a special extra edition uh, uh, because, obviously, of this attack uh, on America this afternoon. Uh, we are all sharing this together, the worst attack on the United States in its history, mm. and uh, the stories are just gut-wrenching. And um, yeah. as the governor said, our, our prayers go out to everybody mm. and the untold numbers of Connecticut victims um, one can only imagine. And uh, our News Channel Light reporter Chris Villardi uh, has talked to some people who uh, were in Connecticut uh, limousines en route to uh, New York City, the airports of the New York City area at the time of these uh, attacks, the initial ones this morning, and uh, he joins us now with uh, his report. Chris? Well, as you know, Connecticut Limo makes a business out of getting people in and out of New York to the airports from the airports. Well, all of this happened and the airports all shut down and all day long, I spent the day at the headquarters of Connecticut Limo where they're trying to get people home safely. All right, buddy, let me know. Well, people are just kind of, they want to get home. Uh, we've got some vehicles right now down in the uh, New York area that uh, are not able to cross over any of the bridges uh, uh, waiting to cross uh, back to Connecticut or back to at least uh, the Bronx over the Whitestone and Throgs Neck. The dispatch center has been in touch with the buses and the limos that are full of people trying to get them back from the airport. These are people who maybe made it to the airport and found out their flights were canceled or maybe landed early this morning. Unfortunately, Manhattan, as you know, is an island, and the only way to get around it or near it is over bridges. And with bomb threats coming into many of those bridges, many of the bridges had been closed sporadically, and it has been quite the struggle to get people home. Connecticut Limo has been getting a lot of calls from people saying, I'm waiting for someone. Do you know what's going on? And they're also concerned, obviously, about their drivers. So certainly it is a slow, slow afternoon and a slow process for them. One thing that I noticed in, in spending a lot of time there this afternoon is that because there weren't limos going out to the airports by about 11 o'clock, it was pretty clear that wasn't going to happen. People were standing around watching TV. And I think what was so difficult is that because they were all at work, 
it was very hard for all of this to sink in, as I think it is for all of us. We are in New Haven. Back to you guys. As we talk to you and we continue our coverage, we just want to show you, we just showed you this special edition of the New Haven Register and uh, the Pentagon under attack. This is just, it's starting to, to, to come home, what, what has happened. Yeah. And looking at some of these images and what has happened to our nation uh, it is uh, just unbelievable. Un unthinkable. Uh, as you know, uh, the nation's airports have been uh, shut down since the middle of, of today. Uh, Bradley yeah. International uh, six, among six. them. News Channel 8's Jody Latina has been at Bradley all day, and she joins us now uh, with a report from there. Jody? Keith and Ann, for about six hours now, Bradley International Airport has been shut down. The common thread throughout the country is that fear factor. We're going to show you some video from earlier in the day. The tower making the call at roughly a quarter to 11 this morning, telling folks to grab their bags. They would not be leaving the airport today. Those two situations, our emergency response teams are there on the ground. They've secured the planes. They are in contact and in discussions with the pilots. And so they are in the process of uh, determining what action to be taken. So that is an ongoing and active investigation that is evolving as we speak. Anything else about what the situation was? Well, we are in the process of trying to determine that. That's We are actually in active discussions with the pilots to determine what to do here at this point in time. Suzanne Wallet, Radio Radio Canada. Two points, first of all. When you say that you've increased security, what were your priorities? And when donations, the Newport Mall in Jersey City has been set up as a refuge area here in New York City for anybody, in Jersey City rather, for anybody who can't possibly get home. Reporting live from Exchange Place, I'm Pat Battle. We're going to turn it back over to you in the studio. All right, Pat, Pat, thank you very much. Katie McGee is standing by right now with shadow traffic with the latest on the traffic situation in our area. Katie? Well, Chuck, it has been a very long day. Now, I can tell you that we just got off the phone with NYPD, and what they've done is open some authorized routes for emergency personnel outside of the city that would like to come in and offer to volunteer their services, that being firefighters, police, medical workers. What you can do is if you'd like to head in to help, they will allow you through from the LIE into the Midtown Tunnel, the Verrazano Bridge to the Battery Tunnel, New York State Thruway to the Deegan down to the Triborough Bridge, and the GWB and down the West Side Highway. Of course, you will need to show proof of ID, but again, where they are really looking for help. So if you are an authorized personnel, those are the best ways to get into town. Now, let's get you updated on a couple of closures that we have had and what is reopened. Let's start off with some much greater a presence it is in our lives than we had expected. We're told that tomorrow the Congress will convene at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we're told that they plan to pass a resolution or resolutions condemning terrorism and then immediately adjourn. You're looking at a live picture of the United States Capitol, the flag flying at half staff there. Uh, now that is the White House, that's next to the executive office building, but the other picture we saw was a flag flying at half staff near the United States Capitol building. Now back to Joey Chen in Atlanta. Judy, thanks very much. We're joined here on the set by Miles O'Brien, who is our resident pilot and certainly has quite a bit of understanding about the where's and why for's and what significance they might have in putting together what happened. Miles has some additional information now, and that's really important to understanding who might have done this and why. Well, this is sort of our first clue as to what's going on. Obviously, more information will come out as the air traffic control tapes and hopefully the cockpit voice recordings come out. But just take a look at this. These are actual, this is actual archival information from the radar tracks. Uh, from the FAA uh, ground centers. And these are the two planes which ultimately ended up at uh, the World Trade Centers, the two towers. Both of them left uh, Boston within 15 minutes of each other. Both were headed to Los Angeles, perhaps no coincidence, heavily laden with fuel. Both of them made extreme and noticeable deviations and were heading in the wrong direction for 30, perhaps 40 minutes, uh, thus clearly causing, giving uh, air traffic controllers quite a bit of attention. There must have been some communication back and forth. It's but unclear this now. This is certainly something the air traffic control folks would have seen. They would have seen these things clearly. coming up close. And, and the fact that two planes were doing this must have seemed odd. We don't know what the conversations were, but it, suffice to say that would be odd. Now take a look at this flight. This is United 93. This took off from... ...to be here now and then realize what happened. Yeah. And, uh, We'll run this again because I think this is the, this is, when we run that again, Roger Goodman, that's Roger Goodman, our director, because this is, 
We've seen footage before of people on the run, and I understand that that's your shadow as you went by a storefront. Yeah, it right? was. It's the first time I've seen that. And, and was there absolute panic Im immediately? Could instantly. It was just pandemonium. Um, nobody knew what to do. Uh, there was no clear thinking. People were just reacting to kind of save themselves and, and the this people is around them. You're in the same location when the building comes down. I, I had been taken downstairs by Port Authority police who knew that I had this videotape. And we were moving actually to go back to the Trinity Church to make them a dub of the tape in a format that they could use on a VHS tape. And uh, suddenly I heard one of the guys say, hey, Evan, watch out. Hang on just a second. If you look in the upper, look, in, this now is frozen. And this is, I, this is an angle of this attack that we have not seen before. At the top of the building on your left, out of the left, will come the building. And watch how the aircraft penetrates the building. Go ahead. Completely in one side and out the other. It just or disappeared. It disappeared nose. like like a bad special effect. It disappeared right into the building. I've seen it six, seven times. Good afternoon. I'm Keith. Kevin. Looks like a surgical strike into the South Tower. Against a backdrop of gentle blue skies, a terrorist arrow pierces the heart of a city and a nation. There were several angles to witness the tragedy, one more horrifying than the next. The FBI says this was a United Airlines flight, 175 out of Boston, also headed to Los Angeles. At this point, the three major airports in New York City are already shut down. Trading on the financial markets was suspended, and several of the city's high-profile buildings evacuated. Then, the escalating fear of terrorism spreads to Washington, where at 9.40, another jetliner, this an American Airlines Flight 77, crashed into the mighty fortress of American defense, the Pentagon. Back in lower Manhattan, there is mayhem after the second plane attack. Then, at 10.09, the unspeakable happens, and those at a distance are paralyzed by what they see. The South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. A panic surges through the streets as thousands of people, including many of our reporters, start trying to outrun the storm of concrete and steel. Then at 10.30, the North Tower comes crashing down. The buildings in which 50,000 people work and thousands other visit were reduced to rubble. Just a few minutes later, in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, word of a plane down, a United Airlines flight that originated in Newark. Based on communications, officials believed it, too, was hijacked. The president's exact location was kept mum for much of the day, but at mid-afternoon, he tried to calm the nation. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. By the end of the day, Manhattan was effectively cut off by air, land, and sea. Governor Pataki and Mayor Giuliani also tried to assure the city that it was safe. That the city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists. That our democracy, that our rule of law, that our strength and our willingness to defend ourselves will ultimately prevail. And at this hour, New York City remaining on a full terrorism alert with all uniform police officers and firefighters called to duty. We'll, of course, as we have throughout the day, continue to monitor developments here in the newsroom. Back to you, Rob. Thank you, David. As part of that security, uh, authorities have shut down the city. And uh, as you know, the one that we've uh, feared for some time would get here as far as our vulnerability to terrorism is concerned. And some of the things that we're going to have to do is to beef up particularly our human intelligence capability so that we're able to penetrate these groups. Uh, we've let those uh, we've let those slide ever since the uh, mid 70s and somehow we've always been too it's always been a little offensive to us to do the kinds of things you have to do to uh, be a, a clandestine spy and, and penetrate those groups we're going to have to get back into that messy business we're going to have to beef up our security measures it's i just heard a little bit of your program before <laughs> you came to me and and it's quite remarkable, uh, in, my, in my view, that these people were able to get on these airplanes, uh, pass through security, get their weapons on there, take control of the airplanes, get into the cockpits, and, uh, and uh, in three out of four cases, uh, fly the planes into the targets they intended to hit. It is amazing. Mr. Baker, uh, I hope I'm not the first one to tell you this. 
We are going to learn over the next few days, many people we know have died in this thing. That's right. No, you're not the first. I'm very aware of, of uh, my, my close friend and Ted Olson's beautiful wife, Barbara, who died in the crash at the Pentagon. Yes. Um, and that's very, very sad to me because, uh, because she was not only a friend and colleague, she was someone with whom I spent uh, a very intense 37 days down in Florida this year. Yes. Uh, look, we, we, we have had other terrorism incidents strike the United States. And, you know, some big numbers of people, dozens, uh, many dozens, hundreds. But this may turn out to be a few thousand. Well, I think it, well, in my opinion, it will. We don't know that yet. We've had, of course, uh, we've had other, uh, other um, strikes at U.S. interests here recently that, were, that created a lot of casualties. The, the bombing of our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, the bombing of the Kobar barracks in Saudi Arabia. We've never had one like this on the soil of the United States, nor particularly one as, as massive as this. We've always been able to roll up uh, well, other attempts. Well, my question is, let, let's just say hypothetically you could figure out it was Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. uh, he is being harbored by the Taliban. He had to have somebody help him train these pilots. Not, uh, not any old Cessna pilot can go fly a 757. Mm -hmm. They had to somehow spy and figure out how to avoid security. They had to do a lot of things that involved probably a lot of countries. Should we strike a list of countries who were involved? Well, it depends on, on how much uh, direct proof we have of the involvement of the countries. Uh, if, if we have direct proof that, uh, that these actions were supported by state-sponsored uh, terrorism policies, in other countries, then then we may very well we may very well want to do that. A lot would depend on what we find out. I'm, I've always been of the view, quite frankly, as terrorism has begun to build and as the risk to the United States has increased, that we ought to take a hard look at the uh, provision of U.S. law that says we uh, don't don't assassinate anybody. If we've got somebody out here masterminding an attack that kills 10,000 or 5,000 or 3,000 or whatever it is, innocent Americans in America, then it seems to me that it, uh, it calls for rather drastic You, you would, uh, just to put it bluntly... ...may have incurred increasing wrath, especially in the Muslim world. The question remains, if America is this vulnerable, is anyone safe? Gita Guramurthy, BBC News. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. Apparently that's only a few hundred yards away from where the World Trade Center towers were. And it seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse. Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. There's almost a sense downtown in uh, New York behind me, down by the World Trade Centers, of uh, just an area completely closed off as the rescue workers try to do their job. But this isn't the first building that um, has suffered as a result. We know that part of the Marriott Hotel next to the World Trade Center also collapsed as a result of this huge amount of falling debris from 110 floors of two, the two twin towers of the World Trade Center. As you can see behind me, the uh, Trade Center appears to be still burning. We see these huge clouds of smoke and ash, and we know that behind that there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city, but uh, completely disappeared now, and New York is still unable to take on board what has happened to them today. Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. I mean, th there were, I suppose, fears of possible further collapses around the area. That 
that's what you would hope because this whole downtown area behind me has been completely sealed off and evacuated apart from the emergency workers that was done by the mayor Rudy Giuliani uh, much earlier today uh, because of the course the dreadful collapse of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center but uh, New York very much a city still in chaos the phones are not working properly the subway lines are not working properly and we know that down there near the World Trade Center there are three schools that um, are being turned into triage centers for emergency treatment and I know that over in New York Harbor where the famous Statue of Liberty is there's a field hospital where 1500 people are being treated and we have heard though it's unconfirmed as yet that a hundred New York City police officers have been taken there as well for treatment but we do need to confirm uh, those figures for the officers it's now what some eight hours since the attacks is there any estimate yet available of the number of casualties in the world trade center I think we can only go at this point with the words expressed by the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, that it's too frightening to think how many there could be. We know that uh, it's about almost 300 people on the airliners that were used in these attacks. But you've got to remember, this was 9 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday morning. It's busy in downtown Manhattan in the financial district then. The World Trade Center itself has 50,000 workers. There are tens of thousands of tourists who go up there every day. The figures are almost too frightening to, to contemplate. You can understand why nobody yet wants to put a figure on them. Listening to the mayor, Rudy Giuliani, a bit earlier, uh, one of his messages was, you know, business as usual, you know, we won't let this get us down. But presumably, a lot of Manhattan people must have, uh, have fled the city to Long Island to get away from possible further attacks. Well, a lot of people were certainly trying to, but you remember that very early on, all the bridges and uh, tunnels to the city, as well as the airports, were closed. New York was sealed, essentially. Now, we do know that the Long Island Railroad has become, begun running again to get people out of the city if they can, and people who can't manage to get out and perhaps lived in that area, they're being offered accommodation in uh, empty school buildings. But uh, certainly I saw earlier on today huge crowds of people desperately trying to walk up uh, upper Manhattan to get as far away as possible um, I think nobody really knows how to go or where to go and the, you have to remember even even now I don't think people can sink it, it can sink in to people what's happened we haven't for the past uh, hour or so heard much from the people of Manhattan you're with them there I mean what are they saying tonight after this catastrophic attack as I said, many just cannot believe this has happened. And I've seen, you know, big burly men and women with the, you know, tears in their eyes today, shaking their heads, wondering what on earth is going on. There was a, a, a sense of panic. Our reports from the scene were of people just absolutely horrified. And I've already seen some photographs of that a, a man took down in the, the downtown area. And it looks like the aftermath of, of a huge atom bomb or something just just full of debris and of like a white carpeting of snow from all the dust and rubbish that had fallen i don't think people can comprehend they certainly have lost any feeling of safety um, there's still a great pride in the city people are determined to fought to fight back but a great sense of shock and loss people keep looking at the sky for example where you can see the plume of smoke and say when that's gone it won't be there anymore. Our Twin Towers won't be there. Such a symbol of New York. Are they talking yet about revenge and what the government should do to counter this uh, threat, or are they numbed still? I think people are still numb and I don't think people are talking about revenge in that way at all yet. I think people are... ...versaciones de celulares de ese tipo de personas que me den una idea de qué es lo que están planeando, pensando o probablemente que puedan hacer y eso incluye a personas que conozcan idiomas de otros países por si acaso las personas comienzan a hablar en un idioma en el cual yo no tengo ningún tipo de conocimiento y eso el FBI lo hace en una forma rutinaria lo hicieron cuando estaba aquí el Ku Klux Klan lo hicieron cuando estaban aquí grupos de derecha norteamericanos eso mismo puede pasar con grupos de musulmanes que existen en los Estados Unidos Señor Carrasco, ¿qué pudo haber fallado entonces? Porque los sistemas de seguridad de las agencias de los Estados Unidos son conocidos ampliamente en el mundo por ser muy estrictos y, y muy avanzados. 
Yo no creo que ellos creían eh, de que los grupos palestinos en los Estados Unidos tenían la capacidad de realizar este tipo de acciones. Es quizás un yo, poquito yo menospreciar que... al enemigo. Rápidamente controlar ese grupo. Después de que no ha pasado nada en los Estados Unidos, no importa todas las bravoconerías del señor Ben Laden, eh, los grupos aquí comenzaron a, a tomar las cosas con mucha más calma y por lo tanto no pensaban que existía esta capacidad coordinadora. Fíjense, usted tiene que tener en movimiento simultáneo a un gran número de personas, tiene que tener a cuatro pilotos suicidas a su disposición, Tra eh, información fal eh, documentos falsos, cartera de alquilar falsa, lograr llegar a esos aeropuertos, dos o tres personas de esos aeropuertos. Eso no es nada que se hace de la noche a la mañana. Y una organización cualquiera no puede realmente hacer eso. Eh, señor Carrasco, usted mencionó hace un ratito que creía que esto podía llevar a, a haber llevado nueve meses de planificación. ¿Por qué mencionó esa fecha? Eh, es más o menos lo que se demora este tipo de acción. Dentro de seis meses en adelante, usted tiene que comenzar a estudiar cuáles son los mejores aeropuertos en los cuales usted puede... puede. One World Trade, a huge uh, ball of flames and smoke coming out. And at that point, I decided to leave the city. I... Falkenberg lives right near the World Trade Center. All my cats there, my, all my computers are there. I didn't take any software. But your family's with you. My family's with me. Thank God. Yeah. Many arriving got the last train Seven out of the city. We could see where the first plane hit and the smoke coming out. Yes. He's uh, at the heart, Tom Clancy, of the military community, the intelligence community. People in our newsroom have been saying today what's happening is, is like right out of a Tom Clancy novel. But have you, could you possibly imagine something like this to write about? Now, one of the problems with being a, a writer of fiction is that you can't keep up with all the madmen in the world as much as you try. And um, I, I frankly would have thought that this was not a credible threat to have four separate people decide to commit suicide in the same way on the same morning. Why not? Because uh, ending your own life is not something the average person does. You know, everybody's assuming these are Islamic terrorists. Well, uh, if so, they've defiled their own religion. You know, Islam does not permit suicide. It says you go to hell if you do something like this. But we see suicide bombings in the, in the Middle East and in Israel. And yeah, Judy, uh, we saw people in Northern Ireland, Catholics acting like savages and Protestants acting like savages. So anyhow, we have people who call themselves Muslims acting like savages. It happens. It's not because of their religion. It's because they're fools. What does this say now? I mean, you, you've, you've done a lot of reporting. I mean, you not only write fiction, you do a lot of reporting from inside the intelligence community, inside the military community. What does this say about how prepared we are as a country? Well, people always ask that kind of a question when things go wrong, you, but you don't ask the question when things go right, and the reason is you can't tell when things go right in that business. Well, I, one of the things I've been saying for a lot of years is that we need to upgrade the human capability, the human intelligence capabilities in CIA and our, the rest of our intelligence community, because you can do a lot with satellites, you can do a lot with the eavesdropping techniques, but you can't you, you can't find out what's in a person's mind except by talking to that person. And so uh, the agency needs to increase its human, its human intelligence capability. The CIA has about 20,000 employees, less than 1,000 of whom are actually field intelligence officers. That number should be at least doubled. But, but yeah, America as a, as a nation doesn't love our intelligence community. And certainly the, the news media does not love our intelligence community. If, I'm going to interrupt you, Tom Clancy. I'm told Aaron Brown in New York has a development. Aaron? Well, Judy, another, just in the last few seconds, another building, we will speculate carefully here that there was building number seven, one of the buildings uh, in support of the World Trade Center towers has collapsed. For those of you who have been with us for a while, you can see indeed that the smoke color has changed from a, has gotten much lighter. Uh, so we believe that yet another building, this would be the third building, has collapsed likely building number seven, although we also heard that uh, there were problems at building number five, and it's possible that one went down too. Uh, but again, another building in the Trade Center complex appears now to have caved in after these attacks. Judy? Aaron, uh, we're looking at these pictures, uh, Tom Clancy and I, as we sit here in the, in the Washington studio, and as I, just as I come back to Tom Clancy, I want to read just a portion of a statement issued by uh, 
Secretary of State Powell, uh, Colin Powell, calling these attacks a terrible tragedy, terrible tragedy befallen not just my nation, but all the nations of this region, all the nations of the world, all those who believe in democracy. Tom Clancy, you were saying, sure, we can ask these questions about failed security, failed intelligence when things go wrong, but we have every right to ask these questions. Well, no, the first amendment, you have a right to say anything you want, but it's a practical matter. Uh, one of the things we have to do, if you want to prevent things like this from happening, is you build up your defenses. And your first line of defense against terrorism is an intelligence gathering capability. Now, when was the last time CNN or the news media in general said, gee, we ought to put more money into the human intelligence capabilities of the CIA? Answer, you never do it. Never. Well, we wouldn't take a side on something like that. Anyway, in terms of what do you fund and... Yeah, we always take a side on saying they failed. Why well, not help them succeed once in a while? Are you saying that they are significantly underfunded in that area? And it's not just the CIA, but the FBI? Human intelligence is de-emphasized. The FBI's job is... Spying is, is what we're talking is, about Yeah, here. that's Yeah, that's what intelligence officers do, is they spy. And the CIA has 20,000 employees, about 800 of whom are actually spooks. Of, and of them, maybe as many as two-thirds actually get outside and do spook operations. And we know that... And we need to do better than that. We need to do more than that. You gather information of this type by putting people out on the street, the same way cops gather information from informants. It's not, this isn't rocket but, science. It's just a matter of hiring the people and letting them do the work. But I, I, I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron, but my question is, how do you know what to believe? We had a Lon an Arab journalist in London just today saying, we had this information a few weeks ago. It was coming. We didn't know whether to believe it. Now back to Aaron in New York. Judy, thank, thank you. We've talked a number of times today about the fact that it is, it is simply too dangerous for officials to get in and around these buildings. It's so very, very dangerous, and the proof of that uh, just a few moments ago when another building in the complex that is the World Trade Center or was the World Trade Center collapsed. Maureen, we can show you what that looked like. These are taped pictures uh, taken literally just a few moments ago uh, when that building went down. We are seeing them for the first time. This is, uh, correct me in the booth, but I believe that was, in fact, a, a piece of tape that we got just a bit ago of, a sec of the second plane hitting uh, the South Tower of the Trade Center uh, just a little bit after 9 o'clock this morning. Um, again, a, a third building at the Trade Center has collapsed within the last three or four minutes. Building number seven, this is no small building as you can see at 47 stories it would stand out in most american cities uh, it looks small i guess in when you look at what was the hundred plus stories of the world trade center but building number seven it's 40 plus stories almost 50 stories collapsing as well and if we can go back to the tape and see it one more time and i'll look at it with you uh, again this occurred just in the last several moments around the Trade Center building. Building number seven, 47 stories. Maureen Madden, CNN producer, is in the area. Maureen, what can you tell us? What did you see? Well, about two minutes ago, uh, we had to see Seven World Trade Center go down, which holds the Emer Office of Emergency Management for the city of New York on the 23rd floor there. It, um, when we heard from FD, the fire department of NYPD uh, is that the whole south part of the building was engulfed in flames at one point, and it was a matter of time uh, to uh, collapse. They're just waiting for it to collapse, which we've been waiting for about a half hour. When it went down, it uh, Building number seven It there. would be uh, that brown one uh, just to the right of the Twin Towers, the lower one. In the, in the World Trade Center itself. All right, so mm. another building at the World Trade Center has collapsed. We believe it to be uh, building mm. number seven uh, near the landmark towers. Uh, we have mm. Alan Cohen, who is in, we believe, the financial district. Alan, did you feel that go down? Well, and I'm looking at it right now. No, oh. I did not uh, feel it go back, uh, go down, but I could tell you the amount of uh, dust in the air has just increased incredibly right now. In fact, it's it's coming towards us right now. Uh, we told you just a few minutes ago that there was a building that may be in imminent danger of collapse, and in fact, that has happened. And now the sirens that we, we are hearing have just increased incredibly. In fact, the city bus just drove by us, mm -hmm. just covered with soot. The soot was so thick that 
it was pouring off the, the bus just like the, the bus's Al engine was in flames. Alvin, how far away are you from the scene uh, at this point? I'm just a couple of blocks away from it in a, uh, a high-rise uh, building, which is home to a production company where we're working out of it. It's a, a building that overlooks the world, what was the World Trade Center. It, so it's really just a few blocks away. Is there any kind of renewed panic now that this big plume of smoke has gone up again? And I, I, it's a very surreal scene because, uh, you know, what you see when you look to the south on, on the World Trade Center area it really speaks volumes. But, you know, you will see people who at this stage are walking down the sidewalks very slowly, very calmly. And, you know, as we travel down from uh, Connecticut this morning, once we entered into Manhattan, uh, you know, there was... Continuing CBS News coverage from our world headquarters in New York. We do have coming in additional video, video that you haven't seen before taken by private individuals, and we're going to show you some of that as we pass the top of this next hour. We also, as we've been doing all day at the top of the hour and then at the half hour mark, try to bring you up to date on the situation, the latest information, and, and put a frame around this incredible day, a day that will leave an infamy uh, in United States history. There are no reliable even estimates of the number, the total number of dead and wounded uh, in New York at this time, and it may be quite some time before we have that information. Another building in the World Trade Complex has collapsed. You are watching continuing CBS News coverage of the attack on America. Dan Rather at CBS News World Headquarters in New York is our continuous coverage of this day uh, goes on. Now we have new videotape of the attack on the World Trade Center. Let me caution you uh, that we, we're giving this to you more or less raw. Uh, this is strong material and some of the language you will hear. We want you know, to hear the sight and the sound of what happened this morning, but unfortunately on this particular piece of tape and one of the pieces of tape you're about to see, some of the language is, um, is strong. So if we can roll that videotape now or as soon as possible. One of the Trade Center buildings has been hit at a high floor, maybe above floor 90, by one aircraft. That would be American Flight 11. Now look at the plane coming in the middle. Oh, what a picture. That plane hit the second building at a much lower level. First plane hit very high up on the one tower, maybe floor 90 or above. Second plane at what? I don't know, maybe floor 71. 71, 71, 71, and, up. Yeah. 71 and up. Yeah. You may want to run that videotape again. This we just got into our news newsroom, mm. this videotape. And not long after this, first one and the other these towers collapsed and now we've had building seven of the World Trade Center where Solomon Brothers Smith Barney uh, had their headquarters. We're going to re-rack that videotape and show it to you again. Uh, as we do the re-racking, say that we don't have uh, any confirmed figures on the number of people killed at the Pentagon or the number of people wounded there in Washington where a hijacked plane hit. We have no idea of the New York fatalities. Here again is this photograph. The building on the left is about to be hit by the hijacked incoming plane. A ball of flame envelops the second of the World Trade Center tower. Untold death and destruction. As after being hit by the second plane, the second tower eventually collapsed after the, you know, both of these twin towers collapsed. Now building seven in the World Trade Center after being evacuated, we're told, collapsed. In the debris below, people still trapped. This is new videotape that had not been seen before. Dateline Washington, the Pentagon now says and we've checked and double-checked this, 100 people believed killed or injured. There's no 
differentiation. We still don't know how many were killed, how many injured at the Pentagon, but the Defense Department says its best available information is 100 people believed killed or injured at the Pentagon. And while the Pentagon symbolically was one of the two targets today, that the death, the wounding, and the damage at the Pentagon, nothing to compare with what's happened with the World Trade Center complex. Paramedics waiting to be sent into the rubble today were told that once the smoke clears, it's going to be massive bodies, quote, unquote. That's Brian Stark, an ex-Navy paramedic who volunteered to help. Stark said paramedics were told that, quote, hundreds of police and firefighters are missing from the ranks of those sent in to respond to the initial crash. Now, mind you, this is only one person speaking. Uh, New York police and firemen rushed to the scene this morning, as is their destiny when they volunteer for such work. Uh, they place themselves in harm's way. And it has been thought throughout the day that certainly some police and firemen uh, would turn up missing. And according to this paramedic, he says he was told, quote, that hundreds of police and firefighters are missing. Let me caution you, we do not know that for a fact. And as we've said repeatedly, and I say again now without apology, sometimes the first information you get from the scene turns out to be wrong information. We do our best to nail down the facts. We'd rather be last with information than be wrong. We try to give information to you as quickly as we can get it. In this kind of situation, I know you will understand when I say there's no way that we can do it perfectly. We do our very best. And our number one job, the number one job here is accuracy. Now, among the other facts uh, that we know is that the president is uh, on his way to Washington. I have to say I don't really know that to be a fact, that that's been officially announced that he's on his way to Washington. The president will be addressing the nation tonight from Washington, we're told. Will he be speaking to the White House? We do not know that. Now, we're, in effect, handling uh, all kinds of hot information and material here. We have. I'm told more videotape that's never been seen before today, that you saw a minute ago about that s second plane hitting the World Trade Center had not been seen before. We have additional videotape now of what happened here in New York earlier this morning. Watch this. This is, I haven't seen this before. I'm seeing it for the first time as you do. The first building hit at high, at high floor by the first plane is in smoke. The second building has just been hit by the plane. I beg your pardon. As you, it was the collapse of the first tower. Now let's go back over. This videotape we've not seen before. Jesus! The tower that was hit by the first plane is still standing. It won't be for long. Remember, this all happened this morning between 9 and 11 a.m. In the second building, now you saw, we'll show these videotapes to you in sequence. First, you have the videotape of the plane coming, and it was coming at pretty high speed, much greater speed than the first plane that hit. We have videotape showing the building hit, and then this second videotape taken from some distance of the first of the towers to collapse. Perhaps we can re-rack that videotape at some point. Strange, eerie, I used the word, if it is a word, Dante-esque earlier in the day, how instead of a ball of flame going up and great billows of smoke going upward, they came downward into and toward the earth itself. But that's because of the building collapse. Now, this is the collapse the first of the towers to collapse. We just secured this video. Oh. The whole building's gone. The whole building's gone. Indeed. Holy fucking Jesus! We do apologize for the language on the videotape. Um, now, one can understand uh, people seeing this incredible sight. And when you see this, you're reminded why everyone in authority is saying we should be prepared for eventually finding out many dead, many seriously wounded, and at this hour, as night has not yet fallen, but begins to creep in on New York City, 
there are people trapped in the rubble. And when the third building collapsed, World Trade Center building number seven, uh, people uh, who are making efforts to save those people in the rubble who are trapped in there, some of those people uh, were in peril as that Trade Center building number seven collapsed within the last hour, hour and a half. Now what you're going to see next is videotape of the second World Trade Center building collapsing from a different view than you've seen it before. This is again new videotape. One of the World Trade Center buildings has already collapsed. The second, the actual first one to hit by the plane is still standing. It is a smoking ruin on its upper floors. These World Trade Center towers have absorbed a tremendous shock of fast flying airliners. With highly inflammable aviation fuel. The one building has collapsed. Oh no! Oh no! And once it starts to go, how quickly it went. These home videos taken from across the way from a place that once had a spectacular view of a spectacular New York skyline. And the smoke told the story. Scott Pelly will bring us up to date on the situation in lower Manhattan. Scott, it's an unsettling moment to see again different views of those buildings collapsing and indeed the aircraft hitting the second building. But what's the situation down there right now? Dan, the smoke that you see rising behind me now is from World Trade Center building number seven, which collapsed about 15 minutes ago. This is a, a very large building. It's 47 stories tall, at least half a block wide. This would have been a catastrophe in its own right, Dan. Uh, the building has been on fire all day since the initial attack about an hour ago. I was down there with a CBS News camera crew and we were talking to firefighters and police officers. Building number seven was completely involved in flame. Flames were shooting out of the building. Large panes of glass were falling into the street. The firefighters explained that there was nothing they could do to try to put the fire out because it was just simply far too dangerous. And they warned us an hour ago that the building might collapse. And indeed, that is what has come to pass. Apparently, some of the city's emergency operations were located in that building. The fire department is telling us now that they have lost some of their communications at this point. The building, of course, being on fire, being at the scene of the attack, had been evacuated much, much earlier. There was no one in the building at the time that it collapsed about 15 minutes ago. However, I will tell you that when we left there an hour ago, there were several New York City police officers and firefighters down there making sure that no one else came into the area. Dan? Scott Pelley on the scene reporting live uh, from Lower Manhattan. Now we're going to show you again videotape of World Trade Center Building 7. This is the one that just collapsed within the last hour and a half, uh, two hours at the outside. This was a 47-story tall building. Uh, this is a scene on the ground just after this building came tumbling down. And yet new bellows of the horrible smoke and the stench from the smoke began to fill lower Manhattan all anew. rack this videotape uh, for you because we're, what, what we intend to show you and we have on videotape is the collapse that World Trade Center uh, building number seven which housed uh, Solomon Brothers and Smith Barney. I look away because our friend here who's an eyewitness and who worked in the building and by the way let's get a picture of another you know he wouldn't call himself a hero. But here's a man in our studio who's given us some eyewitness reports here today who 
calmly got together, led people out of the building. It was his responsibility. He took it upon himself to get people out and then get himself out. Uh, was there actual panic as you did then? There were panic among the staff, yes. Uh, but uh, the important thing, everybody got out on time before. Okay. Well, you won't say it, but I will. You got everybody out. Yeah. Uh, David Martin is outside the Pentagon. David. <coughs> Dan, the, uh, the U.S. is trying to do uh, two very different things here simultaneously. One is to hunker down and button up and protect against the possibility of still another attack, and that's why uh, the Pentagon has put all of its uh, bases on the highest state of alert, and the State Department has put all American embassies around the world on the highest state of alert. But at the same time, the U.S. wants to create an impression, at least, of a quick return to normalcy, and that is one of the reasons why the president is coming back to Washington tonight. You know, he spent the day uh, moving about uh, from a military base to military base as much as he would in the event of a, uh, a nuclear war. Um, that now is ended, and they are uh, bringing the president back to Washington to try and create this impression of a return to normalcy. But obviously, as you can see behind me, we are a long, long way from normal. One of the obvious questions here is, who did this? And the early suspicions are focused on Osama bin Laden, the uh, terrorist who has, seems to have made it his... First feeling is for the families and the suffering and the pain that goes on in New York and throughout the country. I spoke on behalf of us to the president this afternoon. He wished me to convey to New Yorkers that he will do everything possible to help the rescue and the recovery and what needs to be done in future years and months because this loss is just a terrible loss that will not go away soon. We all, he also expressed a second point, which we share, and that is that those who did this must be brought to justice. For too, off, too long, the world has just shrugged its shoulders at terrorism. But we now know that none of us as Americans can avoid that terrorism unless we take strong action against it. And I express to the President on behalf of both of us and all of the Senate, that we stand shoulder to shoulder with him in this fight, that no one will try to seek partisan or geographic or any other advantage. We will be united in this fight, and we will do everything we can. We cannot have a month-long or a year-long fight against terrorism. We have to have a permanent fight against terrorism because this is the new form of warfare. And so the few things we ask people, first for prayers, second anyone in America who can through their local authorities give blood, we are desperately short of blood. We need doctors who can contact the authorities if they live within a days of New York. We are short of doctors. And of course, FEMA and the urban rescue teams, as many as our nation has, are being sent immediately. Uh, America can never turn back from this point. And we are in a new era where we realize the world is an interconnected but sometimes very nasty place. We have to be prepared for it. And so, two things. One, love and caring for those who accepted loss and help for those who need some path to recovery. And second, resoluteness 
that we will never let this happen again and do everything we can, and some of the steps won't be easy, to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, and Chuck and I wish we could be in New York, um, but that's not possible. And we've been in constant communication with the authorities, uh, with the White House, the governor's office, the mayor's office, with the emergency officials. And I think that it's clear to everyone this was an attack on America. It may have been directed uh, at New York, but it really is attack, attacking everything we stand for in every part of our country. And I'm very proud of the way New Yorkers responded. Uh, the behavior of the people um, on the ground, the emergency uh, resources, our police and, and firefighters have just been extraordinary. And many of them uh, were put in harm's way because they were doing their job. Our medical facilities, all the hospitals in the immediate area are overwhelmed. Uh, we are moving. Uh, non-critical patients out of uh, hospitals in the city, out to Long Island, even Westchester, in order to make room for uh, those who have been injured. Uh, we do need more blood. We need doctors and nurses and other medical uh, professionals who would be able to uh, support uh, those who are working uh, so tirelessly. Uh, we appreciate the federal resources, certainly the uh, search and rescue teams, the National Guard, uh, FEMA, uh, we've been assured we will have everything we need uh, to conduct the various phases of the reaction. First, of course, is to find any who might have survived. Second is to find everybody of anyone who has not, to do the hard work of sifting for evidence, and then for the task of rebuilding. Uh, this will be a monumental undertaking. This was a nerve center of communications, of infrastructure that affects uh, not just our nation but the entire world in terms of the access to and transfer of information. We're also deeply concerned about the attack on the Pentagon. Uh, we just had a conference call with our congressional, our Senate leadership, uh, bipartisan, uh, Senators Daschle and Reed and Lott and Nichols. Uh, we also heard from Senator Warner. He and Senator Levin are at the Pentagon where uh, they have gone to uh, um, do everything they can to support what needs to be done. And they were certainly very confident that uh, you know, our military forces are as alert and ready as they need to be. Uh, so there is uh, an enormous amount of very uh, good, solid work being done in New York, in Washington, throughout the country. Uh, I would just reiterate, there is absolutely no need for anyone anywhere to panic. Uh, this has been carried out in an orderly and effective manner, uh, but we have a lot of work ahead of us, and that work includes uh, the identifying uh, of those who are responsible for this cowardly and evil act and holding them accountable wherever they might be, however long it would take. Do you have any idea who is responsible for these attacks? I think they do, and uh, they're not prepared to say yet, but uh, I have spoken to both FBI and CIA today, and they are certainly not clueless. Uh, we will be hearing from the President and from them uh, about where the arrows are pointing. When uh, is the Senate going to uh, speak to Tomorrow morning. Uh, tomorrow morning, Linda, the, the uh, plan is for our leadership to have a uh, press conference tonight along with the House leadership. Uh, for us to go back into session tomorrow morning, there will be a resolution laid down. Uh, clearly this is not uh, uh, going to be uh, an easy matter to respond to, but the orderly process of government will commence tomorrow morning. Yeah, we are not going to let them stop our government. There will be, as Hillary mentioned, a resolution on the floor, which we will debate all day. Do you expect a military response? Uh, there will certainly have to be a very, very strong response, but I think it's wise right now for us to leave that to our president uh, to lead us with. We stressed, I stressed to the president, that we are united behind the presidency. Just as America pulled together after Pearl Harbor, we are pulling together now. 
and to have everybody give their own prescription as to what to do uh, does not help the unity that our country needs and I believe will have. If the Senate, if the Senate is to go about its business on its calendar, as you suggest, no. one of the things that you're going to be facing, obviously, is the defense budget. Now, does this type of an attack suggest that it's time perhaps to open the checkbook up on a defense appropriation? Our, our first bit of business will be the resolution that we will debate on the floor at least all day tomorrow, uh, expressing our pain and our anger. Uh, where we will go after that uh, will be up to our leadership. We discussed it in the room there again, but I don't think uh, laying out different prescriptions as to what each of us thinks ought to be done is the wise thing to do. I can say this. In the room there, there must have been 70 senators, mm -hmm. totally unified, totally unified. We are not going to allow any differences we may have had in opinion beforehand uh, divide us in any way in the future and we will be united in what uh, will what in in the pattern of action that will be taken our policy you details about what happened did they give you in, the, in this briefing no, this, this briefing was from our Senate leaders about what we were doing in the Senate we have each many of us I've been on the phones uh, with FBI and CIA being on the subcommittee, chair of the subcommittee that oversees the FBI in terms of counterterrorism, in terms of preparedness steps, etc. And let me just say this, I am confident, I am confident that not only do we have a handle on what has happened, but that we have specific actions that we can take to make sure uh, that the country stays secure. Mrs. Clinton, have you spoken to former President Clinton? Has he got any thoughts you might share with us? Yes, I certainly have spoken to him uh, at length. Um, and, you know, he is deeply disturbed, um, outraged at this uh, cowardly act of terrorism. Uh, obviously, has offered uh, uh, to be helpful in any way that uh, he can. Uh, you know, I, I know that. Uh, uh, the most important thing now, having been in the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue for eight years, uh, is for us to be united, uh, un united behind our president and our government, sending a very clear message that this is uh, something that transcends uh, any political consideration or partisanship. It goes really to the heart of who we are as Americans, and uh, that certainly is uh, my husband's very strong uh, belief, and it is one that I think we all share. Right. And one other thing, one other thing, we have confidence in this country and its ability to deal with these problems and move forward. And that is a message I think every one of the senators in the room wanted us to convey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New York's two senators, Hillary Rodham Clinton, Charles Schumer, reacting in Washington to what has transpired in their home state, New York City. You see the smoke continuing to billow after the collapse of yet another building, uh, World Trade Center number seven, collapsing within about the last half hour or so. It had been burning for much of the day. Three buildings now that are a part of this huge complex in lower Manhattan are now gone. At the Pentagon, there is word that uh, the death toll there is at about 100 people. There is no death toll right now or casualty toll. It continues to mount in New York City. We know that uh, temporary morgues are now being set up along the piers. Uh, just west of Midtown Manhattan right now, they have identified covered piers that they will use to begin transporting bodies as they can get to them. You can imagine this is going to be a very grim and very difficult, difficult task over the coming days. I'm sorry, where do you want me to go now? We want it, uh, Leonard Cole is joining us now. Uh, Leonard is a terrorism expert with uh, Rutgers University. Uh, Dr. Cole, thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. We have, we have suffered an attack that most Americans can't imagine. Could it be worse? Things could always be worse. But this is, a, I would say, as bad as anybody could have guessed. In fact, my guess yeah, is that nobody would have predicted that three, okay. and possibly four, uh, hijackings could have been taken taken place with such precision and with such a horrible outcome. Precision is, is the operative word here. Precision, we've heard military-type planning. What does that suggest to you? 
that the pilots who were the hijackers and killed the, the commercial pilots on Okay, board. apparently your mic is not working, I'm, I'm told. Let me, yeah. uh, let me see. Well, that's right, she had to shut it down. Okay, if you hand me that backpack there, we can turn it on. But uh, I'm going to get closer to you because this is an important discussion. Let's talk okay. about that precision. The precision involves, as far as I can fathom, pilots who were hijackers, who were willing to commit suicide, but who were also very well trained. And my, I would have to guess that these pilots who crashed into the buildings were, were folks who had been flying either military or commercial aircraft fairly recently. It's not that they just learned on a Piper Cub and then suddenly one day were able to maneuver these large jet aircraft into the buildings with such accuracy. My understanding, it is not easy to actually, it's easy to dive an airplane, but not to hit something as relatively narrow as a high-rise building. Uh, well, I'm not an expert on aircraft uh, maneuvering, but I, I have heard that sufficiently. Plus, uh, the fact that uh, there was a lot of money behind this, there was a lot of organization, a lot of coordination. I would not be surprised if a country, as well as a terrorism group, was in involved with this. Let's talk suspects. We have heard the Osama bin Laden, uh, a U.S. official, saying uh, this, his fingerprints are all over this thing. What about Iraq? Could be Iraq, could be Iran, could be any number of countries that are antagonistic to the United States and what it stands for. All right. Dr. Cole, thanks so much for joining us. Terrorism expert from Rutgers University adding his insight to this horrible tragedy that has befallen America today. America under attack. We are going to continue with our coverage here on MSNBC and NBC News on the day that we have seen three major buildings in New York City tumble to the ground. We have seen the center of the nation's military power. The Pentagon struck. Our coverage continues next with an NBC special report hosted by Brian Williams. I'm Lester Holt, NBC News. Electricity supply is still on in the city, illuminating the city. Uh, detonation coming in from uh, towards the airport. Multiple detonations now going off again towards the perimeter of the city in the direction of the airport. We see one fire on the horizon at this moment. Uh, Kabul is surrounded by mountains. The detonations reverberate from those mountains, so it's difficult to get a difficult to get an accurate fix uh, on exactly where the impacts are happening. Certainly, uh, our certainly it would appear that the Afghan defence systems have detected a threat in the air. They are launching uh, what appears to be anti-aircraft defence systems at the moment. Certainly I can see that fire that was blazing on the horizon. It was a, a faint yellow. It's now a bright orange blazing. Uh, several other detonations uh, going off around the city, multiple areas. Rockets appear to be taking off from one end of the airport. I can see that's perhaps located about eight or nine miles away from where we stand, Joey. Nick, we want to ask you uh, to keep, please keep your line up to us. We're, we're having difficulty reaching you on another line, but please keep your line up. We can see the pictures coming to us by the video phone. Again, this is very advanced technology that CNN is using, but you will see some of the digital effect. It is not quite as clear as your average television signal, and so to our viewers, we apologize okay. for that. But this I is certainly the only this video that you're going to get from Kabul, Afghanistan at this point, and you're watching it on CNN. Again, we are hearing from our correspondent, Nick Robertson, who's on the scene in Kabul with his team there, and he has reported the sounds of tracer fire. He has reported the fire burning there in Kabul, the seat of Afghanistan's power and the seat of its Taliban government. Uh, again, we are watching their picture coming to us on the video phone, and it is very hard, of course, to see exactly what you're looking at, but you are looking at Kabul. Again, you see some tracer fire there coming across the scene. Nick Robertson, can you, yeah. can you Joey, hear us? We're being, we're being told, jo Joey, I, Joey, I can, Joey, I can hear you if you can hear me. Certainly, big detonation there, missiles flying across the city. We're being told from sources in Kandahar, that's the spiritual capital of Afghanistan, 300 miles south of here, that there is uh, no uh, rocket activity like this south of here in Kandahar. Certainly in Kabul, very, very active at this stage. Multiple detonations. It is nighttime here. It is dark. It is difficult to get an accurate fix on exactly what we're seeing and exactly what we're hearing. Certainly the sound, what appears to be the sound of large missiles incoming and landing in the city. Certainly a big fire on the horizon of the city at the moment. 
uh, and certainly anti-aircraft fire uh, coming up from the city and rockets being launched uh, and flying across the horizon of the city. Uh, rockets perhaps going at the speed of uh, several hundred miles an hour, the sort of speed that one might expect to see uh, cruise missiles traveling across the horizon at burning with a, a white glow coming from their tails rather than, rather than a yellow glow. The fire on the uh, horizon that we can see from here burning furiously now. Uh, perhaps it would be accurate at this stage to suspect that that was a fuel dump that's been hit uh, by the way that it's burning, flames leaping, and that fuel dump must be perhaps five to eight miles from where I am flames leaping up from that fuel dump now leaping up right into the air. Um, it was a low burning fire before, but it's now really increased in its ferocity, perhaps indicating that it is a fuel dump. Looking across the rest of the city, uh, that fuel dump, perhaps the only big fire we can see at this time. From our vantage point here at the Kabul Intercontinental Hotel that overlooks the whole of the city of Kabul, that is in a basin surrounded by mountains, uh, the, the whole city is laid out in front of us. The gunfire that was coming up from the city seems to have subsided for now. We're not hearing any more detonations at this moment. And as I say, the fire on the horizon really burning uh, furiously at this time, flames leaping way up in the air this moment. Joey? Nick, if you can talk to us a little bit about your circumstance. It is 6 o'clock in the evening here in Atlanta. It must be quite late at night there in Kabul. Indeed, 2.30 uh, in the morning uh, here, Joey, we're eight and, a, eight and a half hours ahead of East Coast time in the United States. Uh, and it was about uh, five hours ago that the Foreign Minister of Afghanistan, Ahmed uh, Wakil, Ahmed Mutawakil, brief journalist, I hear more detonations going off now. Um, he said that the Taliban had not taken precautions against uh, the like against the possibility uh, of there being an air attack against afghanistan he said because it was not necessary uh, the taliban spiritual leader muller omar had also made a statement saying that they felt osama bin laden wasn't responsible for what had happened in the united states he said his country was a peaceful country he wanted it to be at peace and he wanted uh, peace in other countries around the world certainly what we're seeing in kabul uh, in these early hours of this wednesday morning it is very far from peace. Uh, certainly, multiple explosions happening in and around the city. We, there is a front line uh, about 50 miles north of the city where the uh, Taliban are fighting a, a battle against the, uh, the Northern Alliance here. We could hear detonations coming from that uh, northern area as well. But on the perimeter of the city, particularly in the direction of the Kabul airport, which is about five to eight miles from where we are, detonations coming from there. I remember standing on this balcony about four years ago watching, uh, watching fighter jets bomb that airport as part of Afghanistan's ongoing civil war. The uh, flash uh, at the airport to us hearing the detonation at the hotel is about the same duration, so I, I am using that as an estimate uh, to gauge that those missiles again are falling in the area of the airport. First, we're seeing the flash and then we hear the detonation some several seconds afterwards and they appear to be coming from that airport area, in some cases uh, several miles away from it. There is still uh, a lot of flashing uh, we can see in the air reflected off clouds. That could be thunder and lightning, however there's a possibility that those reflections are missiles landing elsewhere. Uh, the flashes as they explode and reflecting off the clouds, but it's not a good indication. We certainly don't hear uh, any detonations coming from that particular direction at this time. Um, the anti-aircraft fire that we were seeing a little while ago is not uh, coming up from the city. The city, uh, apart from the detonations we were hearing a few minutes ago, appears very, very calm. The visibility here is excellent. We can see all the way across the city. It lies on a plain that's surrounded by the mountains here in Kabul. We have high mountains to the right. These mountains were used by the Mujahideen as vantage points for shelling the city uh, several years ago during the Mujahideen in fighting in Kabul. The last five years, the Taliban have been in control of this city, have been trying to extend their control over and across Afghanistan. And the foreign minister this evening uh, telling journalists and CNN that he didn't believe that the Afghanistan would be attacked 
He said if Afghanistan was attacked, then they would call it, the Taliban would call it an act of state-sponsored terrorism, Joey. All right, that is CNN's Nick Robertson. Again, please keep the line open to us, Nick Robertson, there in Kabul, Afghanistan, for our viewers who are watching this with us on the air. Again, this is we're getting this from video phone technology. You're seeing this exclusively on CNN. It is a very new technology, and so you, you could tell from the audio line, it is not as clear as our typical TV feed, and the visuals obviously are not as clear, but you are looking at the city of Kabul in Afghanistan. This is a seat uh, of, the, uh, of the Taliban government there, not its spiritual center, but its government center in any case. Uh, you are seeing in just about the last 10 minutes, we have been hearing these reports from CNN correspondent Nick Robertson on the ground in Kabul of an explosion you see on the right side of your screen about a third of the way over. The flames of fire, they were quite large just a short time ago, seem to have simmered down, but again, we're just not seeing very much of this because it's uh, the video phone. Again, Nick Robertson saying that they had seen tracers going up as well. Uh, they have been listening and hearing the possibility of additional explosions elsewhere. They're trying to follow that, but it's a little bit hard to tell. Again, it is 2.30 in the morning in Kabul. And uh, Nick Robertson continues to watch there. Now let's turn to Judy Woodruff for us in Washington. Judy. Joey, we are in the studio in Washington, but of course riveted uh, to these pictures uh, coming out of Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, with me in the studio watching former United States Defense Secretary William Cohen and uh, Republican Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah. Uh, both, I want to ask both of you about what's going on. Let me begin with you, uh, Secretary Cohen. Is this something that is likely to be the United States retaliating, which is what I think immediately comes to people's minds? I think we have to be very uh, cautious in coming to that uh, judgment, Judy. Um, what we're looking at now is the United States gathering uh, information and intelligence. Obviously, there are many plans and contingency plans uh, that we have to deal with uh, responding uh, to any potential uh, terrorist threat that might be in the offing again. But I think it's uh, very premature to make any judgment on this. This could be a part of the civil war that's been raging on for some time. And so I think we have to wait to get more information. What do you mean part of a civil war? Well, there's been a civil war raging in uh, Afghanistan for some time now. And this could be simply uh, the factions still carrying on their fighting in, uh, in Kabul uh, rather than any kind of an attack being launched by the United States. Are you saying, uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, that it's unlikely that the United States would move this quickly uh, I'm asking that because just a few minutes ago I was interviewing former Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger and he said flat out what the United States needs to do is strike against countries like Afghanistan that are harboring terrorists and not wait to find out exactly who was responsible for today's atrocities. Well, I think we do have to uh, isolate uh, and ostracize those countries like Afghanistan and others who are on the terrorist list who give uh, safe harbor uh, for, for terrorists. But I think we have to be a little more uh, judicious uh, rather than simply striking out. We have to get uh, more information and uh, further strikes might be uh, warranted. But at this point, I think we get all the information, then make a very uh, cold, ice cold decision in terms of what uh, we need to do to protect the American people and make sure that this uh, doesn't happen again. But I think that uh, may be a bit premature at this point. Senator Hatch, again, we're stressing we have no idea who's behind these attacks in Kabul, uh, the uh, government uh, center of Afghanistan. But if this were the West, if this were the United States, would it be appropriate to retaliate so quickly? Well, we have some information. You know, about a month ago, we had information that, there were, uh, that they were planning on some big strikes, people who were affiliated or associated with bin Laden. Then uh, just today, uh, we've intercepted some information where some people who are associated with bin Laden basically said that uh, they had uh, hit two targets. So it looks to me like uh, there's, uh, there's increasing evidence, even though it's fragmentary and even though it's not positive, that uh, bin Laden uh, is behind all this. And of course, uh, I first warned the nation in 1996 on Meet the Press right. that we better get hold of bin Laden or he's going to kill Americans. We're going to bring back our Nick Robertson there on uh, the ground in, or I should say on top of a building there in Kabul. Nick, uh, you're on. Go. Well, certainly the fire we were watching on the horizon before, the, I'd made the assumption that it was an oil depot burning because we'd certainly seen flames, uh, a, a dull yellow fire turn into a bright 
orange fire with flames leaping into the sky. I've been informed by my uh, associates here who work with us in Kabul that it's very likely an ammunition dump that we're looking at. They believe an ammunition dump is located in that area. That, of course, would account for some of the explosions that we've been hearing here as ammunition has detonated and gone off from that location, Judy. Yeah. Certainly it's all quiet here in Kabul right now. Certainly no more explosions are being heard around the city. And I believe, we certainly believe what we're looking at now is an ammunition dump, the fire at that dump now dying down, and we're hearing no more detonations coming from that dump. Certainly, uh, Kabul is within striking range of some of the long-range missiles that the Northern Alliance has and is capable of uh, capable of, uh, of launching in this direction. And certainly, in the past, the Northern Alliance has launched missiles at Kabul. It is not without the realms of possibility that the Northern Alliance could launch missiles at this time. The Northern Alliance, in the last couple of days, has gone through a rather traumatic process of an assassination attempt on its key leader, um, Ahmed Shah Massoud, still unconfirmed whether that leader is alive or dead. And certainly uh, there's a ferocity within the, within the internal fighting in, going on in Afghanistan at this time. One certainly cannot rule out that any missiles falling on the city tonight could be coming from that northern alliance. So, uh, Nick Robertson, just to clarify, you're saying it could well be uh, at part of an internal, a civil war uh, that we see here and not a result of something coming from uh, the West, NATO, the United States. From our vantage point this evening, we can certainly report a large number of explosions around the city, what appears to be an ammunition dump on fire, a lot of return fire coming up from positions in Kabul. We cannot say from this uh, position at this time exactly where the missiles are coming from, those causing the detonations in and around the city of Kabul. Uh, it is possible it's from the Northern Alliance, and of course there is the other possibility uh, that we've been talking about this evening. And Nick, is this typical of the kind of uh, uh, fire that you've been seeing uh, back and forth uh, in this war that's been going on in Afghanistan. Is this at all typical? No. One would definitely have to say it's not typical. Uh, the strikes on Kabul have been very infrequent over the last few years, very occasional. Uh, the Northern Alliance very aware that it's been blamed in the past of uh, many civilian casualties by launching attacks on Kabul. So there have been very few direct attacks on the city. And indeed, uh, the forces of the Northern Alliance are at such a distance back from the city, only long-range, well, medium-range missiles capable of going uh, 30, 40, 50 miles are able to reach the city from their positions. And it's certainly not something uh, that, that's happened in this city, a barrage of this type, uh, a sustained uh, artillery attack or, or missile attack of this type uh, in, in recent years even. All right, Nick Robertson, we want you to stay connected to us. Uh, let's keep this connection alive. But as we're watching, as we're watching these pictures, uh, let's now go back to New York and to Aaron Brown. Aaron. Judy, thank you. I'm joined uh, here as well by Paula Zahn, and you will hear uh, her voice in just a moment. Uh, as we continue to look at these pictures out of Afghanistan, again, I would uh, remind you that the technology here is a, it's called a video phone. It is very high tech and a little bit imperfect, but it is perfect enough so that you can clearly see that fire burning in the distance. Uh, what Nick has described, Nick Robertson has described as an ammunition dump uh, very probably. And you can very clearly see, or we've been very able to see uh, throughout Nick's reporting, the tracer fire coming up, the anti-aircraft coming, fire coming up. I think we need to make it clear at this point that, that no group has claimed responsibility for the multiple attacks today, and yet U.S. intelligence officials confirmed with David Enser earlier today that they believe a group connected to Osama bin Laden may have been involved. You have talked about this all day long, and I think you've done a very good job of explaining how well-financed this would have had to have been, how well orchestrated. Uh, it, it, it begs the question, if, uh, if not Osama bin Laden, then who? Then who? Uh, Nick, from, from the very beginning, the Taliban officials, Afghani officials, have 
said we had nothing to do with this, Osama bin Laden had nothing to do with this. How do you hear that? Was there any nuance in the language that sent a different message that maybe the rest of us might not have heard? Well, perhaps we have lost at least the uh, the audio for portion here. Jamie McIntyre has been uh, outside the Pentagon. Jamie, can you hear us? I do hear you. Uh, uh, are, are you Paula? hearing? Are you hearing anything from the Pentagon, uh, wherever the Pentagon might literally be right now, or at least officials about whether there is an American involvement in what we are looking at in Afghanistan? I have talked to several senior officials and they've told me they uh, are not aware of whether or not this is a U.S. military strike, but the most senior officials are in the Pentagon and in fact uh, several busloads of reporters are being taken over now to the Pentagon briefing room where we expect shortly Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld flanked by uh, the Republican and Democratic leaders of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator Carl Levin and Senator John Warner, uh, to brief us on developments today. And if the this is in fact a military strike or part of a U.S. retaliation, we would expect that Secretary Rumsfeld would uh, tell us at that time. Secretary Rumsfeld has been in the Pentagon all day. He went outside briefly to make an inspection tour of the damage uh, behind me. Uh, many, many casualties here today, but the Pentagon is refusing to give any numbers or even estimates of how many people were killed and injured in this uh, terrorist attack uh, today here at the Pentagon. But again, no confirmation at this point from any of the officials that I've talked to about whether what we're seeing in Afghanistan is part of a U.S. military retaliation. Uh, Jamie, just to make sure that I, I've heard this correctly, no one is saying yes it is, but no one has said to you no it's not either, have they? No, uh, no one has steered us away from it. They've, uh, the officials who have been over here with the press, and we're just about uh, half a mile or so from the Pentagon, uh, simply said that they, were, they had not been briefed and were not aware of this action when we told them that CNN was reporting explosions in uh, Kabul. So, uh, uh, but again, uh, several officials uh, speculated that if this were the case, uh, that that might explain the reason for Secretary Rumsfeld's appearance. And of course, uh, being flanked by, uh, by the bipartisan support of Congress, Congress uh, is clearly designed to, s to send the message that there may be squabbles uh, between the Pentagon and Congress, but when it comes to something like this, there's absolute unanimity. That may also account for the reason that despite the uh, damage to the Pentagon, that they want to hold this event in the Pentagon briefing room, which is on the other side of the building, which was not damaged by the uh, plane crash into the side of the building, in order to show uh, a portrait to the world that the United States uh, military headquarters is still up and functioning and that the United States is still capable of, uh, of reaching out and touching its enemies. All right, thank you very much, Jamie. Right now, we're going to have Senator Orrin Hatch join us to provide some insights as to what might be going on. Senator Hatch, I don't know how much of uh, our coverage you've been listening to, but there seems to be a conflict of opinion as to whether we would be capable of pulling off this kind of attack if indeed that is what we are witnessing. What do you suspect is going on in Afghanistan right now? Well, let's understand we're capable of pulling it off if that's what it is, but it, uh, it's probably more likely the followers of Shah Massoud who was uh, deliberately bombed just yesterday and who was uh, seriously injured if not killed. Now, the, uh, his representatives say he was injured, but he's, he's all right. But there is some indication that he may have died in the attack. And he was, of course, the opposition to the Taliban over in Afghanistan. So it's a very serious situation over there as well. But what about what uh, former Secretary of Defense William Cohen just mentioned, that you would want to know who actually carried off these attacks before you planned any kind of retaliatory, retaliatory strike if this is not uh, a result of some conflict within Af Afghanistan? Well, I agree with Secretary Cohen. We have to be very cautious. On the other hand, I thought Secretary Eagleberger was very honest when he said that, uh, look, these, the, the Taliban have been harboring Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden has uh, said that uh, it is the duty of every Muslim to kill Americans. Uh, there's, no there, there's every indication that he has been behind some of the attacks against American I installations. And we happen to know just today that we've got information that, that uh, uh, indicates that uh, uh, re representatives who are affiliated with Osama bin Laden were actually saying over the airwaves, that, uh, uh, the private airwaves at that, that uh, 
that uh, they had uh, hit two targets. Uh, if you go back to the Millennium uh, a problem scare that we had uh, before the year 2000, Osama bin Laden was in the middle of all of that, and the people associated with him and affiliated with him was in the middle of that. So this is a very serious situation. So they should not be harboring this criminal, and, and we've got to, it seems to me, go after him. And it does look, although the evidence is fragmentary, as though he's had a uh, major role in what's happened here today. Secretary Cohen, are you as convinced as Senator Hatch is that Osama bin Laden played some role in this tragedy here today? I think uh, if you were to cast the, uh, the searchlight of probability on these uh, footprints, they would lead uh, to Osama bin Laden, but I still think that we have to get uh, more evidence. This is not evidence uh, of a, uh, that you would need in the prosecution of a, of a criminal act. Uh, I uh, distinguish between terrorism and, uh, and a criminal act. Uh, and so I would think you just need uh, more evidence than we have right now, but it doesn't have to be something you can uh, use in a court of law. I think that the probability is it points to Osama bin Laden himself or the groups that uh, he supports, uh, and therefore I think we, uh, we ought to keep our focus uh, very much on him but not exclude others. And so I think a little more time is necessary, but I don't disagree with uh, Secretary uh, Eagleburger that we need to respond uh, swiftly and uh, very strongly to those who have inflicted this, uh, this great uh, tragedy upon the American people. Secretary Cohn, it's Aaron Brown. Um, we have heard uh, in a number of conversations that we've had today that the United States needs to be more aggressive or more proactive in its counterterrorism efforts that you can't wait until something has happened that you have to stop it before and it may be that some innocents will suffer because of it that's a political problem isn't it uh, it is and the thing we have to keep in mind is uh, we do not want to allow terrorists to strike such terror in the hearts of the American people that we become like them that we become indifferent to how many innocent people that we might kill uh, that is what separates us uh, from, um, from terrorism uh, and from the terrorists. Uh, we have a higher standard. Uh, so we have to be very careful in how we respond and how we take action against those who are planning further acts of terrorism against the American people so that we don't become um, a drawn down into that level of, um, uh, of uh, evil that they have perpetrated. So that's what distinguishes the, uh, the American people and our ideals, and we ought to adhere to those. And, and Senator Hatch, you think that the political equation on how the United States deals with this has changed because of what's happened today? No question about it. We, can, we can't uh, take this kind of uh, action without a very heavy response. And we have some information, it may be fragmentary, but the fact is we have some information that indicates that, uh, uh, that Osama bin Laden and many of his affiliates and associates, uh, he's certainly the motivating uh, force uh, behind these people. He certainly has the money and he certainly uh, has the uh, ability to, uh, to motivate uh, antagonistic forces against the United States, and he said he's, he wants to do that. So uh, it, looks, it looks very much like that, although we're not absolutely certain at this point. But Senator, what, what Secretary Eagleburger said a little while ago, others have said, is not that we, as a country, not that the United States responds all the time, that at some point it needs to uh, take a proactive, it needs to strike before the attack itself, before the terrorist attack. And if some innocents are hurt, if mistakes get made, that is an unfortunate reality. Has well, that, that's a political problem, and I, I want to know, I guess, from you, if you think the country, which has been reluctant to do that, will be less so because of today. Well, this is an act of war. As far as I'm concerned, war's been declared against the United States. We ought to act accordingly. And we should have a very stiff response to that. And to be honest with you, uh, it looks to me as though uh, what's happened in New York, just think about it, there, there are literally, there must be thousands of people killed here, probably more than at Pearl Har Harbor uh, by far. And, and, and there, is, there is evidence, there is indication that there were people who have been affiliated with Osama bin Laden whose communications have been intercepted that basically, basically uh, have said that they uh, got two targets. Uh, there's a lot of other information that is coming forward, although it's fragmentary and nobody can absolutely be gu guaranteed uh, in the surety of it, but we all know that Osama bin Laden is uh, doing everything he can to antagonize American forces, to try and hit against Americans. He's called for the death of Americans, and uh, we, ought to, we ought to respond forces on the ground. And we've got to start doing that. And we've got to do a lot of other things. I reported uh, 
uh, last Sunday with Wolf Blitzer here that uh, it's amazing with all of the economic difficulties that they have that the Russians have a better uh, tactical fighter than we do, that it's more maneuverable, it is uh, faster, and our pilots can fly it better than our F-15, which is becoming quite old, and we're, we've been allowing our military to deteriorate. But not only that, our intelligence, we haven't been, uh, been beefing it up like we should, and we know that terrorism is a, a reality out there, and especially against the United States, and we also know many of the people who are doing it. And the people who are excited about this over in the Middle East, who are dancing in the streets, who are making fun of the United States, we ought to remember who they are because they're enemies of our country. All right. Relaxation to their spirits after hearing such a, such a traumatic event. Okay. And really quickly, how are you feeling on a personal level about this? It's tough. It's tough. When you think of the people who are, who are impacted by this, how far, how wide it's going to go, we, we, there are people who live here in New Haven who are impacted by this. This is going to be nationwide. This is a global event. All right. Thank you so much. All right. For, uh, we're going to interrupt you. We, we're, we're sorry. We need to okay. go right to network. All okay. Right. I'm Peter Jennings. This is an ABC News special report. Hello again, everybody, and for those of you joining us now who uh, I cannot imagine under any circumstances expected to see a normal World News Tonight broadcast at this time. We've been on the air for the last 10 hours as the country has endured uh, or is trying to, uh, to get through, as one official here in New York said, this horrendous attack on the United States today in both New York City and outside Washington at the Pentagon and an attack that may or may not have gone wrong on Camp David in Maryland, the president's country retreat, but certainly resulted in the deaths of some people on yet another airliner today. Uh, so this is going to be a very different broadcast and try to deal in the next half hour as we have deal with today in a comprehensive way um, exactly what the United States has been through today. It began a little more than 10 hours, a little less than 10 hours ago, and first one aircraft, we'll take you through the, the video scenes of the day, um, when first one aircraft and then another hit and ultimately destroyed the twin one trade towers 110 stories high on the west side of Manhattan. We didn't see the first one happen even though television was on and that is the astonishing second one as seen by a freelance cameraman who joined us a short while ago um, and he then stayed on to record this extraordinary, which we've seen from many angles, collapsed to first one of the Trade Towers and then of the other. And the attack uh, brought down these two towers upon themselves, ultimately, and has left this extraordinary pile of rubble, a video brought to us from yet another person. Meanwhile, um, we have this crash at the Pentagon, 200 feet wide, concern at the White House, Obviously, the president was in Florida early today, but then particularly when word that a fourth plane had been hijacked, which ultimately crashed in the Pennsylvania countryside outside Johnstown, Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh. The president of the United States has spent part of this day in an underground bunker in Nebraska. Uh, he's on his way back uh, to Washington now. He's going to speak to the nation tonight. Uh, the Navy's Atlantic fleet was at one point diverted to come and bring aircraft carriers to New York Harbor so that they could assist. There's, there's help and assistance uh, descending on New York and Washington from a variety of places. And, and it's probably not at all unfair to say that the entire country is, in some measure, in shock uh, as to what has happened uh, to the United States in a psychological, symbolic, and very physical way uh, on this uh, particular day. In this half hour, we're going to try to um, put together um, just some of the more cogent reporting of our reporters who've been watching this throughout the day. And I want to go first to ABC's Diane Sawyer, who's been in Midtown Manhattan all day, gathering what she can. Diane. All right, Peter. Forgive me if I don't respond to you carefully, because it's still very noisy down here, and I'm going to kind of tell you what happened to me. We're now about four blocks from the scene, and as you can see, even at this hour, it's like being on the edge of the crater of a volcano. The smoke is still pouring out, the air is still acrid with fumes. Everywhere around me, I see haggard firefighters, exhausted policemen, 
And then in this eerie disconnect in New York, occasionally you see people just succumbing to the everyday and walking by. But still, if when you look at this, it is clear it is not over because as we know within the last hour another building came down number 47 a 47 story building and also they're saying they're evacuating now the millennium hotel so this may not be over in a number of ways as i said when you walk around the streets of new york and it's too easy probably to say that it's like one of those techno future thrillers where everything seems wrong and yet people are carrying packages they've been shopping while firefighters are still streaking their way down here i also want to bring in if i can don daler peter because don has been down here all day he was with us this morning as well and about an hour ago you made your way up to the scene and you've had those pictures from from the private photographer peter but i want don to tell us what he saw when he went to the scene himself right well about an hour ago we made our way down Broadway past where there were a large number of firemen gathered, very frustrated, very exhausted because they were not being allowed to put out these fires in the number of the buildings around the, the site of the World Trade Center itself. There was too much danger for them to be going there. They wanted to go and work. We made our way past the firemen and got about half a block away from where this building on this side would have been standing. And there was billowing smoke. It was hard to see everything, but I clearly saw something worse than I, what Dante would have imagined. There was there was rubble, there was twisted metal, and I clearly saw bodies and what appeared to be body parts strewn on the street, on the, on the rubble itself. And people still working on the evacuations? Working on evacuations. Yes, but, but they were forcing, at the point I was there, the police were forcing everyone uh, from emergency workers to the firemen away because there was such a fear, as you saw later, of, of a building collapse. Well, I want to give you a sense again, Peter, of what it is like here when one of the buildings collapsed. We have here Jeff Rosson, who's from WABC, our affiliate, which has done great work today on this story. And Jeff, we have footage, and I hope we can cue it up because we see this wall, this thunderous wall of smoke streaking down the street, and you were just ahead of it. And for all of you who were trying to escape it, what was that like? Well, what happened was we saw this big cloud coming at us. It was dust and it was smoke. And we knew the people inside of it couldn't see anything because we saw them running at us. So our job was to just get out of the way. What happened was we couldn't get out of the way fast enough and it caught up with us. We have people crying. They were creating a human chain, literally walking around like this because they couldn't see anything. At one point, we were stuck. We were at a store with a glass front and we couldn't get in. There was no way to go. We couldn't breathe. We didn't have masks. So an officer, a police officer from New York, came in with an ax and literally just bashed in the window and led us into that store. If it wasn't for that, I'm not sure what we would have done. And that's been a huge problem all day. Couldn't just see anything, and that was the problem. What was the heat like, and how suffocating was it for those trying to escape? It was hot, but luckily we were a couple of blocks away, and, and the bigger problem was all the dust. And it got into your lungs, and you just kept coughing, and you couldn't speak, and you couldn't see. That I mean, you kept people were walking at the poles. People were crying and screaming. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Well, again, these are just a couple of people who have been on the scene all day, Peter. And as we said, we have watched this footage. We have seen people both heroic, terrified, and mystified. And the scene out here tonight is really just one of complete, almost wounded numbness. And there's no other phrase I can summon at this moment to convey it to you. Thank you very much, Diane. Diane Sawyer, who's been in Midtown Manhattan all day trying to get a grasp of the city and, and very effectively what's going on around her. Don Daler from ABC News, Good Morning America, has been down uh, with a couple of freelance photographers. It's freelance photographers who brought us uh, the, most, uh, the most intimate, the closest up video of what actually happened at the Twin Trade Towers today. It's a reminder of the world we live in. There's a camera pointed by somebody almost everywhere. Catch up very quickly on a story to say again what we said before World News Tonight came on, which that U.S. officials speaking for some reasons on the conditions of anonymity say the United States is not involved in any of the violence going on in Kabul, the Afghanistan capital tonight. This appears to be an intra-Afghan affair that the, uh, that the supporters of, uh, of a leading anti-Taliban leader who was killed the other day have been rocketing the city tonight so it has nothing as best we can tell uh, to do with this and then of course there was the pentagon and it just think back 10 hours it just began to pile up on us one thing after the other one was horrible the next was third horrible by the time the pentagon attacked shortly after the attack on the twin trade towers it was amazing and here's abc's john mccrethy who's been there all day john Peter, it was at 9.38 this morning. I was innocently sitting in my office at the Pentagon when there was a jolting blast on the other side of the building. You can see it over my shoulder. 
uh, a large aircraft came down 395, which is a major highway. It clipped off the tops of many of the light poles on the way in, and it slammed into the building. Uh, you can see on the one side of the huge gash uh, that windows, 25 windows down along the Pentagon were destroyed. Uh, the building, the section of the building that was hit by the fuselage of the aircraft collapsed several minutes after the aircraft hit it. Um, I was able to get an exclusive walk up to the damaged site uh, with some officials who got me through police lines. Uh, the area is uh, surrounded with police evidence uh, uh, markings all over. There was a huge area for medical triage uh, that is quiet now. And now they are continuing to fight fires inside the building, Peter, so they can go ahead and try and get anyone who may be still trapped in the rubble. It took them five hours before they were able to get into the building initially and begin to look for people who might be trapped and injured. John, we heard a while ago, and there's some chaos here too, as you can understand, about, the ca about a preliminary casualty figure at the Pentagon. Do you feel you have a good handle on that? I do not have a good handle on it, Peter. There have been wild rumors from several hundred to over a thousand. It's impossible to know at this point, uh, and I will not speculate. And you may have said this most recently, uh, and we would never want you to speculate, John. Um, we, we believe, I believe you said now what you said earlier before, that the senior military officials of the Pentagon, none of them have been hurt to the best of your knowledge. Don Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, is in just a few minutes going to hold a briefing inside the Pentagon for a very few number of reporters that are over there. Um, and all of the military chiefs have been accounted for, and they have been spending the day in the National Military Command Center. Presumably, they have initially been looking at rescue uh, options, but we also believe they are looking at retaliation options. But before that can happen, of course, the United States has to determine who they believe is responsible for this attack. I'll tell you, Peter, there is a pervasive sense of anger among the military officers I've talked to today. They have mentioned again and again Pearl Harbor, saying that it is going to be dwarfed, the number of people killed in Pearl Harbor so many years ago, just about 2,600. They say the casualties from this one are going to be so much worse. They are ready to go to war. There is a sense of war here at the Pentagon. And thank you very much, John McCarthy at the Pentagon. We'll be coming back to you many times in the course of the evening. The question is, go to war with whom? Uh, because uh, from the FBI, from the CIA, from the Pentagon today, no warning of this whatsoever, no knowledge of who's involved, no clues yet as to who's involved that we have heard about in any respect today. It has been interesting today to try to focus on the president, too, because the country does so uh, clearly focus, I can't read that, I'm sorry, does focus on the president in a moment like this for leadership. And I believe that Ann Compton, who's been with the president all day in a very tight group of people with the president, is on Air Force One and can talk to us at the moment. Annie, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, I can. We're just getting off of Air Force One. He has arrived back in Washington with a dramatic flight with F-16s and F-15s on either wing as he came into Andrews Air Force Base. And the president feels it's important to address the nation tonight. Later this evening, he will give what we are told is a message of reassurance to Americans that the United States has been tested before and has always passed those tests. And uh, when we saw him briefly toward the back of the plane, he was resolute. Annie, thank you very much. And the president will take a helicopter, I gather, from Andrews Air Force Base um, downtown, or do we know that? Well, we do know that, but it's one of the things we aren't going to talk about until he's safely at home. Well, we just did, inadvertently, <laughs> and, and as we had not been told not to talk about it, but there was some yeah. question. The president does traditionally come from Andrews Air Force Base down, and one assumes given the extraordinary security that's uh, surrounded the president today and how the Secret Service has moved him first from Florida and then out to Nebraska and now to, to Louisiana, first of all, then to Nebraska and back to Washington, president all over the country. Here's the Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, who's been in the Pentagon all day. And we're having difficulty hearing him, and one should not be surprised if there isn't some kind of, if there's some kind of hookup that didn't work today. Very, very rarely today have we had a problem. So we'll have our reporter on the scene listen to this, and the moment that we can hear him, we will go back to him. But in the meantime, Claire Shipman is just outside the, uh, the White House across Lafayette Square. Claire, I want to check in quickly with you, if I may, to know that if we know anything about the President's plans for this evening, 
that we, in some respects, haven't had on the air today or go beyond what Ann's reporting is? Well, what we do know is that we're told by sources who've been with the president today that he is extremely upset, of course, about what has happened, but agitated and angry. Somebody told us that the language he will use tonight will be retaliatory. He will express his impatience. In other words, he will say there won't be a long time spent thinking about how to act once Claire, the U.S. is confident. I apologize. I wouldn't interrupt you if sure. we couldn't go back to Mr. Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense. Well, the best laid plans. First of all, oh, here we are. Kind enough to uh, come down and has been with us. Uh, we've very recently had a discussion with the President of the United States. Uh, Chairman Hugh Shelton has just landed from Europe. Um, Secretary of the Army, Tom White, who has a, a responsibility for incidents like this. Uh, as executive agent for the Department of Defense is also joining me. Uh, it's an indication that the United States government is functioning in the face of this terrible act uh, against our country. I should add that the briefing here is taking place in the Pentagon. The Pentagon's functioning. It'll be in business tomorrow. I know the interest in casualty figures, and all I can say is it's not possible to have solid casualty fi figures uh, at this time. And uh, the various components are doing roster checks, and we'll have uh, information at some point in the future, and as quickly as it's possible to have it, it will certainly be made available to each of you. Uh, I'll be happy to take a few questions after uh, asking uh, First General Shelton. Uh, if he would like to say anything, and then we will allow the others to make a remark or two. General Shelton, outgoing Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Secretary just said, today we have watched the tragedy of an outrageous act of barbaric terrorism carried out by fanatics against both civilians and military people, acts that have killed and maimed many innocent and decent citizens of our country. I extend my condolences to the entire Department of Defense families, military and civilian, and to the families of all those throughout our nation who lost loved ones. I think this is indeed a reminder of the, tragic, the tragedy and the tragic dangers that we face day in and day out, both here at home as well as abroad. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next, but make no mistake about it. Your armed forces are ready. Chair. Chairman of the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, Carl Levin. Our intense focus on recovery and helping the injured and the families of those who were killed is matched only by our determination to prevent more attacks and matched only by our unity to track down, root out, and relentlessly pursue terrorists, states that support them, and harbor them. They are the common enemy of the civilized world. Our institutions are strong, and our unity is palpable. Senator John Warner. Thank you. As a past chairman, uh, preceding Carl Levin, I can assure you that the Congress stands behind our president, and the president speaks with one voice for this entire nation. This is indeed the most tragic hour in America's history, and yet I think it can be its finest hour, as our president and those with him most notably our Secretary of Defense, our Chairman, and the men and women of the armed forces all over this world uh, stand ready not only to defend this nation and our allies against further attack, but to take such actions as are directed in the future in retaliation for this terrorist act, a series of terrorist acts unprecedented in world history. We call upon the entire world to step up and help 
because terrorism is a common enemy to all, and we're in this together. The United States has borne the brunt, but who can be next? Step forward and let us hold accountable and punish those that have perpetrated this attack. Again, I commend the Secretary, the Chairman, and how proud we are. We spoke with our President here moments ago. He's got a firm grip on this situation. And the Secretary and the General have a firm grip on our armed forces and in communication of the, the world over. The Secretary of Defense, uh, Carl much. Levin, Senator we'll Democratic take Senator Carl Levin. Oh, they're uh, going to take questions. Let's stay here with this and see if, we, if, if anything is sure. revealed. Mr. Secretary, did you have any inkling at all, in any way, that something of this nature and something of the scope might be planned? Uh, Charlie, we, we don't discuss intelligence matters. I see. And, how, and how, how would you respond if you find out who did this? The, uh, obviously, the President of the United States has spoken on that subject, and those are issues that he will address in good time. Mr. Yes. Secretary, we are getting reports uh, from CNN and others that there are bombs exploding in Kabul, Afghanistan. Are we at the moment striking back, and if so, is the target Osama bin Laden and his organization? I've seen those reports. Uh, they, in no way, is the United States government connected to those explosions. What about Osama bin Laden? Do you suspect him as the prime suspect in this? Uh, it's, it's, it's not the time for discussions like that. Mr. Secretary, you said you could not be specific about casualties. Can you give us some characterization of whether it's dozens <coughs> or hundreds in the, in the building? Well, we know there were large number, many dozens, in the aircraft that flew at full power, uh, steering directly into the, between, I think, the first and second floor of the uh, uh, opposite the helipad. Uh, you've seen it. Uh, it there, there cannot be any survivors. It, it just would be beyond comprehension. The, um, there are a, a number of people that they've uh, not identified by name, but identified as being uh, dead. And uh, there are a number of casualties. But uh, we're, the FBI has secured the site. And the um, information takes time to come. People have been uh, lifted out and taken away in ambulances, and uh, the, the numbers will be calculated, and it will not be a few. Mr. Secretary, could you tell us what yes. you saw? Mr. Secretary, do you consider what happened today, both in New York and here, an act of war? Mm -hmm. There is no question but that the attack against the United States of America today was a, 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 a vicious, a well-coordinated, um, a massive attack against the United States of America. Um, what words the lawyers will use to characterize it uh, is for them. Is this the does Secretary that mean of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, at being asked all the obvious questions, and let's just quickly review them before we move. Did they have any inkling of this in advance? The answer is they don't discuss this. Every single piece of evidence we have seen all day says the United States in, in no way had any inkling of what was going to happen. And if they did, boy, somebody missed something somewhere. Uh, Secretary, reaffirming what we reported to you already, the U.S. has no, or saying again what we've said already, that the U.S. has no involvement in Afghanistan, uh, the violence occurring in Kabul tonight. This is not a time to discuss or whether or not the United States suspects Osama bin Laden, but he's been at the top of the list of American suspects for international acts of, acts of international terrorism for so long now, it's impossible not to imagine he wouldn't be at the top. Casualties in the building, he says there are many. And then he goes on to make the point that we sometimes forget in covering New York and the Pentagon today, and that is the people who died on the aircraft. 266 people died on, on three aircraft today, uh, four aircraft today. The two that crashed into the Trade Towers, the one that crashed into the Pentagon, uh, and <coughs> the one that crashed uh, in Pennsylvania today, whether or not it was on a mission or not. Was this an act of war? Secretary of Defense and everybody else in the government today, uh, you can expect to be very careful about using the phrase an act of war because it imposes on the United States um, certain requirements to respond in certain ways if they find themselves involved in a war, especially with, with another country. We believe this is now the President coming from uh, Andrews Air Force Bay to the White House, but it was Senator John Warner, 
one of the most senior politicians involved with the military for many, many years in that year now, and a man with a real sense of history and knowledge of history, surely, who describes this as the most tragic hour in America's history. I think there will be people, not least of whom are historians throughout the country, will will argue with the senator about that today, given the attack on Pearl Harbor, given the invasion of Normandy, and heavens knows, given the first and most tragic days of the, of the Civil War in 1861, who will argue with that characterization. But it does give you some real sense at the moment of how intense the feeling is, not only in the political establishment, in the country as a whole as well, and all sorts of other countries. I'm getting messages from countries all day today, people deeply, profoundly shaken uh, by the uh, experience that the United States has had today. I want to go to Washington now because Claire Shipman is there right opposite the White House. We'll come back to Charlie Gibson and casualties in just a Don't moment, but as we think, Claire, that the President may indeed be arriving. Are those helicopters, Air Force or Marine One as it's called, the President's helicopter coming from Andrews Air Force Base? Uh, yes, that's right, Peter. And in fact, we're told the only reason that his security team felt comfortable letting him chop her back to the White House was because there is substantial air cover in the area uh, keeping him protected. But it has been a, a long day for him, as you noted, and he has, we're told from people who were with him, wanted to get back to the White House all day, but again was listening very closely to his security team who wanted to be absolutely certain that that was going to be all right. Um, we were talking earlier, the president is very eager to make plain tonight that his mood is retaliatory to express impatience. We got a little bit of a hint of that from a statement from Ari Fleischer, his press secretary today, who said um, not so long ago, we will find these people and they will suffer the consequences of taking on this nation. I wouldn't be surprised to hear something like that from the president tonight. Equally eager to get back, Peter, uh, just as the president is back, congressional leaders, they're planning to make a public statement tonight at 7.30 p.m. Again, everybody wanting to show this is business as usual in Washington, certainly not usual in the way we, we would ever define it, but they want to show a government that is up and functioning because they think that the PR element here in terms of sending a message around the world is every bit as important as security measures. As we wait, I'm going to spring in the voice of Charlie Gibson at the moment because I do not want to go away from this scene on what I assume is the south lawn of the White House. Um, we'll just stay with this and watch the president come out. But Charlie, you've been trying to get some kind of handle on casualties throughout the day. Have you had any success? Well, no, Peter. People want a number. Mm -hmm. And uh, as if it were some way to quantify these most horrific of acts. And properly, no one has been willing to speculate on what that number may be. Obviously, any low number would have to be ratcheted up at some point. And to give upper end estimates are probably too horrible to imagine. As the mayor of New York, Rudolph Giuliani, said, when we get the final number, it will be more than we can bear. Um, the concern, obviously, is that there were emergency workers inside the World Trade Centers when they collapsed, when the Twin Towers came down, and the evacuations had not been completed. And as the Secretary of Defense said a moment ago, when we get the totals from the Pentagon, it will be a lot more than a few. Uh, we do have some estimates on injured, but again, these are highly unreliable. The mayor, again, saying at least 2,100 injured in New York. 1,500 taken to Liberty State Park across the Hudson River in New Jersey, 600 taken to hospitals, and the most chilling, one of the most chilling quotes that we've heard today, St. Vincent's Hospital here in New York had more than 200 injured. One doctor, Stephen Stern, saying there, hundreds of people burned head to toe, and we know many burn victims have been evacuated, some as far away as being taken to Canada, some being flown to Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville. Uh, the military apparently flying those burned victims out. Thanks, Tony. There he is, the president coming back from a trip that has taken him first to Florida today to talk about education, when ironically the political establishment in Washington wanted to talk about federal budget and keeping the country out of recession. And then this happened just as the president was visiting a group of people. He learned about it, spoke to the people, then moved on to Louisiana and then out to Nebraska. Uh, where he went into a bunker totally reminiscent of the situation which the president might have found himself in and which the country prepared for during the Cold War when the issue was nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
And now, after something of a sharp debate, we gather, between the president's political staff and between the Secret Service, the president is coming home uh, to the White House. There's, no, there's nothing <coughs> that this president, this new and young president, could ever have imagined was going to occur on his watch, which would test his leadership qualities so. And he is going, and, 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 how he, and how he responds, how he accommodates the country's frustration, and how he accommodates uh, the country's uh, anxiety and anger, and how he responds, or finds a way to respond, and as we've said many times, to whom uh, will mark George Bush, however it goes, one way or the other. As he to speak to the nation at 9 o'clock tonight, and the, the Claire Shipman said to us, the representatives of the Congress, who've been pretty forthright today, earlier Senator Biden early today, saying the Congress must be seen to keep going, that the most important thing is that terrorists not be, see, not be allowed to see that American life has been interrupted to any greater extent than it already has today. So we're going to hear in full later tonight, but we shall be on the air for the entire time for any development. Lisa Stark, who covers aviation for us on a full-time basis from Washington, uh, is in Seattle today. Among other things, the headquarters of the Boeing company, which had its aircraft involved in these hijackings today, 757 and a 767. What can you tell us, Lisa? Well, Peter, it now appears uh, that, it, that the weapon of choice appears to have been knives on board these planes. We know from uh, reports from our sources and others that reports from flight attendants on an American flight and from two passengers, from passengers on two different flights we're now learning, uh, the United flight that went into the World Trade Tower as well as the flight that went into the Pentagon, cell phone calls from passengers on both those flights reported that uh, men were on board with with knives or box cutters, uh, that flight attendants had been injured or killed, uh, that people had stormed the cockpit. We also learned that on one of the flights, the American Airlines flight that went into the World Trade Tower, the flight attendant was also able to tell the American Airlines Operations Center, she reached them and told them what was going on board, she was able to tell them the actual seat number of the passenger who was causing the problems on the plane. So that may lead authorities at least to one name, at least the name of the person who booked that ticket. She was able to give that information uh, to the people at American Airlines. Obviously, this was a major security breach at, at, least at three U.S. airports. There will be a lot of talk, as there is already, about how this could possibly have happened. Uh, one person told me these are obviously shocking events, but not that surprising. There have been a number of reports throughout the years about security problems at U.S. airports. The Department of Transportation Inspector General, uh, the GAO, all of those uh, groups have done reports talking about how easy it is to penetrate secure areas, to get on airplanes, how easy it is to get devices past the people who are checking you at the screening machines. So obviously uh, this will be a focus of the investigation to find out how these people got on board and how the weapons got on board as well. Peter? Lisa Stark, who is in, uh, <coughs> in Seattle uh, for us tonight, and gives us uh, one additional piece of information I think we have not had earlier today, which was that one of the people on board the American Airlines flight that uh, was, I think she said, the first, Lisa, are you still there? Lisa Stark's still there. I think she said was the first flight, or the first aircraft today, which run into, a, into the trade towers, that somebody on board did manage to give some security operators at American Airlines headquarters the number of a seat in which one of the hijackers or terrorists was occupying. Am I correct in that, correct. Lisa? That, that was the American Airlines mm. Flight 11. It was the one that went into, the one of the two that went into the World Trade Tower. The flight attendant was able to tell American Airlines operations the actual, identified the actual seat number of the person involved in the hijacking. So that may help authorities. And Peter, I want to add one other thing. I did manage to talk to a number of controllers in the New York area today. Uh, they told me that they uh, realized by the time the second plane was heading to the World Trade Tower what was going to happen. They said they had a helpless feeling. All they could do was watch the blip on the screen. At that point, of course, there was nothing that they could do. Okay, thanks very much. Lisa Stark in Seattle <coughs> tonight, the headquarters of the Boeing Company or at least part of the headquarters of the Boeing Company, and they moved to Chicago. But there's three airports, three major, major 
uh, violations of security or breaches of security, to be fair, um, at Dulles Airport just outside Washington at Boston. And as somebody pointed earlier, it could have been any number of flights leaving from Boston today. And at Newark Airport, a flight headed for uh, the West Coast as well, all three of which given the fact that they were going to be transcontinental flights, would have had huge amounts of fuel on board. It was John Miller who first brought us that piece of information. And John, you, I don't think anybody's been in quite as close touch as you have with uh, the cops, the firefighters here in New York City today. As we get to this point, a little more than 10 hours after this incident, what, what do you, not your conclusion, what's your interim conclusion of where we're at? Well, three things are happening. Uh, one, the very basics. The FBI has activated its command post in New York and set up, uh, well, an FBI slang. It's a lead bucket. Uh, as all leads come in, they're entered into computers and agents are assigned to go out and check them out. This covers everything from crazy crank calls about people who suspect people to uh, leads from people with direct information. They, uh, they have set up a toll-free number that they're working on getting the, the telephone number for. We don't have it yet. Um, for national leads to come in. Ironically, it won't be in New York. It's going to come into the Atlanta field office because they literally are buried under phone calls and, and, and business in New York. So they've tasked that field office to sort through these phone calls in the coming days. The other thing they're going through, of course, is the back channel. They're talking to the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency is somewhat limited because their offices may have been wiped out at the Pentagon today. That was the area their offices were located in to talk about what leads were you looking at? What intelligence did you have? What things came in? Did we miss something? Is there something that we could have read into um, that we may have overlooked? Did we have any inkling of this, um, A, that we should have known about, but more importantly right now that will point us in the direction of who did it? There's been a lot of discussion of quote unquote uh, going to war mm. and the question is still mm. with whom and they yeah. seem to be a great distance away from knowing that right now. One of the things that we talked about a little earlier today before this period we usually devote to world news tonight was the National Security Agency which listens to so much uh, both at home and abroad has constant monitoring of, of uh, cell phones both here and abroad and that will surely be one of the first places they will listen to see if they can pick up communication between the members of what was a very well coordinated attack. Yes, and I mean, they, uh, after, after realizing that there were signals mm. coming from cell phones on those planes, they've been scanning backwards, and we understand picking up phone calls from other civilians on mm. the plane, the planes that uh, may have given valuable intelligence as to who the hijackers were, how many. The fact that they're going to begin to gather data in Atlanta is, of course, reminiscent of the Oklahoma City bombing investigation, which the FBI messed up so much, in part, we think, because they were so overloaded with information, trying to get around a past problem immediately at the beginning of this one. Well, they've, they've certainly learned a lot of lessons there. Uh, their computer system is uh, somewhat new, and they now have an online case tracking system, which should be helpful. Um, but that's going to be a problem because this is going to be a case of worldwide leads and national leads and a tremendous amount of paper to keep track of and things not to overlook. And just so to remind people of how tough it's going to be, the new director of the FBI is a man named Robert Mueller. He's been on the job just a, a few days. Just a few, a few days and, 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 he, and he walks into this. Who will run the operation? FBI Washington, FBI New York. A little hard to understand. This operation will be run by FBI headquarters from the highest level, from the directors. But, but the office that has right now been tasked as the lead office is the New York office of the FBI. And there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, they have the most experience in international terrorism cases. Uh, they have the most cases that they feel may be related to this, uh, this action. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have the assets and experience all around the world. And of course, there is the added advantage that they're, they're on the ground in New York where the largest crime scene is right now. They investigated the first World Trade Center bombing. Uh, the bombings of the embassies was a New York FBI case. So this is something that they're quite unfortunately all too well experienced at. In other than the rescue, the search operation and the hopeful rescue operation, thank you, John, which uh, New York is involved in tonight and at the Pentagon as well, um, we're in something of a suspend, state of suspended animation. Uh, Governor Pataki is, is just one of the politicians who's come out today and said, make an example of those who are responsible. Well, the answer is the Pentagon was stunned. The FBI, by his own admission, was stunned. You heard Secretary Rumsfeld 
so they wouldn't discuss intelligence. Nobody knew this was going to happen. There isn't a single shred of evidence, as we've said before today, that anybody had an inkling that this was coming. And if they did, uh, we'll learn about that in days ahead. But in the meantime, one more attempt to pull together uh, this day in New York City. Clearly, New Yorkers and others across the country argue the most important symbol of the United States on the east coast of the United States, and those twin trade towers, a symbol of so much that is America. Here's ABC's James Walker. As the upper floors of the Trade Center towers burned, inside, employees scrambled to escape. I'm on the 82nd floor, and I don't know where my peers are. I don't know. I hope to God they're okay. That's all I can say. I don't know what. We saw a shadow, it looked like a plane. Next thing we know, it was boom, boom, and the floor started shaking. And then we saw debris fall down, and next thing we know, we had to get out of the building. We stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, it was this big explosion. As soon as you got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. On the street, New Yorkers looked up and watched in horror. Oh, no! Oh, no! And then we saw the people jumping. We saw what we thought was debris, and we realized it was people jumping. I started seeing people um, just uh, they started jumping out of the window, like at the 96th floor. They just started um, one at a time in different parts of the building. I just started seeing people just drop, drop, and drop. And uh, I must have counted like 30 or 40 people, you know. Rescue workers raced to the scene. But then, some 90 minutes after the attack... Oh my God, there it goes! Get out of here! Soot and rubble were everywhere, and with it, chaos. scared me the most was the panic and people were running and you just saw this great big cloud of um, dust just coming from the center of the building and, and, and mushrooming out uh, towards the, the river. There was, uh, people had no place to go. People were going to jump in the river, they were going to swim, they, they were jumping on a boat, they were breaking, I mean, breaking glass to get into uh, nearby r homes and restaurants. There was, you know, dust and whatnot everywhere, but it was... Firefighters and police officers found themselves momentarily helpless. Trained to save others, they suddenly had to save themselves. It's a war. We've been, uh, we've been attacked. It's, uh, it's like World War II. It's World War II. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. Tonight, crews are standing by to start searching for the thousands of people feared missing in the debris. James Walker, ABC News, New York. Well, you hear of five fire. Nobody's, nobody is accustomed to tragedy to a greater extent than firefighters, and you hear of a firefighter there describing it as, as World War II. I want to go back and reach into our earlier coverage today for a couple of things. But first, I know that most of the people at the ABC News bureaus around the country are out covering the story, any of them who we can get to come in and give us some sense of the mood of the country as a whole at the moment would, would be very much appreciated, even if they call in on the telephone. A little earlier today, ABC's Lynn Schur put together um, a package for us in which we asked someone to take the radar monitoring that the Federal Aviation Administration does of the entire country in components all the way across the country of this one particular aircraft that they were able to track from Boston maneuvering in such a way that it became clear to them at a horrifying moment that this was an aircraft not following its flight plan that was headed to New York City and if you put that together with the sense that some people got from the aircraft that there was something going on on board these aircraft 
uh, simply horrified uh, everybody in the law enforcement establishment, not to mention the two airlines, American and United, are involved. And Charlie Gibson and I have just momentarily been talking about this. Have we got this video available? Can we just move this video up and we'll listen first to the, to the man who tracked this one aircraft. Remember there were two tracked this one aircraft as it was headed towards New York City. The plane took off about 8 o'clock out of Logan in uh, Boston on its way to Los Angeles, climbed to 29,000 feet and cruising at about 450 knots. About that time, uh, 8.28, uh, the flight took an immediate hard left turn due south. Uh, the speed initially decreased uh, by over 100 miles an hour and then uh, increased to over 500. And then as it approached the New York area, it uh, slowed to uh, uh, all the way down to about 300 knots. So it's, and then tragically it impacted in the World Trade Center. American 11 was indeed the first flight. We have confirmed that of the two. But as ABC's Charlie Gibson points out in this conversation with me just a moment, Charlie, there were two rogue aircraft who were out of flight pattern. Well, Peter, the two airplanes that hit the two twin towers of the World Trade Center were both out of Boston. Uh, that was a description of what happened to Flight 11, which was the first one to come into the towers. And just looking at the timing, it's interesting. Uh, the plane took off at exactly 8 o'clock uh, from Logan Airport in Boston, and it was at 8.28 that it took that hard left-hand turn and then crashed into the World Trade Center uh, at about 8.45. So that means for 17 minutes, some air traffic controller had to know that they had a rogue aircraft on their hands heading uh, for New York City. The other flight, the one that went into the second World Trade Center, and that was United Flight 175, a 767 that had taken off for Boston for Los Angeles, took off at 8.15. Then just after it passed the Massachusetts-Connecticut border heading west, uh, just south of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, the flight took a 30-degree turn to the south, uh, left toward New Jersey, then another 90-degree turn it was heading toward uh, Atlantic City, and then it took another hard turn northeast, basically doing a, a, a U-turn over New Jersey and slammed into the, uh, to the building at 9.03. So again, for a considerable period of time, the air traffic controllers had to know that they had not one but two rogue aircrafts heading for New York. Thanks, Charlie, very much. Now we want to go to Washington. I think it's Washington because the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, he is about to make a public appearance in the White House Thank press room with man, of course, responsible for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Today, America has experienced one of the greatest tragedies ever witnessed on our soil. These heinous acts of violence are an assault on the security of our nation. They are an assault on the security and the freedom of every American citizen. We will not tolerate such acts. We will expend every effort and devote all the necessary resources to bring the people responsible for these acts, these crimes, to justice. Now is the time for us to come together as a nation to offer our support, our prayers for victims and for their families, for the rescue workers, for law enforcement officials, for every one of us that has been changed forever by this horrible tragedy. The following is a summary of the known facts surrounding today's incidents. American Airlines Flight 11 departed Boston for Los Angeles, hijacked by suspects armed with knives. This plane crashed into the World Trade Center. United Airlines Flight 175 departed Boston for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the World Trade Center. American Airlines Flight 77 departed Washington Dulles for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the Pentagon. United Airlines Flight 93 departed Newark for San Francisco, was hijacked and crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Crime scenes have been established by the federal authorities in New York, in Washington, D.C. area, in Pittsburgh, in Boston, and in Newark. The full resources of the Department of Justice, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, 
the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the U.S. Marshals Service, the Bureau of Prisons, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Office of Justice Programs are being deployed to investigate these crimes and to assist survivors and victim families. Uh, thousands of FBI agents in all of the field offices across the country and in the international legat offices assisted by personnel from other Department of Justice agencies are cooperating in this investigation. The FBI has established a website where people can report any information about these crimes. That address is www.ifccfbi.gov. That address again, www.ifccfbi.gov. Individuals can report any information they know about these crimes to that website. It takes courage for individuals to come forward in situations like this, and I urge anyone with information that may be useful and helpful to authorities to use this opportunity. The Office of Victims of Crime has established a toll-free 800 number for family and friends of victims. They can call 800-331-0075 to leave contact information for a future time when more information is available to find out information about a victim or to find out information about the rights of victims and the services available to victim survivors and victim families. The determination of these terrorists will not deter the determination of the American people. We are survivors and freedom is a survivor. A free American people will not be intimidated nor will we be defeated. We will find the people responsible for these cowardly acts, and justice will be done. Tommy. On Ashcroft. And this is Tommy Thompson, Every single American Health and Human Services. Lost something today. And every one of us at this time expresses our deepest sympathy to the victims of today's tragedies and their families. It is now our mission to begin the healing from this tragedy. From the moment that we learned of these attacks, the Department of Health and Human Services has begun readying teams and resources to be sent to New York City and the Washington area to meet any needs of state and local officials. So far, we have sent four disaster medical teams to New York City and three of these disaster medical teams to the Washington, Northern Virginia, Baltimore area. These medical teams each consist of about 35 physicians, nurses, and emergency medical technicians. They are all trained to deal with traumatic injuries and other emergency needs. We've also sent four disaster mortuary operational response teams to New York and three to the greater Washington area. We're also in the process of shipping a great deal of emergency medical supplies to New York City with the help of the Centers for Disease Control. In short, we're making the full force of the Department of Health and Human Services, both its resources and medical expertise available to the areas that need our assistance. We've also this afternoon activated the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which consists of approximately 6,000 health professionals. We also are giving backup assistance to the 500-bed ship Comfort from the United States Navy. Americans all over are calling up and asking what they can do. The best thing they can do is respond to this great call by volunteering to give blood. We need Americans to continue to answer that call. No matter where you live, please do your civic duty and assist us 
by donating blood. It is our primary job is to make sure Americans harmed by this tragedy get the help that they need. We will remain in constant contact with the governors, the mayors, public health officials, and other local officials to make sure that all their needs are being met. It is a sad day, but America and all of its citizens certainly share tonight in the grief that it's been caused. And as the President and everybody in his administration have said, we, the government, will continue to operate and continue to provide the services to all Americans. Well, it is important for the country. This is, uh, let's let just come away from the White House for One just a moment. One of the most uh, um, For a second now, and, and just inadvertently, we get from, it's so important at this point to hear from the representatives of government. Here are the leaders of the Senate and the House of Representatives together. The Speaker of the House in the middle, Dennis Hastert. Uh, Tom Daschle, the Senate leader, uh, to his left. At a time like this, no words that we should utter tonight, today or this evening can help the hearts and souls and feelings of the victims and the families that were a part of this great tragedy that happened in this country today. Our prayers and thoughts and, and words of, of, of consolation goes out to all those who have suffered. But one thing that happens here in this place <coughs> is when Americans suffers and when people perpetrate acts against this country, we as a Congress and as a government stand united <coughs> and we stand together. Senators and House members, Democrats and Republicans will stand shoulder to shoulder to fight this evil that's per been perpetrated on this nation. We will stand together to make sure that those who have brought forth this evil deed will pay the price. We're not sure who this is yet. But we have our suspicions. And when that is justified and when those suspicions are justified, we will act. We will stand with the president, we will stand with this government, and we will stand as Americans together <coughs> through this time. Thank you. The applause from the politicians for one another almost willing themselves to stand shoulder to shoulder in a non bipartisan in a nonpartisan way. This Tom Daschle, Today's the Democratic leader of the Senate. Acts or an assault on our people and on our freedom. As the representatives of the people, we are here to declare that our resolve has not been weakened by these horrific and cowardly acts. Congress will convene tomorrow And we will speak with one voice to condemn these attacks, to comfort the victims and their families, to commit our full support to the effort to bring those responsible to justice. We, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, stand strongly united behind the president and will work together to ensure that the full resources of the government are brought to bear in these efforts. Our heartfelt thoughts and our fervent prayers are with the injured and the families of those who have been lost. We know as a nation 
as we said, our thoughts and prayers are with those families and those injured and those who are the casualties of today's attack. We also remember those thousands of people who are rescue workers. We ask now that we all bow our heads in a moment of silence and remembrance. Thank you. So, brief remarks from the political leadership, both Republican and Democrat, on the Hill today, and many members of Congress, both the House and the Senate, including Senator Lott just leaving the camera, the pink hugging Barbara Mikulski, Democratic. I do not know whether that was a spontaneous gesture, but whether it was or was not. To see members of the House and the Senate, men and women, hugging each other in the face of this attack on the country, standing together on the steps of the Capitol on the evening of the 11th day of the month, ninth month of the year, singing God Bless America, surely reflects some heartfelt attempt by the members of the Congress to say to the world <clears throat> that this is a unified nation in the face of tragedy, as it has, for the most part, always been thus. A couple of very important numbers and website things have just been talked about by, Senator, uh, by former Senator John Ashcroft, now the, uh, the head of the Justice Department, the Attorney General of the United States. And I want to just read them out a little, one more time, slowly, uh, because they're important. Um, the first, as the Justice Department in general and all of the intelligence agencies led by the FBI in this case begin to troll for information as to who may have perpetrated these acts of terror and horror, the Attorney General offers a website. If you have a pencil or a pen, it's www.ifccfbi.gov. As I expected, someone to make a graphic. Thank you very much. And 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 this is a telephone number coming now, which I think many people in the country will have been desperate to, to hear. It's the first time we've heard it today. This is a Victims of Crime hotline, uh, which the government has established, and it is 1-800-331-0075. 1-800-331-0075. And this is particularly for people who who may have had family, primarily for family, family, relatives, um, who they fear for in either the attacks on the Trade Tower or at this point, as we know, in the Pentagon, because we haven't had a number from the Pentagon yet, and certainly on the aircraft on which 266 lives, we estimate, were lost today, to call in, leave a contact number, and then somebody will get back to you. And that'll be one of those hellish waits uh, that people have to go through when they know or suspect that they're relatives. And we've been getting messages here from people all over the world at the moment who believe they had a relative or a contact, particularly a relative, um, involved in the violence of today. Getting dark in New York City, of course, it's about 7.30 Eastern time. The days are getting shorter uh, everywhere in the country. 
We want to try to give you a little bit of a sense of the country now in two reports uh, that we have uh, prepared for World News tonight and clearly didn't get on because so much was happening at the moment. The first is from Erin Hayes, who's our correspondent based in Atlanta, and this is what she finds today, if one could call it the mood of the South that she has discovered. Read all about it. There is rippling across this country. Suicide bombers, suicide bombers. Great fear tonight. This attack was on every American. I can't believe it. And it's so sad that it's come to this. The first thing I thought of this morning when I saw that was Hiroshima, Pearl Harbor, all over again. The horror of it. And thinking that we're headed for World War III. I want to go home to my family right now. That's what I want to do, get close to my kids. We were seeing things we have never seen before, not just on our TV sets, but signs all around that this is as serious as it gets. At the airports is where it was most obvious, the national confusion. I'm really scared. I feel helpless. Paralysis. All the lines and the cell phones are all busy. Planes making their way to the first airport in sight. Unloaded passengers stunned to find themselves in places they had no plans to be, unsure what to do. I'm just totally shook up right now because we were in the air when it happened. We're not told anything about it. They said good luck sleeping in the airport. And in city after city, anxious officials evacuated one building after another. Our boss just finally came and told us, just go ahead and leave. Not because of actual threats, but because no one knew what might be next. There is a war here now. We are a nation now on high alert, not just militarily, but psychologically. Shaken on every level. Just waiting. For what? To see if anything else is going to happen. To see if, if we're going to be attacked here in Atlanta. It's a very strange feeling to be so threatened. The uncertainty set in motion a wave of shutting down across the nation. Not just the obvious government buildings, but malls in Georgia and theme parks in Florida. Due to unforeseen circumstances, the Magic Kingdom is now closing. And schools everywhere. Our military at home and around the world. And in those classrooms still in session, you could hear the anxiety of the youngest generations, for whom this kind of attack had been limited to their history lessons until today. They hit the Pentagon. It's a slap in the face. It's the nerve center of our military, and they hit the Pentagon. What is that? I always thought America was like my superhero, like nothing could harm America. I mean, America is everyone's defender. This is an attack on our generation. It is. It is, it is an attack on our culture, our, our system, our values, what we do. There is a growing sense tonight that what we do now will truly define us as a nation. I'd hate to see panic because then whoever did this will win and we can't let them win. We are Americans and I'm glad I am an American. We need, you know, we just need to come together and I think we will. It will take that and much more in the coming days to see the nation, the entire nation, through this. Head that way. Aaron Hayes, ABC News, Atlanta. One never thinks of a citizen as being an ordinary citizen, but, but uh, from, from those citizens, three expressions at least, which, um, which are worth holding. The young man who said, it's a slap at the face of the Pentagon, he couldn't imagine it. The woman, the young person who said, it's an attack on our culture and our country and our military. It's not really hard to say it's an attack on the American culture because there's so many cultures here at the moment, but I think you know what he means. And young people who just couldn't believe that they were seeing what they were going to witness today, but as everybody in the country has experienced today, this is a, a, a new reality for the United States. We saw it first in Oklahoma City. We've seen it in any number of threats and the growing security that has been involved with our public life in, in the last several years, but, but nothing like this. So now go to California, where a similar report for us today from ABC's David Wright. In Minnesota, the Mall of America never opened today. In Chicago, Navy Pier and the Lincoln Park Zoo were closed. In Orlando, even the Magic Kingdom was shut down. Just about any place in America where large numbers of people were likely to gather, locked the doors, and sent people home. Nothing's going to get done today. It's going to be a miserable day. With all of the nation's airliners grounded, thousands of travelers were stranded. I'd probably feel safer in Europe if I could actually get over there right now. 
it, it's, it's horrible. And as Americans, we're totally unprepared for that. We just don't think that terrorism is going to hit in our backyard. In Los Angeles, grief counselors were brought in to meet with family members of the three Los Angeles-bound planes that were hijacked and used by the terrorists. In San Francisco, one of the few planes left in the skies, a flight from Thailand, was escorted in by fighter jets. I'm really scared. I feel helpless. The workday routine was disrupted the country over, and rush hour extended through most of the day as people struggled to get home or just someplace they perceived to be safer. In Denver, people did what they could for the victims thousands of miles away. The blood banks were full of people eager to give. Here in L.A., the entertainment industry has shut down production. Madonna canceled one of the final concerts of her national tour. The Latin Grammy Awards scheduled for tonight and the Emmys scheduled for Sunday are postponed indefinitely. And across the country, Major League Baseball has canceled its entire schedule. The disruption is likely to continue for at least a few days. Financial markets will remain closed through tomorrow, and the post office says the U.S. mail will be slowed, but will keep coming. From California on another part of the country, from Minnesota out to the west, there are no time zones in the country today. One, one thing that David Wright mentioned there about baseball canceling game, this is the first time since the, since the D-Day invasion that, organized, that Major League Baseball um, has canceled all of its game. The first time since D-Day in the Second World War that Major League Baseball has canceled all of its game. I was very struck earlier today by uh, what David McCullough, the noted and popular and wise historian, said when he said it's warfare 21st century style and reminding all of us in the country who listen and read him that we haven't seen such destruction as this on our home ground, as he put it, since the Civil War. And one girl in that report saying, of course, Americans, in many cases, are just simply not prepared for this. Uh, ABC's Dean Reynolds is in Chicago uh, today. And Dean, I don't quite understand what it is you have, and we'll come back to the mood of Chicago in just a moment, but there was another incident involving a plane today. That's right, Peter. They didn't know it at the time, but the pilot and all of the passengers aboard TWA flight number three bound from New York's John F. Kennedy Airport to St. Louis came perilously close to one of those planes that crashed into the World Trade Center. So close that New York Air Control told a TWA jet to take evasive action to avoid a collision. You dodged one of the aircraft that hit the tower? Well, he was, he was up there whenever we were coming from New York, so what we had to do was they were not talking to him, and he was changing his heading and his altitude, so they just cleared us to deviate however we had to to stay away from him. It was right after they had taken off, and the passengers were horrified. I thought we were going to crash. I thought the plane was going to crash, because when we took off, the plane kind of went down and came back up, kind of, into, kind of it, was, it was kind of shaking, and it wasn't your normal taking off routine, and then you could just see like a plane that just kind of just bypassed us really close, and I, and I said maybe it was just a mere miss. We had him in sight, so it was a nice day in New York. We were out of the clouds, which helped a lot, so we just, uh, you know, uh, dodged him. As the TWA jet ascended, others aboard said they could see a terrible sight below. Now when we got really high up, um, you know, our brother's a fireman, and mm -hmm. so I said, doesn't it look like the Trade Center's on fire? And he says, yeah, it, it does. It looks like a big fire. Now, the passengers told us, Peter, that uh, after consulting with the pilot, the flight attendants pushed the food trays up against the cockpit door, apparently, to guard against a possible hijacking. In, the, uh, in any event, the uh, plane continued on uneventfully until it was ordered to land at Dayton, Ohio, and it landed safely. Stay with me for just one second, Dean, because if, if you weren't with this all day, there was a time this morning when the Federal Aviation Administration, first of all, didn't allow anybody to take off and then ordered all planes in the air uh, over the United States to land immediately at the nearest airport, which was how a plane uh, which begins in New York and is going west ends up in Dayton, Ohio. Dean, now can we just talk a little bit about Illinois and the central part of the country? One of the very first things that happened today was the Sears Tower in Chicago was closed. What else happened there, and what other sense of the, that part of the country do you now have? Well, I got to O'Hare Airport uh, shortly after the uh, attack on the World Trade Center, and of course it was basically a ghost town, except for everybody standing outside the airport waiting to get cabs 
elsewhere because nothing was uh, going uh, out of the uh, airport. When I got into town, again, there were very few pedestrians. It was almost all police uh, walking along the sidewalks, checking all of the state, federal, county uh, buildings to see if there were any bombs. They were, the police were checking to see if there were any missing buses or trucks. It was very tense here. Now, as the day has progressed, it looks as though life is returning to normal here, at least in Chicago, in the Loop area. Thanks very much, uh, Dean Reynolds in Chicago. We'll come back to you just to give you again some sense of the magnitude of this. Uh, the Reuters News Agency reporting out of Toronto tonight makes the point that the tarmacs of airports all across Canada from Vancouver in the west to Goose Bay and Labrador, a jumping off spot if you're going to Europe, are, are crowded with aircraft uh, which are either moving back and forth across the United States or across Canada uh, or going to or from Europe we're just all told to land and so in all of those airports tonight there is a huge number of aircraft and the FAA is simply going to keep them on the ground at least presumably dead tonight. Uh, we have been told that victims have been transferred to some uh, 70 area hospitals. Uh, there are pleas for donations of blood from New York City. Uh, residents, uh, I in fact tried to uh, donate blood today and there was as much as a five hour line of volunteers uh, all trying to uh, heed this plea. Right now I'm going to check in with Greg Clarkin who joins us from St. Vincent's Hospital where more than several hundred of the injured uh, were taken. Greg, what can you tell us tonight? Yeah, we're about a block away from St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan. This is one of the locations that has been set up since uh, for a triage unit, as a triage unit since early this morning. Really an incredible scene at the hospital. What you see is dozens and dozens of hospital workers outfitted in their scrubs, just basically awaiting, uh, awaiting victims to treat. Uh, at this point, what we're hearing is that uh, the pace has slowed down considerably. We've just been briefed by the president of St. Vincent's, that is David Campbell. He says at the moment there are 319 patients at St. Vincent's. Of that, 50 to 55 are listed in critical condition. He also confirmed that there were three deaths at St. Vincent's. Also, New York Governor George Pataki stopped by. He spoke to the doctors as well as the victims. One of the doctors overseeing the operations in the emergency room today uh, described some of the injuries that they saw early, early on. He said at the very early stages of this tragedy, what they saw were severe burns, a lot of trauma, and a lot of heart-related problems. Now, he said the heart attacks and cardiac arrest could be from pre-existing heart conditions or possibly induced by the trauma that the... Uh, that people saw at the uh, World Trade Center today. Now tomorrow they expect to get a different type of injury. Right now the Trade Center is considered a hot zone. There are no rescue efforts underway, the doctor said, but tomorrow they expect that hot zone to be lifted, rescue workers to go back in. What they will be expecting then is uh, what they call crush injuries, and that could be broken bones, anything, uh, anything that happens by uh, people being buried underneath rubble, kidney failure, uh, failure, dehydration and the like. They're expecting to see a whole different variety of injuries tomorrow. So again, from St. Vincent's, which has been a triage unit throughout the day, the scene has slowed down a little bit, but they do expect it to pick back up when the rescue efforts resume. Paula, back to you. All right, thanks so much, Greg. And uh, during your report, I just got more information that the New York Police Department now confirms that there are 78 police officers on its force that are missing tonight. Right now, I'm going to turn to Richard Holbrook, uh, former UN ambassador, uh, to, to provide some sort of perspective for us this evening. Mr. Holbrook, we have heard General Shelton described today's uh, uh, vicious acts as outrageous acts of barbaric terrorism. Senator Orrin Hatch called it an act of war. Senator John Warner calling it the most tragic hour of American history. What is your perspective on this this evening? Well, well first of all, Paula, as a New Yorker <clears throat> and somebody who had the honor of being guarded by the New York City Police and worked with the firemen, I am uh, stricken beyond words at the information you've just mentioned about the death toll among the police and the firemen. I'm, I used to work in that building and uh, was there in next door during the previous attack and uh, as, as in the 1993 case, New York City citizens have responded in this extraordinary way. Your description of the attempt to give blood is is so emblematic, those lines, and I'm just heartbroken about this. In terms of the, your question, and having listened to your interview with Madeleine Albright, I just want to add something to what she said. 
and that is this. In the past, Osama bin Laden and other terrorists who do not represent national governments, a distinction which is critically important, but are sheltered in various countries in the world, including Afghanistan, sometimes North Korea, Iraq, Libya, have played this shell game about where the government that shelters them and protects them says, well, we don't know where they are. I think it is absolutely essential for the United States to lead an international effort now that makes clear that any country which shelters people is part of an act of war against the United States. The United States, Paula, cannot make the response alone. It is true, as Madeleine said, that we have the finest military force in the world. And I've been privileged to work with them for over 30 years in Vietnam, in Bosnia, and all over the world. But I will tell you that unless we have international united front of the European allies, the Russians, the Chinese, and, and I want to stress this, the moderate Arab states, which must close ranks to get the extremists who are behind this, we're not going to be able to succeed. This is the beginning after we get through the rescue phase, after we find out how the security failure occurred that you referred to, that Wolf Blitzer referred to earlier, we're going to have to turn to an absolutely nonstop diplomatic effort to create the, bur the pressure behind, behind which we can take the necessary military action against this act of war. All right, I hear what you're saying, Ambassador, but it was Henry Kissinger who said earlier on today that we will be able to, or the United States at least, will be able to judge uh, its friends by their level of support in trying to figure out who unleashed this fury today. What, though, realistically do you think will happen in, in terms of resistance from some of these countries? I I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. I heard the interview with Henry Kissinger and he and I are in full agreement on this. Any government which shelters the people who did this has to be held equally responsible for it as an act of war. And if any, and we are going to have to mobilize an international coalition for that position as we prepare to take the necessary military responses. And I know that Henry agreed with that because I listened to the interview. Oh, no, I don't think I, I, I'm saying that anybody has misinterpreted the interview here, but I think there has been some suggestion by other guests that uh, you may not get complete support here. No, I'm not. I don't know whether we'll get complete support or not. The Taliban is denying any influence in this thing, but all the evidence seems to suggest that. John King and others on your excellent coverage have suggested that uh, the administration is 90 percent sure it's Osama bin Laden. Uh, if some countries don't participate, let them understand that they're joining a coalition of terrorists who have declared war on the United States. The key nations involved are going to be the moderate Arab states, the Russians, and uh, the Chinese and other countries which must isolate the cause of this. Osama bin Laden is not a government, but if he is indeed, as the administration appears to believe, behind this, anyone trafficking with him should be on notice that that is tantamount to an act of war by a government. And I talked uh, this afternoon to the Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, okay. who is trying to deal with the consequences of this for the UN. He's going to have to decide whether to postpone or cancel some major UN meetings that are coming up in New York, a children's summit in 10 days. And he has been talking to Arab leaders, and he's, I think he will be very supportive of this. The UN will meet in General Assembly tomorrow to start the condemnation process, and we're going to have to conduct diplomacy alongside rescue and finally decide what the correct military response is. Mr. Holbrook, we're going to have to leave it there this evening. Thank you very much for Thank your insights and uh, some of your poignant thoughts on Thank what you, uh, it was like to have once worked in uh, one of those buildings that no longer exist. Joining me right now is Jeff Greenfield, who has run out. Six people died at the World Trade Center in 93. We saved thousands more because the buildings didn't collapse. We averted terrorist acts in the past, not today. 
And every, I think we will not get on an airplane the same way again. We will not feel the same way about our security again. I looked at some numbers, Paula. The largest number of American dead ever in one day in this country was Antietam, a Civil War battle in Maryland in 1862, 22,000 dead. I hope to God we don't approach that number when all is said and done, but we're going to be possibly in that ballpark. And I think tomorrow, in some ways, may even be a worse day than today because the sheer magnitude of this event has kind of got everybody just exci ex you know, excited and wondering. Tomorrow, the reality sets in. And I think you also talked earlier today how that reality turns from a sense of shock and, in some cases, a sense of outrage. We've already about heard what how has ab absolutely been handed this country. And and one of the biggest issues we're going to be facing is, is drawing the line between a response that equals the horror of what was done and, and restraint. All right, got to cut you off here and go back quickly to Wolf Blitzer. I think Dick Army is uh, joining you. All right, Paula, the, uh, just to remind our viewers that in a little bit more than a half an hour from now, President Bush will be in the Oval Office to address the American public. He's preparing his remarks right now, but our congressional correspondent, Jonathan Carl, is up on Capitol Hill, and he has uh, the House Majority Leader Dick Armey with him. Uh, John? Well, Wolf, an amazing day up here, and we just had about 200 members of Congress, Democrats, Republicans, Senators, and members of the House on the steps of the Capitol with a message. Now, we have here uh, the Majority Leader Dick Armey, Republican Leader in the House of Representatives. Mr. Armey, you were one of those in the top leadership of the Congress that were whisked away, whisked away from the Capitol this morning uh, to a secure location, a classified location. What was it like in that room all day today? Well, we had the bipartisan leadership of both the House and the Senate. We were, of course, obviously, like everybody in America, seeking information, trying to understand exactly what's happening, where is it coming from, who's responsible, and how do we respond. Measuring the threat uh, to the nation uh, and uh, preparing ourselves to bring the members of Congress back to work at the appropriate time under the right circumstances and make the point that I made earlier, you may scar democracy, but you don't shut it down. We'll be back to work tomorrow. We, we think of this as a horrible criminal act. It is just inhumane. It's a, it's a mad, it's insane. And the, Ameri uh, the American uh, House and Senate, the Congress of this nation, as the president of this nation, will address that tonight. We will address the nation's business this week, and we will continue the process of finding the people who are responsible and bringing them to justice. Now, I understand that at least four times during the day, the vice president briefed those lead the members of the leadership that were in that room at that classified location. What did you learn about that fourth plane, the plane that landed in western Pennsylvania? Well, we learned some things about that. At this point, the information is classified. It is clear that we do have a good investigation going forward. We are gathering information. Uh, the uh, There is a... Uh, Com confidentiality on, on what we know, but we do know that this is a serious uh, premeditated crime and that I can say uh, without any doubt or hesitation is an international crime and we will be able to find the people responsible in America. I, I believe with the cooperation of all civilized nations will bring these people to justice. Now over the Capitol Police radios this morning there was a report that there was a plane headed for the Capitol building. What can you tell us about that? Was the Capitol in danger at any time uh, during the day? I don't know. We've, we've tried to distill exactly what that report mi might have been. It could have been somebody's interpretation of the heading of either the plane that went to the Pentagon or the plane that uh, went down in uh, Pennsylvania. But there was a concern about the Capitol that caused the Capitol Police, I think, correctly and prudently to vacate the building. All right. Well, Mr. Leader, I thank you very much for joining us. And, Wolf, tomorrow both the House and the Senate will reconvene. Uh, they're very much uh, this message that wants to be sent here is that terrorism will not stop the people's business, the work of the Congress from going forward. All right, uh, Jonathan Carl on Capitol Hill, thank you very much, and thank uh, Mr. Army as well. I want to bring in Senator Bob Graham of Florida. He's the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Of course, he's been receiving regular briefings throughout the day. We're hearing a lot of suspicions, uh, Senator Graham, about who may have been responsible. Can you share what you know uh, about that uh, responsibility f with our viewers? I would agree with Madeleine Albright. It's uh, premature at this point to be identifying who the prime suspect might be. Uh, the 
number of potential suspects based on the complexity of this operation is relatively small and I think we will soon be able to identify who the culprit is but tonight is not tonight. Has anybody definitively made any conclusions in the briefings with you and your, your colleagues about responsibility? Because as you know, a lot of finger pointing at Osama bin Laden has been going on throughout the day. No, at this point there has not been a single primary suspect identified. Given the nature of this operation, the highly coordinated hijacking of these four uh, airliners, uh, is there some suspicion as well in the U.S. intelligence community that perhaps some government may also have been involved? Uh, again, uh, it's premature to uh, try to determine who did it and who their collaborators uh, might have been. One thing we do know is that uh, we are going to, as a result of this and other incidents, uh, reassess our ability to identify and prevent this kind of event in the future. Uh, right now, we're in the stage of responding to a horrendous event uh, rather than where we should be, which is congratulating on ourselves and the fact that we identified and were able to interdict uh, the culprits before they were able to act. One of your uh, colleagues on the Intelligence Committee, Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah, told us earlier today that uh, as far as he had been informed, there was no advance warning whatsoever that these attacks were about to take place. Uh, is that what you're hearing as well? Uh, yes. Uh, there had been a general uh, heightening of concern about the potential of terrorism uh, over this summer. Uh, but no operational information that would have allowed us to have taken interdictive action against uh, this specific event. Does that suggest to you, Senator Graham, that there was an enormous intelligence failure here, that the massive uh, resources of the U.S. intelligence community had no indication whatsoever about this highly sophisticated attack? Well, what we do know is that there are several areas in which uh, we have allowed our intelligence capability to degrade. We've allowed our human intelligence, spy, the people who can get inside the cells of a terrorist organization and give us information on motivations, intentions, capabilities that would allow us to interdict. We know that we have lost some of our uh, eavesdropping capability, listening to what uh, our potential adversaries are saying. Uh, we also know that we've not been making the investment in the analysis of the information that we collect so that we can use it effectively uh, to avoid an incident like this. I believe uh, this uh, occasion uh, will uh, drive home the point that the only real protection against terrorism is the best possible intelligence and that is the only intelligence that the citizens of the United States should be prepared to accept. Senator, it seems to be gone. I've had meetings with my colleagues and hug, hugs and you know yes. everyone assures us that A, we're going to do all we can for New York, and B, we're going to unite behind the president in terms of the actions that have to be taken. And I say that as a Democrat who has not always agreed with President Bush, but like after Pearl Harbor, the whole country has to unite. Okay, Senator Chuck Schumer, thank you very much for joining thank us live you. from Washington you. tonight with your assessment of uh, what's been going on here all day, and of course, uh, what's ahead for the next couple of days. Thank you, Senator Schumer. Thank you. And we're gonna join the junior senator from New York, Hillary Rodham Clinton. We understand she's speaking live. Okay, we don't have that yet. When we do, we'll bring it to you. In the meantime, now, we're gonna take you out to St. Vincent's Hospital. Shock. Completely shock. Unbelievable. Some Israeli terrorism experts say Palestinian groups don't have the ability to carry out attacks of such magnitude and complexity. Then, of course, there's Iraq, which has its own scores to settle with the United States. But for radical Islamic fundamentalists like Osama bin Laden, who's declared a religious war against America and has carried out successful attacks in the past, the hatred of the United States runs deeper than politics. Most Islamic groups are first and foremost interested in domestic issues. Osama bin Laden's group, on the other hand, is interested in the uh, situation of Islam worldwide. Osama bin Laden views himself as the uh, fighter for Islam against 
Western uh, ways of life. While the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis and the unhealed wounds of the Gulf War may fuel Osama bin Laden and his followers, their hatred of America and anything not in line with their extreme religious views is far more fundamental. David Hawkins, CBS News, Tel Aviv. Beyond the Middle East, the scope and destruction of these terrorist attacks hit home like a dagger. Governments and peoples reacted with shock and sympathy, as we hear from CBS's Richard Roth. It began first thing this morning when a hijacked passenger jet smashed into one of the twin trade towers in New York. In an electronic instant, it swept around the world, a shockwave echoing the attack on America, the horror and disbelief. Nationwide panic as Americans try to understand the scale of today's events. From Buckingham Palace to Beijing, there was shock and sympathy from the Vatican to the Kremlin. Russian President Putin called for a coordinated effort against terrorism. So did British Prime Minister Tony Blair. We therefore here in Britain stand shoulder to shoulder with our American friends in this hour of tragedy. And we, like them, will not rest until this evil is driven from our world. More than not just resting in Britain, they were rattled. Offices closing early in London's financial center, commercial air traffic over the capital banned as airlines here and throughout Europe canceled transatlantic flights. I'm certain in the short term, we're going to face a much more restricted world, a world which is much more security conscious, much more anxious and much more fearful. With European TV broadcasting live and non-stop, European governments called emergency meetings. So did NATO. Another echo of the attack in America were the questions asked here. Who was behind it and what happens now? The Taliban regime's ambassador to Pakistan today was part of the chorus calling for justice. He also insisted Osama bin Laden wasn't behind it. Bin Laden's not in contact with anyone, the ambassador insisted, and couldn't carry out such activity. It would be a great risk, he warned, for America to retaliate before completing an investigation. While Britain's calling mass terrorism a new evil the world needs to fight, some Europeans are more blunt. Germany calls the attack a declaration of war against the civilized world. But what all the allies are saying tonight is that America's not in this fight alone. Richard Roth, CBS News, London. As we await President Bush's address to the nation and the world, which will be coming up in about 23 minutes now on the half hour mark, joining us here in New York again is Sandy Berger, who served as National Security Advisor to President Bill Clinton, and in our CBS News Washington Bureau, Democratic Senator Christopher Dodd of Connecticut. Thank you both for being with us. Uh, first, Senator Dodd, mm. uh, there's been an awful lot of talk today about the United States. We will find who's responsible for this, and we will punish them. Why is anybody who hates the United States, why would they believe this when in the past we have proven time and again we can't find out who do, does the people who do these things and we've been unable to punish them really? Well, first of all, Dan, let me uh, uh, step back for a second and, and, and tell you uh, my, my thoughts and I'm sure the thoughts of Sandy. I, I just left a, about 500 members of Congress on the east front of the Capitol with the leadership, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, joined together an expression of solidarity and sympathy uh, for the literally hundreds of people, and I expect thousands who may have lost their lives today. We don't know the numbers yet, as you've reported accurately here, but it's hard to begin any discussion of this without talking about these families and what, this, uh, what our country has gone through. And today, you used the language at the outset of your news tonight using Franklin Delano Roosevelt's language almost 60 years ago, 12 weeks from now, calling this a day of infamy, and it truly is. So I wanted to begin there, and Tom Daschle and... Uh, Trent Lott are going to have tomorrow a, uh, a session on resolutions and an opportunity for us to be heard. Congress will be in session tomorrow. Democracy will always triumph over terrorism. And I hope here that we'll first of all concentrate on the tragedy here at home, uh, do what's been suggested by some of your earlier guests, and find out exactly who is responsible here. And I'm confident we can do that. And go a step further here, and I'll be interested in what Sandy has to say about this, but I think a new chapter's been turned here. Too often we have sort of accepted other nations' notion that they would harbor these people, occasionally provide some financing, even training for them, and that they sort of had to do that for their own domestic uh, security. I think those days are over with. I think any nation that supports, harbors, trains uh, these individuals, whether it's Osama bin Laden or others who are responsible for it, 
there needs to be a collective response. You heard today President Putin. I think the Chinese made similar statements. This is a chance for the civilized world now, if nothing else comes out of this, to respond in the most aggressive and thorough way we can. This cancer is hitting all of us, and we need to respond to it accordingly. Now, back to the original question, Senator. Are we capable of yes. determining who, do, who did these things? And then are we capable of, in some way, finding them, bringing them to justice, punishing them? I believe so. I think, first of all, this was a highly coordinated, very sophisticated attack here today. And I'm quite confident that the collective intelligence efforts of our allies, friends who have expressed support for us today, uh, that we'll be able to determine that. We may not do it as quickly as some would like. And my hope would be that we'll do it smartly. It's very important that we know what we're talking about before we respond. But I'm very confident we can do it and I think we have the means of doing it. It may not be as fast as some would like, uh, but I believe it can be done. Sandy Berger, where are those voices in the world of Islam? Islam being one of the world's great religions. Where are those voices? Are there any in any place that counts who say, listen, we've had enough of this and we will, f we will help the United States find and bring to justice these people? Well, I think, it's very, I think we have to be careful, Dan, that we don't condemn the world of Islam here. Um, obviously, there are a billion uh, people who practice uh, Islam around the world. This is perpetrated by uh, a, a group, uh, and we need to deal uh, aggressively with, with the group. Uh, but I, I, I agree with Chris. We need uh, the cooperation and concerted effort of, of all of our allies and friends, uh, whether they are in Europe, whether they're in the Arab world, or elsewhere, because we are now in a new phase. Uh, of this war against terrorism. This is a watershed event, and we're not going to deal with this uh, in one fell swoop. This is going to require a sustained, serious operation. And I think it's time for the American people to support the president, buckle our seatbelts, because this is going to be a long, hard ride. True or untrue that in the past when there have been terrorist acts, nothing on this scale has happened, but there have been terrorist acts, many of our friends and, yes, allies, uh, in the Arab world and elsewhere have been afraid to help us respond beyond a certain point because of fear of instability in their own countries. Well, uh, I think that's true, but this is so qualitatively different than anything we have seen before uh, that we'll quickly decide, we'll quickly know uh, who stands uh, with uh, the terrorists, who stands with disorder, uh, and who stands uh, with uh, a world uh, in which this kind of act is not tolerated. Uh, and I think we're going to have to put uh, some of our friends to the test on this. Senator Chris Dodd, uh, what are the options for, for the president in increasing the pressure on, yes, our friends and allies to help more, great deal more and faster to deal with the people who, who perpetrate these kinds of crimes? Well, it's hard to find any silver linings in what has occurred in the last uh, 12 hours. Uh, but if there is any at all, it may be what we've heard already from leaders from around the globe uh, that we haven't heard from in the past when we faced uh, acts of terrorism not on this scale. And, uh, and I would hope the president would uh, pick up that phone. I'm confident he will. And by the way, all of us stand with him tonight. Uh, anyone who's questioning whether or not this country is divided at all on this issue ought to put those notions aside. Democrats, Republicans, regardless of people's political feelings, we stand behind this president. He's our leader. And if he asks us to do some things in the coming days, he's going to find a united Congress, in my view. Uh, but he should also, I would hope, reach out to the allies who have spoken today and even some of our major competitors in the globe uh, who face similar challenges. Uh, this is a cancer that affects all of us. And I'm very confident if he does. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism about the administration in the first eight months or so on the Kyoto agreements and on various other international efforts that we seem to be backing up. Uh, in a sense, I hope the president now realizes how important it is, I'm confident he will, that he reach out uh, to these leaders and form that kind of coalition that, as Sandy has said, and he's absolutely right about this, systematically deals with this in the coming years. It's not a one response to this. It's not one attack. It's not going to be solved by one particular raid. This has got to be a systematic, seamless garment that goes on for a long time. Sandy Berger, in the past, our history, the history of this country, shows that we're sometimes slow to recognize a danger. The build-up to World War II comes to mind. But when there is a Pearl Harbor, or when we're attacked, almost pushed off the Korean Peninsula, once we mobilize as a people, 
uh, that we are indeed a determined and effective adversary, but we're dealing with such a shadowy operation as these terrorist organizations. Is it capable to put the nation on a, on a one nation united, let's solve this problem, let's defeat this enemy, or impossible? I, I have no question that, we, that the president can do that, but I think the American people need to understand that this is not going to be solved with one missile attack. Um, we may have to reach deep into a faraway place um, in a very robust way uh, to deal with this problem. Uh, we may have to do this uh, over a sustained period of time. And those actions themselves will have their own consequences. So it's, it's, there's no silver bullet, literally or figuratively here, that is going to deal with the kind of uh, unspeakable evil that we've seen today, the escalation uh, in a massive way, both in terms of capability and malevolent intent that we've seen today. What we need now is buckle down, uh, so serious, uh, concerted uh, uh, effort uh, that's going to be, have to be long range. Uh, we've taken down uh, terrorist organizations like Abu Nidal in the 70s. Um, uh, this is qualitatively different. Um, and we're, uh, I think, uh, uh, capable of doing it. I think the American people will support the president, but it's going to take uh, actions we may not have contemplated in the past. Sandy Berger, Senator Chris Dodd, thank you very much. We're less than 15 minutes away now from the President of the United States addressing the American people and the world about the events of today. In the meantime, let's remind ourselves there were many scenes of heroism as well as horror in the Twin Towers attack here in New York City. CBS's Lee Cowan reports on the people in the streets amid rubble and chaos. I warn you in advance, caution you in advance uh, of the violence in some of these scenes. With that in mind, Lee. Well, Dan, uh, I think anyone down here this morning will tell you that there simply wasn't any time to do anything. It wasn't time to think, wasn't time to breathe. Certainly there wasn't time to mourn. The only thing you could do is run, and if you could, help. For those inside the World Trade Center, it wasn't just hell on earth. For Can Bob Fox, it was hell 39 stories up. It was unbelievable. I was on the 39th floor about quarter to nine when a tremendous explosion hit. Those lucky enough to get out walked out of one danger right into another. A moonscape of ash and debris, smoke and fire, leaking gas, and already the smell of death. Debris, smoke, all the dust, everything, just couldn't see nothing. I was praying to God then that, uh, <laughs> let me get by this now. Iron worker Tony Cabrera rushed toward the carnage to try and help. And I seen a second plane hit. I went into this lobby. And I went into the lobby. I was there with the fire department and everything, and just it was starting to give away this and that, pieces of people coming down, parts and whatever. Never seen anything like it. Never. Rescuers were at a loss. Smoke so thick they couldn't see the damage. The clamor of falling debris so loud. They couldn't hear the cries for help. All of it made worse when the first of the Twin Towers came tumbling down upon them. Go! Come on! Let's go! Let's go! After the first series of explosions, there was hardly time to get in, and those that did were right in line of fire for the next series of explosions. As the second tower collapsed, Val Coleman had a front row seat to disaster, watching it all unfold out of his apartment window just five blocks away. And a great blossom of flame, a huge red fireball, scared the hell out of me. Val Coleman was inside the World Trade Center just 15 minutes before the initial attack and remembers the last person he talked with. A very nice young man answered me very politely. I left, came back here, and boom, he's probably dead. And as he sat watching the building burn, Coleman could see tiny black specks near the top floors. They were people jumping off instead of being burned alive. There must, I must have seen 10 or 15 people come down, one after off another. Off the top? Off the what appeared to be the top. The bombings today brought one horrific scene after another. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! But rescuers know once they get closer to what's left of the Twin Towers, the images are sure to get worse. But the workers, for many of them, though, they are still waiting. We are told now, Dan, that uh, firefighters are trying to stretch ladders out across some of the degree, debris to begin putting out some of the fires that have been burning all day long. But active search and rescue efforts are still on hold at this hour. Uh, there is still hope here tonight. But for the moment, it's being tempered by an overwhelming sense of helplessness. Dan.
Lee Cowan, one of our many reporters covering in lower Manhattan, the terror attacks on the World Trade Center struck deep into the hearts of New Yorkers. Many were witness to or victims of this cowardly act of mass destruction. CBS's Mika Brzezinski has been out among them on the streets of New York. There was terror in the streets while the Twin Towers burned. With gridlock on the ground, crowds watched from afar and prayed. You don't see people jumping from the windows. Police jumped into action, moving the crowds behind police lines, away from danger. Let's go! But not far enough. One after another, the towers fell to pieces, debris falling onto hundreds of onlookers. Somewhere behind the billow of smoke, an American icon had disappeared, transforming the New York skyline forever. On the sidelines, people watched and wept. Others covered in soot and debris come on, can you stop for? Come on. counted their blessings. Even now, no one can guess the number of dead and wounded. Adding to the confusion, cell service was crippled, cutting the lifeline for families trying to locate loved ones. Only a few could get through. It's going to be OK. Nearby schools evacuated so quickly, parents had no idea where to go to find their children. Everywhere, there was terror and confusion. Everybody, please. Finally, people simply walked away from Lower Manhattan. An eerie calm prevailed as police evacuated the area. Cell phone service for much of New York City is still somewhat crippled, though the situation is getting better. Several forms of transportation have been affected. Several subway lines are suspended indefinitely, and train service out of the city is limited. It will be no business as usual for school kids in New York City tomorrow. All New York City public schools are closed at least for tomorrow. And the mayor of New York said earlier today, stay home and stay calm. At least try. Dan. Inka Brzezinski. The specter is being raised tonight of hundreds and perhaps thousands. That's a quote from one New York City official. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of people being, in effect, buried alive by the avalanche of destruction which developed in the wake of the two planes hitting the World Trade Centers today. Keep in mind that some rescue workers, firemen and policemen early on the scene were believed to have been killed. Uh, they've been unable to put out all the fires, much less get into the rubble and look uh, for possible survivors in the rubble. That's the reality of this dark night in New York City. Now an eyewitness report from one of our own. Minutes after the initial attacks on the World Trade Center towers, CBS News correspondent Carol Marine was on the scene, just in time for a frighteningly close encounter with catastrophe. As I'm making my way toward the Trade Center um, along the, the waterline, thousands of people were walking towards me, uh, streaming out, almost not talking, trying to, or trying to get through on cell phones that didn't work, some of them crying, all of them looking pretty agonized. All of a sudden, I heard a roar, and I saw one of the towers blow and then collapse and fill the horizon with smoke and I yelled, oh my God. And I saw from street level as though it had exploded up a giant rolling ball of flame and the firefighters screamed, run. And I turned to run, but I fell and I felt someone scoop me up, tell me to throw my high heels off. And I was running in my stocking feet with him. And finally, as we ran and ran, he slammed me into a wall and covered my body with his. I could feel his heart beating against my backbone. And I think both of us were sure we were dead because there was no way you could run fast enough and there was no way to avoid it. But somehow we escaped the flame, which was immediately followed by a storm of debris. Um, we were breathing, it felt like giant particles of plaster and there was smoke so that if you tried to put your hand out in front of you, you couldn't really see it. You, it was the thickest, most intense particle and smoke I've ever been in. And somewhere along the line, the firefighter handed me off to a New York police officer. The thing that struck me, though, was that I didn't see many wounded people in the street, which 
led me to believe, at least where I was by the Trade Center, they had never even gotten out of the building. I thought I was going to die. It is as close as I've ever come as a reporter to thinking I was going to die. Carol Marine of 60 Minutes 2, CBS News correspondent. The shock of this morning's attack on America wasn't just felt in the cities where the hijacked planes were crashed. It was also felt in the cities where those flights began. CBS's Wyatt Andrews is in Boston tonight. At Boston's Logan Airport, where two of the hijacked planes originated, scores of relatives of the victims were met by airline officials for consolation and were then taken to a nearby hotel to await information. American Airlines lost its Los Angeles-bound Flight 11, and the airline confirmed the identity of its lost pilot, Captain John Oganowski, who was 52 and a 22-year veteran of the airline. Outside his home in Dracut, Massachusetts, the captain's extended family gathered, including his wife and three daughters. Oganowski's brother Jim described him as a hero, a man who joined the Air Force out of patriotism during the Vietnam War and who viewed his work as an airline pilot his life's dream. As you can... Our family is obviously grieving, as is the whole nation, for what has happened today. I personally, I think I'm in shock. I'm in, in some type of denial. Official information about how the flights were seized and how Logan's security might have been breached is still under investigation and is closely held. Airport officials stress that security inside Logan's terminals, as elsewhere across America, is the responsibility of the separate airlines and that the airport itself was secure. We've closed the airport to all arriving and all departing flights. We've increased our security measures. We've shut down all the construction sites within Logan Airport, both air side and land side. At the Oganowski home, official information is also apparently scarce. The pilot's brother, Jim, told reporters that the family had no information about what Captain Oganowski went through or whether there were any communications between the pilot and FAA controllers. Wyatt Andrews, CBS News, Dracut, Massachusetts. Wyatt Andrews reporting from Boston. Dateline Philadelphia, Victor Saracini of a Philadelphia suburb of Makefield Township is believed now to have been the pilot of the second plane to crash into the World Trade Center buildings. Also Dateline Washington, uh, it's now being said by the top Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Orrin Hatch, that there were some intercepts of some information that he says, quote, included people associated with bin Laden who acknowledged a couple of targets were hit. Hatch said, uh, this just a short while ago in an interview with Associated Press, he declined to be more specific. As the president's speech approaches, let's go back to Washington and CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer. Bob? Well, let's go to John Rock quickly instead. Uh, quick uh, check off the line of scrimmage here. John Roberts, uh, now back at the White House, allowed on the White House grounds. We're just a few minutes from the president making uh, this, which by uh, acclamation would be the, by far the most important speech of his presidency. I, I would certainly say so, Dan, and this is also a, an enormous test for, for this new president. Uh, White House officials came out today and said that they would identify and bring to justice those responsible for these heinous acts, Dan, but with the scope and the enormity uh, of this tragedy, I would imagine that just bringing them to justice is certainly not going to be enough for a lot of people. There will be a lot of people who are demanding swift, decisive, and, and punitive action against those responsible. We're told that in the president's address tonight, he will not even approach the issue of retaliation. He will offer words of resolve and reassurance, and he will express his condolences for the families of the victims of, of today's massive tragedies. And as you have said on and on throughout this day, Dan, we, we can't even begin to imagine how many people have died. Uh, sources uh, close to protecting the president say this was, in fact, just like Pearl Harbor, uh, in that they had no indication that anything like this uh, was afoot. There were no targets, if you will, that had come up on their very sensitive radar screen. And, Dan, it would seem that the 2,400 and some odd people who died in Pearl Harbor may be eclipsed by today's tragedy. The president expected to speak from the Oval Office in just a few moments' time. John Roberts, live uh, from the White House. We'll be going back to the White House very shortly. There are no exact casualty figures. There are no figures even remotely exact from the World Trade Center 
uh, bombings or for that matter at the Pentagon. In the few seconds we have uh, remaining before the president speaks, let's go now to Bob Schieffer in Washington. Bob? Well, Dan, the president will address a Congress and I think uh, an audience of Americans. It will be a different group than he might have addressed last week. We had this incredible show of bipartisan support just a few minutes ago up on the Capitol steps where you saw hundreds of members of Congress come together and say, we support the president. We are going to support the president to do whatever is necessary to find whoever did this and to see that they are punished. It's the sort of thing you almost never see except in times of crisis. And we saw again today what you always see in times of crisis with the American people and their representatives in Congress. They come together as one. I think the president will get a very good reception for whatever he says tonight. Bob Schieffer um, in Washington. Now, President Bush is going to address the nation in about a minute. As we wait for that, search and rescue operations stretch into the night here in New York City, hours after terrorists slammed two hijacked commercial airliners into the World Trade Center on the lower part of Manhattan Island, the Twin Towers where 40 to 50,000 people work on your average day crumpled to the ground, the full extent of death and injuries unknown, uh, a fire department uh, union official said, a uh, un fireman's union official said early this evening that uh, there may be as many as 200 New York City firefighters may be among the dead. One reason for that is when the first building was hit, firefighters were rushed to the scene. And then, of course, very quickly the second building was hit. And then fairly quickly after that, both buildings collapsed. A third building in the Trade Center complex collapsed this evening. A third hijacked plane, of course, was slammed into the seat of America's military might. The Pentagon had estimated at least 100 dead and or injured uh, there, a fourth jetliner possibly being diverted to Washington or Camp David. The president's retreat went down in southwestern Pennsylvania. All told, at least 250 people were aboard the four crashed planes. The FAA grounded all civilian aircraft until at least noon tomorrow. The financial, the Wall Street markets will be closed tomorrow. Now, President Bush was flown secretly today from Florida, first to Louisiana, then to Nebraska, but he's back in the White House now, and we have about 25 seconds till you will see uh, President Bush address the nation from the White House. After the President speaks, our CBS News... The President isn't sitting there trying to think about what to say, I can assure you. The President is sitting there because someone on network television has sat him down and said, we'll cue in 30 seconds, Mr. Bush. And so, as awkward as it looks to him, this is what we've expected him to do. And now here he is. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature. And we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C to help with local rescue efforts. 
Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight, I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night, and God bless America. The President of the United States, when he is in many respects needed most, and We've been joined, excuse me, we've been joined by George Stephanopoulos, who's been downtown all day and who very quickly picked up, George, that the president may have given us a hint in his first couple of lines there to the magnitude of this. He said thousands of lives mm. that were suddenly ended, the first number we've had all day by an official verifying the magnitude of the casualties, thousands of lives suddenly ended. He also did a lot of other things in this very short speech, Peter. He gave voice to the anger that many Americans are feeling. He talked about the quiet, unyielding anger of America and then was very pointed in giving reassurance. Military is prepared. The emergency teams are on their way. Government will be back to business tomorrow. Our economy will be back to business tomorrow. And then finally, Peter, what I found most interesting in the section about where he talked about retaliation. He said America would make no distinction between the terrorists and those who harbor them, which is a, a message to any state which may be supporting these terrorists who are behind this act. Well, which opens, which creates a huge dilemma for the United States yes. of America because if it is discovered, as we've talked several times throughout the day, that a state, and I've forgotten who it was, a former director of the CIA perhaps earlier today, who said he couldn't believe that a state would actually support Jim Woolsey, uh, Jim Woolsey former director of the CIA, uh, uh, who said directly he couldn't believe that a state <clears throat> would actively support an act such as this, though it may have over periods of time as Iran and Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan have all been suspected to do give collateral or and that's indirect why support down through the years. The word that the president used was so expansive, Peter. It wasn't mm -hmm. just supported or funded. It was any who harbored them who may have given them sanctuary at any time. That is a very open-ended commitment. And then I thought, by the way, also, if I may add, that this president particularly, who. Uh, who feels so strongly about his, uh, his Christianity, uh, felt it a good time to say, uh, to quote those lines from Psalm 23, um, even though I walk, or yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I fear no evil because God um, is with me. And, and that will just sit so appropriately, I believe, on, in, in the minds and, and, the, and the sentiments of many Americans tonight. And we've felt throughout the day, we heard scattered reports of people going to churches um, and saying a prayer for those people uh, who may or may not be lost and for the families of those people around the country. Because don't forget relatives and, 
These locations have relatives all over the country. This is a total engagement uh, with, with the nation. And I, don't, I think you pretty much covered it all, except for one thing, George. The president talked also about the sense of safety and security of young people in America, particularly who were threatened today. And we heard that from people around the country today, people who simply could not believe, as it was the case at Oklahoma City, that this was happening in the United States. It's always something that happened somewhere else. Or in the movies. And this is far worse than any plot that anyone could have ever devised. And I think I was uh, downtown, as you mentioned today, Peter, so it seemed it was more surreal there, almost because people were so determined to get back to the normal life, even as the rest, all of downtown was being closed off. So I was a little bit cut off from what was happening around the country, but you did feel it down there. But I th and I think this is very characteristic of New York and probably would have been characteristic of any other major community in the country, any other community as well. Terry Moran, who covers Mr. Bush for us today, but ironically wasn't with him today as he went on this education trip, not on normal. I think you are now, Terry, back at your regular location on the north lawn of the White House. Does that mean the White House has loosened up just a little bit? Well, it has, Peter. The White House has leapt to life after several hours of the White House compound itself and the blocks around it in Washington essentially being deserted, a, a ghost town really coming in here. It is now a beehive of activity with government officials, uh, cabinet secretaries. The president, of course, has returned. The first lady has returned, and they are now working well into the night on this crisis. Uh, the president that you saw in these remarks, we are told, is the man who absorbed this tragedy today. He was described as steely throughout the day, as someone who did not react with great emotion or anger, who was able to see the pictures that America saw while he was in the air in Air Force One and reacted uh, very seriously, very soberly, pretty much as we saw him tonight. Now you say that the White House is up and running again, full in action, though the White House is clearly never completely out of action, no matter where it is. But what do you actually mean by that? What are they doing? Well, what we are seeing right now is the president and his top advisors huddled in the Oval Office and in the study off the Oval Office. We saw uh, cabinet secretaries and uh, FEMA director Joe Albaugh were here earlier, and Joe Albaugh is still here. He is briefing the president on the re emergency response teams that he's sent out. The president is receiving uh, information from his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice. You just see a great deal of activity. And you're right, this was not a completely deserted White House. Vice President Cheney was here, as was Dr. Rice, through the day. And in fact, we are told that the president, while he was in the air, had an open line of communication to the vice president uh, throughout the day. And, and, and Terry, you know as well as I do that much of the country had this feeling of helplessness today, as the president said, our sense of safety and security as a, as a national entity were attacked today. They must have been just as frustrated because they didn't really know any more in the White House than we did on the outside. They did not, and the president's response and the Secret Service's response to the de events as they developed was determined by misinformation sometime. At one point, there was a report of a car bomb going off at the State Department. Uh, at another point, uh, there was a report that this plane that crashed in Pennsylvania was on its way towards Camp David, and those things helped determine the Secret Service's decision to keep the president out of Washington to put in place this plan to take him to Air Force bases which are predetermined uh, and keep him away uh, from harm. So the staff works on at the White House to get some sense of what is it. Thanks, Terry. I'll come back to you in just a minute, man. We've been joined in Washington by Leon Panetta, a former White House chief of staff for Bill Clinton, um, now out of government, uh, back for the most part in California, if I remember correctly, Mr. Panetta. Um, That's correct. Well, what's the White House chief of staff? do at a moment like this? Where do you reach? What buttons do you try to push? Who do you try to connect with? Are you in some respects at the mercy of the military and intelligence establishment at the moment? Well, you should not be. What you should do is try to organize the White House team so that uh, the main focus is in the White House. You have your security people, your military people, your defense people. You have your uh, national security advisor your State Department people. I think it's better to run this kind of crisis directly from the White House so the President is in charge of not only what happened, but what to do. Take us back to Oklahoma City and to the attack on the barracks residence at al Khobar in, in Saudi Arabia. What am I, 96, 97, I apologize, I've forgotten. Um, I believe you're about 96. Were you just immensely frustrated that you just didn't know anything? Well, Oklahoma City, the first time uh, we heard of Oklahoma City, it was on television. And uh, we were sitting 
near the Oval Office watching television reports of what had happened. Uh, and it was only after there was first reported on television that we began to get some telephonic communication about what had taken place. Um, but you feel rather helpless because you know a tragedy has taken place, but you don't know all of the facts and why it happened. And, and you know, Oklahoma is a good example of not jumping to conclusions because in Oklahoma City, we had all kinds of thoughts that this was a Middle East mm. terrorist effort in Oklahoma, and it turned out not to be. So I hope this country has the patience to carefully investigate, determine who really did this, and then respond. We, 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 to, be, to, be, to be open about it, we've said this several times today and reminded people in Oklahoma City that our, that our tendency towards prejudice emerged pretty quickly and was proved to be wrong. Um, as you have tried, I assume, to talk to people around the world today, have you picked up anything which contributes to the understanding of this? Not really. I mean, I, you know, you, you, have, you have obviously your suspicions about who's involved. But we are a country that mm -hmm. believes first and more foremost in justice. That's what distinguishes us from the people who carried out these acts. So I hope we take the time to fully investigate this matter, determine who did it, and then take appropriate action. That's what a great democracy does. But there is, Mr. Panetta, tremendous pressure on the president to strike back at somebody. We've struck back at Osama bin Laden's training camps in Afghanistan, didn't get him, spent a fortune, and didn't accomplish uh, very much. Is the pressure on the president huge to do something in order to satisfy the, the anger and the frustration of the American people? The pressure is incredible, Peter. Uh, it's coming from politicians on Capitol Hill, it's coming from constituents, it's coming from, I'm sure, many in the public who want to strike back in some way. The president is a leader of this country. He's got to take the time to make sure we do what's right. And what's right in this instance is to take the time to fully investigate this matter, determine who are the culprits, and then take appropriate action. We, you know, that, that's been the course of action that the United States mm -hmm. has taken in the past, and it's the course of action we've got to take now. Thanks very much, Leon Panetta, for joining us, reminding us that the President's resolve will be tested, but also so... On the 82nd floor for 9 o'clock meeting, so I guess I was kind of covered by somebody up above. But 50,000 other people were trapped at work when the first jet slammed into America's twin symbols of capitalism and industrial might, towers that proudly stood 110 feet high on West Street in Lower Manhattan. There are flames, there is a massive fire here. It was about to get much worse. The second tower was hit about 18 minutes after the first. People on the street furiously running for cover. That's when we met Michael Benfante, a sales manager who had managed to scramble from the 81st floor of one of the towers to the emergency staircase before the second plane hit. We stop on 68, and I hear people screaming, and there's women huddled in the doorway, and then there's a woman in a wheelchair. Benfante and others struggled to carry that woman downstairs and made the exit before the second explosion. Some, some reporter's interviewing me. I'm standing next to John, and, and the top of the thing blew up, and it just exploded and started coming down. I was running for my life. So were thousands of others trying to scramble out of the downtown financial district, some standing stunned, talking into their cell phones, as shoes and briefcases and paperwork that was blown to smithereens rained down from the towers. One witness described a man and woman holding hands, jumping from one of the buildings near the 80th floor. The world-famous skyline of Lower Manhattan was enveloped by thick black smoke. Within 90 minutes, the towers were no more. The number of casualties will be more than any any of us can bear ultimately among the expected casualties the very first firefighters and police officers who had responded to the scene paramedics based further uptown hugged each other as they mobilized their triage units this is uh, a vicious attack upon new york it's an attack upon america 
The explosions shut down New York, with cars lined up on the West Side Highway, unable to go anywhere. Stretchers were lined up outside the hospitals. Thousands of people left on foot to cross bridges, hoping to get home safely to the outer boroughs. And as the fires kept burning, with the world-famous skyline of Lower Manhattan covered in smoke, yet another tower at the World Trade Center was destabilized, Tower 7, which ultimately crashed down just after 5 o'clock. As we mentioned earlier, both planes that hit the towers originated in Boston, American Airlines Flight 11 hitting Tower 1 at 8.45 a.m., just about 12 hours ago. 18 minutes later at 9.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175 smashed into Tower 2. And, of course, it'll probably be hours, if not days, before we have a final casualty count. All right, Mary, we will hear from you just a little bit later on. Uh, to take another look at uh, another aspect of this disaster, we're going to talk on the phone now to Michael O'Reilly. He is the CEO of, uh, is it uh, Environmental Trade Winds, Mr. O'Reilly, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and you, you're, we're going to talk about disaster cleanup, one of the things that your, that your company does. As you look at, uh, from a distance at the scope of what's happened today, what do you think is going to be the scope of, of the cleanup involved? Well, you know, we're, 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 we're still a bit in shock, but we, we've uh, organized over a, a, a thousand responders uh, ready, to, uh, ready to, uh, to, to do our job, which is uh, catastrophe remediation. Have you been contacted by anybody yet to... Uh People who hate us for many years, but now we see a manifestation on a scale that is uh, almost unbelievable. Darling, I very much appreciate you, uh, you waiting for us and taking the time to, to tell us, uh, to talk to us, is the former Commander-in-Chief of the Special Operations Unit, is General Downing, and he wrote the COBAR's report, the report which investigated the attack on Americans in Saudi Arabia <coughs> in November of 1995. We're going to go to, in just a second now to ABC's Robert Krulwich and then talk to the engineer or one of the engineers who worked on the Trade Tower, see if we can understand what it was that brought these buildings down today. But first, some more late, fairly late news from John Miller. John? Since the rescue workers are now uh, first starting to work that scene, uh, they're starting to have some very interesting results. Uh, two Port Authority police officers, the Port Authority being the entity that runs the World Trade Center, have been found trapped in the rubble. Uh, there is a team of police officers trying to dig them out. They're apparently alive. Um, a strange case, a 911 operator in Pennsylvania says she's received a call from people trapped in the rubble um, 40 feet uh, from the Vista Hotel or the Millennium Hotel. Uh, they say they, they're near a fountain. On the west side of Manhattan. Yes, right. um, in the World Trade Center mm -hmm. complex. And they're, they're calling out from where they're trapped beneath the rubble uh, to a 911 uh, may, perhaps on a Pennsylvania uh, cell phone, but right. it went to an operator in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and they're trying to kind of triangulate where they are to get to them. So things are picking up there. They're also, they've also brought in dogs from all the counties around the city um, to aid in helping to sniff victims out. Exactly, as we've said before today, exactly they do in the case of an earthquake. People are now underground, and dogs are just the best thing you have in trying to locate them. Yet, as we've learned so often in modern times, in recent times, in Columbine, um, the role of the cell phone um, in modern disaster is incredible. From the people who mm -hmm. called out from the airplane, something we really didn't expect, um, an odd development, to people perhaps calling out from the rubble, if that's a legitimate call to the Pennsylvania operator. Great. John Miller, we'll come back to you. Now to try to examine the building. ABC's Robert Krulwich has put together a piece <clears throat> on the structural engineering of the World Trade Centers, perhaps better able help us to understand that when these two aircraft hit these two towers today, exactly what was going on. Robert? Why did the towers collapse as quickly and as suddenly as they did? Engineers from the original firm that built the towers told ABC they can only guess at this point, but they believe that the collisions themselves, the plane hitting building number one and the plane that smashed into building number two, oh my God! by themselves, they did not cause the collapse. It was the fire, they say, the intense fire and heat from the explosions that brought the buildings down. Temperatures inside could have built up to 15, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, steel loses its strength and steel beams connect every floor to the outside walls. As it got hotter, the beams got weaker, and the hot air inside began to push 
and press against the outside walls until the outside walls just buckled, snapped, and released the top floor, which fell onto the floor below, and the entire building sinks in a straight vertical, the floors falling faster and faster down, until you notice that every floor in the building is gone. Viewed from another angle, you can see the same thing. Notice the aerial stays vertical, just stays straight as it sinks into the building. There's no buckling or tipping, just straight down. And this happened in both buildings. The first tower, too, stayed straight as it went down, each floor falling neatly on top of the other. So the reason the towers went so quickly is because all the floors were literally hanging onto the skin. And once the skin went, the buildings went, too. Robert Krulwich, ABC News. Well, that report, as we look at New York City at night, which has a still quality about it tonight, the city of light at night, as so many American cities are, but there's a still, almost calm look of it from the sky. It's anything but that on the ground. But this is the second time from Robert Krulwich and also from some architect engineers we talked to a little earlier that say it was the heat which caused the building to collapse because that the steel at the top of the building would maybe have only been able to sustain an hour, an hour and a half of intense fire, and then the steel begins, as Robert points out, so clearly collapse upon itself all the way down to the bottom. I think we have with us on the phone or in person uh, from Seattle, John Magnuson, uh, who is an engineer. John, are you there? John Magnuson, uh, who is with the company that actually built the World Trade Center Terrace. John, have you heard our two... Uh, layman explanations tonight of what it was we think collapsed the building and do you agree or disagree? Uh, I, I agree. I, I need to say one thing. I, at the time of the design of the World Trade Center, that was in the mid-1960s and I was in uh, sixth grade. So uh, to kind of put in perspective how much time has passed since this design was actually completed. But the, the description of the fact that steel, when it gets up to 1500, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, that it loses its strength is accurate. The buildings actually survived the impact of both the planes, and uh, it was really the fire that finally uh, did the, uh, uh, created the disaster. And the upper floor fell on the next floor down, which fell on the next floor, and the sheer accumulation of weight just forced the whole building to collapse on itself. Right, there, from the videotape, and I, I can only go from what I've seen on television, but the videotape showed that several of the upper floors fell onto the next lower floor that was still intact. And once that happens, there's going to be an instant overload situation, and then it will fail. And then that will drop down to the next floor into another instant overload situation. And so the floors just uh, progressively collapse down all the way to the bottom. Mm. I appreciate very much the fact that you were very young in the mid-1960s okay. when the trade towers were built. Though I have heard it said earlier today that it, in fact, they, in fact, were stronger, more sensible structures than many of the more daring shaped buildings that are being built in parts of the world today. Right, the, the term that structural engineers use is redundancy. And the World Trade Center towers really set a new standard in redundancy. And that's why those uh, airplanes were able to crash into the towers without causing the structural failure. The buildings were still standing. Uh, and then the problem was the fire and the jet fuel. Mm. And in normal buildings, all the steel is protected with fireproofing and their sprinkler systems, but they're not designed to protect against a jet fuel fire inside of a building. Can you be a little more precise what you mean by redundancy? Uh, redundancy is that if you have a structural element that uh, is damaged that, and is no longer able to carry the load, that that load is able to be passed on to other elements or other columns or other mm -hmm. beams within the building. And um, the columns on the World Trade Center, they were spaced at 39 inches on center all the way across each face. What, what does so that mean, 39 inches at center? Every, every three feet, three inches, there was a column that supported the building. So they were very closely spaced together. Many buildings, the columns are 10 or 15 feet apart or more. And so having these very close spaced columns on the outside created a lot of redundancy. That's, that's why there was able to be a hole in the side. If you go back and look at the tapes, there was a tremendous hole in the side of the building and it didn't collapse until the fire brought it down. And, and, and trade tower number seven, which, which was the last to go, which was a building 47 stories high, do you have any sense of why it ultimately collapsed? Was it the concussion of the other buildings collapsing which undermined it? 
Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that building. We were not involved in that building, and uh, I haven't seen any of the details on that yet. So aside from your horror, uh, which I assume you share with the rest of us uh, today, when you look at what has happened today, do you learn something? Well, it's, it's a very difficult situation because uh, if you take that much uh, of a load and that much uh, jet fuel and you put it into a building, there's very little that you can do. And really, I think the solution to this will be to keep, keep the planes and keep these uh, attacks away from the doorsteps of these buildings. John Nance, who's our aviation analyst, said to us uh, several hours ago when, when speculating, as we all are in many cases, about who may have been involved, said he would not be surprised if somewhere, somewhere in the world there was a structural engineer who was part of this operation. Does that make sense uh, to you? It makes sense. I sure would hope not. Uh, every structural engineer is dedicated to preserving the public safety. And just the thought that, that someone would take that training and use it for evil purposes uh, mm. just really disgusts me. Is there anything I've missed, John? In, in no. In, no? Okay. I, I'm very grateful for the time. Um, okay. what's, what's it like up there in Seattle tonight? Uh, people feeling exactly the same thing people here in New York City are feeling? Yes, and uh, there was certainly a lot of op apprehension during the day. Many of the buildings were evacuated as, just as precautionary measures. But uh, there's the same empty, empty feeling in your stomach uh, about the whole thing and just watching. People, of course, were glued to the coverage on the television sets. Well, thank you for being so articulate about it and helping us understand, at least <coughs> from the, thank you very much, from the slightly cold-blooded language of, of uh, engineers and, and, uh, and journalists covering this from, from some distance today, uh, the structure of the building, which may not have been able to stand up to that fire, which was caused when those two planes, the first and the second, uh, struck um, under somebody's control um, fairly high up in the in these superstructures, and then simply, as Robert Kowitz uh, pointed out, just simply, and 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 John Magnuson confirms, collapsed down upon themselves, and it was the president. We think George Stephanopoulos is still with me. You were down there all today. It was the president. We think who gave some clue to that which which we have feared most of the day that it wasn't hundreds of people involved in this, but thousands. But thousands, yes. But Peter, I think, and I was thinking of this as John Magnuson was talking. When you talk about the strength of the building in the coming days, we're also going to be hearing about some amazing not only rescue stories, but survival stories. Uh, I spoke with the relative of someone who was on the 102nd floor of the first building today. After it took the hit from the airplane, mm -hmm. that person still made it down from the 102nd floor in his home safe tonight. It's very, it's very interesting because one of the lawyers had come down from a lower floor, believed that many people had got down in a fairly orderly fashion from some of the highest floors at certainly right underneath where the attack had occurred which has given people here, and I suspect in the country, some hope tonight that many more people get out of this building uh, than we thought. It is now 9 o'clock Eastern Time. In the East, it is now <coughs> 6 o'clock um, on the West Coast, up and down the West Coast in the United States. It is about 12 hours, just 12 hours and, and a bit, since many of us walking to work uh, were suddenly confronted with having to deal with this in one way or another. And there's a huge, huge number of developments to catch up with. I want to go first of all, as we just review this, because this all happened in the morning of Good Morning, in the, right in the middle of Good Morning, at the very end of Good Morning America. Charles Gibson, Charlie Gibson, and Diane Sawyer were there uh, on television live when this happened. And so it seems appropriate that we go to Diane. And Diane, ask you to put together some reconstruction of it for us. Traffic helicopters were the first to report an explosion in the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Witnesses say they saw it, a plane crashing into the building. I saw something push the building in, and then I saw the tail, and then I saw a flame. Help! Everybody else, let's go! Evacuation begins inside the building. Then a few minutes later, just after 9 a.m., as smoke pours from the top of the North Tower, an unbelievable sight, a second plane hitting the South Tower. Oh, oh my God! Oh, Jesus! Oh, my God! There are gaping holes in flames coming now from both towers. Witnesses see people screaming from the higher floors. They're trying to see themselves. I don't know. I see people jumping <laughs> from the top of the World Trade Center. And, uh, 
This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the fire It was about 10 o'clock a.m. when the South Tower the collapsed. Towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. On the ground, there was chaos, flaming debris, someone said, like at the dark side of the moon. It was bad. It was like a dust storm or something. Like, I couldn't see anything. About 20 minutes later, the second tower crumbles to the ground. Oh, my God, there it goes! Symbols of New York, the World Trade Center towers, are simply gone. Diane Sawyer uh, giving us what it was like, um, at least from a distance, because we've all been at a distance uh, from this, <clears throat> what it was like um, in those first moments. Now let's look at it from another perspective, because ABC's Lisa Stark, um, who covers aviation for us, as we've said several times today, is able, I think, to take you there, Lisa? I am, Peter. Lisa's in Seattle today, uh, where she's been out of the Boeing company. It was two Boeing jets, it was Boeing jets, Boeing equipment, 757s and 767s involved. Why don't you just walk us through what you and we now know about how this unfolded from the point of view of the hijackers. All right, I will, but Peter, I want to give you a little bit of new information first, if I may. There is a meeting going on, we understand, between the Federal Aviation Administration and the major carriers at this point. They are trying to determine how they might be able to get air service back up and going again tomorrow, what steps would need to be taken. We do understand from a number of sources that one of the things they are considering is a resumption of the air marshal program. That would be uh, armed uh, air marshals that would actually fly on a number of flights. Now that happens now in the United States, but it's a very small percentage of flights. It's unclear whether they would ramp up to every flight, that seems unlikely, but whether they are considering whether they would put air marshals on a number of flights as a precaution throughout the United States, one of the options that they are talking about. Okay, just before you go to your chronology then, let yes. me remind people that what you mean by air service back up is because uh, hundreds of airplanes and thousands of passengers, an extraordinary job of air traffic control and pilots getting planes mm -hmm. safely on the ground when the FAA decided everybody should land at the nearest possible airport, many of which are in Canada. And so there are thousands of people stranded far away from home tonight, safe. But when you refer to air service being got back up again, you basically mean getting the nation's air communication systems back up and running. Absolutely. There's a national ground stop throughout the United States until at least noon tomorrow. It's going to be a massive task to get the system up and running. And obviously the main concern is to do it safely uh, to make sure that we don't have a repeat of the horrible events that we saw today. So there are security issues that are paramount and there are also simply operational issues. How do you sort of turn the switch back on? and get as many as 40,000 flights every day in the United States back in the air. And those discussions about that are underway right now, we okay. understand. I, I, we'll all follow that one. Now take us, if you would, through the movement right. of the aircraft, which were ultimately and fatally involved. What we know is that American Airlines Flight 11 uh, was the first plane involved. That was the plane, a 767, en route from Boston's Logan Airport to Los Angeles. The plane took off shortly after 8 o'clock, we understand. About a half hour into the flight, it made a sharp left turn down towards New York. There were massive changes in airspeed apparently at that time as the plane then headed toward Manhattan. It slowed and slammed into the World Trade Tower. It had been in the air about 45 minutes. Now, at the same time this was going on, there was a United Airlines 767, Flight 175, also from Boston to Los Angeles. It also was in the air, taken over by hijackers. That plane made a turn towards New Jersey, then made virtually a U-turn and came up toward the Trade Tower from the south, came over Staten Island, it slammed into the second trade tower. It had also been in the air about 45 minutes. Now, before any of these planes actually hit the World Trade Center, a third plane, a United Airlines 757, uh, I'm sorry, American Airlines Flight 7, American Airlines 757, it was Flight 77 from Dulles had taken off. 
it was bound for Los Angeles as well. We don't know much about the flight path of that plane. We believe it was in the air about one hour before it hit the Pentagon. Then we have the fourth plane, United Flight 93, another 757 en route from Newark to San Francisco. We are unclear about the departure time. We have some conflicting information about that, whether it was close to 8 o'clock or closer to 845. It did depart Newark Airport. It apparently, it appears that hijackers may have taken control of the plane over Cleveland. That is when it suddenly made a turn back toward the east. We also understand that sometime at that point, someone from the cockpit called the FAA and requested a change in flight plan. They said, we're not going to San Francisco. We want to go to Washington, D.C., to DCA, which is National Airport. It's unclear whether there was another Washington target, perhaps, that this plane was aiming for. Either way, it didn't make it all the way to Washington. It crashed in Pennsylvania. A total of 266 passengers and crew on all four of these planes. The toll could have been even much, much worse on the jetliners because they were very lightly filled. They can hold anywhere from 185 to 250 people. The most crowded plane had 90 passengers and crew members on it. Peter, we ought to was also want to mention, if we can, that as this was unfolding, people on board these planes were able to communicate what was going on. We know some details about that. We know on Flight 11, that was the American Airlines flight, the first one that hit the World Trade Tower, a flight attendant was able to call the American Airlines Operations Center. The flight attendant informed them that a number of flight attendants had been stabbed and that the perpetrators had stormed the cockpit. She was also able to tell them apparently the seat number of at least one of the hijackers. She was able to give them that information. We also know that there were some cell phone calls from at least two of the other planes. There was a cell phone call, as you have reported earlier, from the plane that slammed into the Pentagon. A woman calling her husband, uh, saying that these hijackers were on board, that they had uh, box cutters, those sorts of knives, and they had herded all of the passengers into the back of the plane. And we understand there was also a cell phone call on the United 175 flight. That was the other flight that hit the World Trade Tower. Apparently, a son on that plane called his father from his cell phone and also said there were hijackers on board with knives. So we do know that as the events were unfolding, uh, what was going on 30,000 feet above the United States was being communicated. Of course, unfortunately, there was nothing the people on the ground could do about any of this except watch in horror as these planes ended up where they ended up. Well, thanks very much, Lisa Stark, who has a, who has a very clear picture many times today on what precisely happened, or at least as much as we know of what happened, thank you, um, on board those planes. You know, we, we do not uh, very often make recommendations for people's behavior from this chair, but as Lisa was talking, um, I checked in with my children, and it, uh, who were deeply uh, distressed, as I think young people are across the United States. And uh, so if you're a parent, you got a kid in some other part of the country, call them up, exchange observations. Uh, people have been getting onto, the, onto, onto sites on the web, uh, which, is, uh, which is a very good, vigorous way for people, very good way for people to communicate. Some of the things people have been telling us at ABC News, uh, at abcnews.com after today, nothing changes. Sorry, everything changes. Nothing will ever be the same. The way you've lived your life, enjoyed your freedom, your very personal expression, it all changes after today. Um, from someone else, only a month ago, I laid on a bench outside the World Trade Center and marveled at what man could create, looking up at those 110 stories, and now I stare in disbelief at what man can take away. I want retribution, uh, said one person uh, to abcnews.com, and that's a sentiment that has been widely, deeply expressed uh, in, the, in the heart of the political establishment in Washington and by people in every walk of life across the country. And as George Stephanopoulos and Leon Panetta, the former White House Chief of Staff, have made very clear, and as the President clearly knows already, one of the things the President has to do is be patient and understand who it is who did this before the country can do anything uh, by way of retaliation. Is a slightly chilling one. If they can pull off an act like this, they are certainly capable of eventually sending nuclear weapons this way. And this is very interesting. How can people keep calling it the modern Pearl Harbor? Um, 
at least we knew who we were up against back then. Of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese was a surprise uh, to a great many Americans in the middle of afternoon ball games. This is the first time today that Major League Baseball has ever canceled all its games since D-Day, uh, the invasion of Normandy in World War II. And one of the enormously frustrating things for the intelligence establishment, for the political establishment, for all of us in the country today, um, not to mention anyone else in the world who was a friend of the United States, perhaps even a foe, is to understand who it was who actually uh, did this. And the reverberations from this are indeed global. Uh, air traffic, we already know, listening to Lisa Stark and our own reporting earlier today, is snarled around the world, especially in Europe. The impact of what happens there in terms of transportation and commerce, the stock exchange was closed today, it all has an effect somewhere else. Um, any place there is a proposed mass gathering in many parts of the world, they are rethinking it. In Germany, they have now canceled the Frankfurt Car Show, which is uh, one of the biggest car shows, if not the biggest car show in the world. There's some consideration to canceling the Oktoberfest, the great beer and culture festival in Munich. In Germany, France has called a general security alert. And I'm just told that Ted Koppel is with us in London, live. Uh, Ted has been in London and now can go even further than that, please, Ted, on telling us what's happened in Europe and as much as you know elsewhere. Well, I must tell you, Peter, I've spent the better part of this day trying to get from where I was, which about 12 hours ago was in Italy, to where you are. And as you well know, and as you've been reporting for much of the day, getting into the United States from overseas uh, is a very difficult task indeed. But it's, it's just about, uh, what time is it here? 2.15 in the morning here in London and uh, some of the early editions of the newspapers have come through and I thought you might like to take a look at them. Let me hold them up. There's not a great deal that differentiates the tabloids today from the uh, more uh, serious newspapers. You can see it, Apocalypse, New York, September 11th, says the Daily Mail. Declaration of War, says the Daily Express. And then this one, which perhaps goes farther than it might, is this the, the end of the world from the Daily Star? And so it goes, the mirror, war on the world, the sun, the day that changed the world. And now one of the more serious newspapers, the Independent, and again, the same horrific pictures that we have been seeing all day long. And the Independent says, Doomsday America, the Times of London, when war came to America, and so it has gone. And I must tell you, Peter, uh, the only thing I can tell you is, uh, as you know, when we're overseas, uh, American tourists tend to turn to folks like us, uh, expecting that we know something. I'm, I'm afraid I knew less than they did. It was some other tourists who informed me earlier in the day of what had happened, and I went rushing back to my hotel room uh, and packed while I was watching the, uh, the television scenes that you have been reporting on all day. Uh, and all I can tell you is that uh, this was a day when, as soon as people found out you were an American, uh, they turned to you with expressions of grief, expressions of horror, expressions of outrage, uh, and an offer to do anything they could do uh, to help, which in, in my case meant getting a little bit closer to New York or, or Washington. Peter? Ted, have you managed, uh, I, I totally, totally sympathize with, with, with what you've gone through today, and as bad as a day it is for many Americans, I understand what you mean when you say it's been a good day to be reminded that people around the world admire and sympathize with America and suffer with it. Can you give us some sense, if you have any whatsoever, just from looking at the reporting there, uh, as to how governments are responding as well as individuals? Well, again, Peter, uh, and uh, you've been in this situation often enough to be sympathetic to it. I, I literally just landed uh, in London. We had to charter from, from Paris to get over here uh, because flying into Heathrow wasn't that easy, especially at this time of night. Uh, and uh, have only landed now and been reading the wires okay. in the car <laughs> coming in. Uh, and I, I do know that uh, Tony Blair has uh, uh, expressed uh, uh, strong condemnation and, uh, of course, a sense of oneness with the United States. Uh, perhaps, Peter, the, uh, the most interesting thing that I've heard in just 
uh, read a little bit of a transcript of a television newscast that came out of Tehran earlier this evening, is that the Iranian president, uh, Khatami, uh, is quoted by the Iranian anchors earlier this evening as expressing his outrage uh, and offering to help in any way that he can uh, against uh, this form of worldwide terrorism. Coming from Iran, uh, that is quite remarkable, as I'm sure you know. I do indeed, though perhaps, perhaps a little more understandable coming from President Khatami, who is uh, regarded as the, as the president of Iran, who, as you well know, is trying to move the country uh, closer to some kind of sense of exactly. democratic representation than others in the country are willing him to do. But I think we've all known for a long time that sometimes elements within the Iranian uh, political establishment or on the edges of the political establishment operate in ways that other parts of the political establishment are not aware of. At any rate, I won't... Right. But you've... You know. Uh, no, go ahead, Peter. No, I was just going to say, I don't want to impose on you anymore, because I know you want to, I, I know, like anybody else arriving on scene, you want to sit down and get as much as you can. So please come back to us at any time uh, that, you, that, that you want. you want to add something now? Uh, just one thing, and uh, I realize compared to what everyone has been going through in the United States today, and especially the citizens of New York and Washington, uh, this seems like a small thing, but I'm sure it was reflected today thousands, if not tens of thousands of times. Uh, being overseas and picking up the phone, I've got three youngsters, as you know, who live in New York City. Just trying to get through on the phone today could be such a trial. Uh, and uh, two of my youngsters, three of them actually, work down in, uh, in downtown New York. And all I can tell you is uh, you stop being a newsman real fast and all you want to do is be a father and find out that uh, the kids are all right and that everything is okay. And for so many, many people today, Americans around the world, still wondering at this late hour what's happened to their loved ones, all I can tell you is the, the, the grief and the sympathy of the world goes out to all. Uh, you're absolutely right, Ted. And as a man, as I just said before we joined you, just got off the phone with at least one of his kids and the other is trying to call him. Um, I totally appreciate it. We'll let you go to work. Please come back any time um, that, uh, that you feel Thank like you. it with news from overseas. But as, as Ted indicates, when he holds up the tabloids, sometimes known as the popular newspapers and the more serious broadsheet newspapers in Britain, they all have those same uh, headlines that this strike on America has somehow changed things. And it's not as if the United States, in the wake of Oklahoma City, was not aware that it could happen. Um, on the American mainland, but uh, uh, they, they use phrases like apocalypse now in the movie sense, among other things, and just make you realize um, the, the, how deeply this has felt and what impact it's had in, in other parts of the world. It's interesting that several, well, it's interesting in a very minor way, that several people today have noted the oddity of the date, nine, ninth day of the 11th month, uh, as the, the three digits of, of the emergency number 911. George, um, I want to, I'll be with you in a minute, George Stephanopoulos. We've kept John McCrethy at the Pentagon, um, who's been frustrated, John, I think, a little, because they forced you to, to stay. Uh, they forced you to stay where you are and will not let you get into your normal listening post inside the Pentagon? That's right. Uh, the security around the Pentagon mm -hmm. is extreme. Uh, we have been allowed to get cameras a little closer uh, on a very restricted basis, Peter. That was where we were able to take uh, pictures of some of the bodies lined up outside the Pentagon, some of the grim evidence. Uh, you were talking about people worrying about their loved ones. Well, calls are going out from the Defense Department tonight of those uh, bodies that have been identified. There are still many, many missing in the rubble of the Pentagon, so that search goes on tonight. Uh, you may notice behind me there are still fires burning on the roof of the Pentagon. They have been struggling all day to uh, put out these fires, and they have moved along the rim of the Defense Department, uh, and they break through. The firemen go up on the roof in very heroic efforts. They break through the roof. It breathes air, uh, and that gives the fire new life, and then they pour water down those uh, infernos as they burn. So the fight uh, is still continuing uh, here at the Pentagon to try and bring the fires under control so they can go after those people who are still trapped in the rubble. John, we're looking at a second graphic. We had one earlier today which, which appeared to show that the, the depth or the width of the tragedy, not to mention the depth into that inner 
into that inner courtyard. And you described the great gash across the building as being, I think, to about 200 feet wide. Is my sense tonight that fire has, made, has, has spread to places where you didn't anticipate it was going to spread earlier in the day? There are fires that have spread along air ducts and along the very top attic section of the Pentagon well beyond uh, where the actual gash was. But Peter, the destruction, as the plane hit the Pentagon at an oblique angle, it dumped some of the fuel, apparently, in an explosive blast in one direction, and the damage is far, far worse on one side of the gash on the Pentagon than it is on the other. And it looks to be the, it looks to be the side on the right to, to our eye here. Am I right about that? It looked at uh, from your that's perspective? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. John McCrethy, thank you very much indeed again. Uh, we're going to stay in the Washington area now because Claire Shipman, uh, the House Intelligence Committee has just had a briefing, and I believe that, Claire, you've managed to get a briefing from someone in the Intelligence Committee to tell us what we went on. news. Hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can. Now go ahead. All right, sorry, trouble with my sound tonight. What we were told um, from Democratic and Republican leadership sources on Capitol Hill is that they had a briefing, an intelligence briefing, a little bit earlier today from uh, members of the intelligence community, community, including the CIA, and that they were told, quote, um, the CIA had some hard facts, and of course this won't surprise you, that were pointing to Osama bin Laden. Um, in fact, the source told me they were surprised how blunt the CIA was with them at this point. Um, we're, we've also been told, it's interesting, Peter, even in the midst of all of this um, tragedy today, that there was a little bit of grumbling in Washington. Some members of Congress frustrated that mm. they weren't hearing from the president, that the president wasn't back in Washington. But the leadership says that they absolutely understand why the president was traveling around the country today and that they have that the, the scene we saw on Capitol Hill earlier of bipartisanship w was not an act, that it's very genuine. Um, the leadership was briefed four times by Vice President Cheney earlier today. They didn't hear from Bush directly, but they were very happy with what they heard from him tonight. They're planning to convene tomorrow to pass a piece of legislation condemning all of the terror, and then it's not clear whether or not they're going to stay in session. They're trying to decide how much sense that makes and how appropriate it is. Okay, thanks very much, Claire. We'll come back, <coughs> we'll come back to you as the evening wears on. Um, I know there are people in the country who will express this sentiment, so I express it as much on behalf of other people. We believe at this point we knew absolutely nothing in advance, and we've said that several, if not several dozen times today, and here we are within minutes I shouldn't take that back. Within hours of an incident um, involving terrorists about which we've heard much, not much throughout the day, and already we have someone in the Intelligence Committee, or maybe it's through a member of Congress, uh, pointing the finger at Osama bin Laden. I'll turn to George Stephanopoulos to talk about this a little bit, and then perhaps to talk to, uh, to our defense analysis in, uh, in Washington in just a moment. Tony. The skeptics just say, Oh, they point the finger at Osama bin Laden. Because it's easy and we need a face. Exactly. We need a face. We need and someone enemy, to demonize. And someone to blame and someone to demonize and someone to attack. Um, and it's, I think there'll probably be some grumbling from the Central Intelligence Agency and others in the intelligence community that information like this was frankly leaked out of the uh, House Intelligence Committee or out of mm -hmm. the Congress because that's one of their big complaints consistently with the Congress is one of the reasons we can't trust the Intelligence Committee with this information is because the minute we, we talk about it, it gets out in the public domain. But I, I do think it does speak to something that we'll see happening in the coming days. Before you go on to the coming days, <coughs> I apologize. I don't want to hold you up except this. Do you think, from your experiences in government, that there is a tendency to blame Osama bin Laden even when there is not necessarily any basis on which to precisely point the fi finger at him. I don't mean that Osama bin Laden gave someone money to someone in the country, but within hours of this, we're beginning to point at the same man we point to on almost every instance. I would say a tendency to find, to find a specific target that <coughs> you can blame as quickly as possible, not necessarily Osama bin Laden, but I remember very well in, in early 1993, after former President Bush, there was an assassination attempt against him, right. the FBI and the CIA spent several weeks trying to find out who was responsible. They finally did identify people, but there was an awful lot of pressure from the people on the ground, especially to say, mm -hmm. yes, 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 we have it. And you felt that a lot of people further back in Washington were saying, are you sure? Yeah, are I think positive? the public is pretty actually wise about this now because we've been through so many experiences where we thought it was Iran 
and maybe it turned out to be Libya, or you thought it turned out to be Libya, and then the suspect was Syria, and it turned out to be Palestine, thought it was Palestinians, and it turned out to be an American. And one other thing, not to discount, Peter, I'm not suggesting mm. this is happening in this case, but you always have to be careful. Those who are doing the briefings may have an agenda of their own it, within the government trying to build pressure for right. an action they want. Now, you, you were going to, before you go on to your other point, Claire Shipman mentioned that they were going to pass legislation tomorrow, which will be national legislation respectful of the day. And, and support for the president. And, and support for the, for, the, for the president and support for the various government agencies. There's going to be quickly going to be a demand and request for doing something for, more than already and money. For much more. And it, whenever you have these kinds of terrorist acts, whether it was Oklahoma City or the, or the assassination attempt on President Bush or the Cobar Towers, Congress acts. Remember, after TWA Flight 800, we first got those questions that were asked of every air passenger. Have your bags been with you at all times? Um, and has anyone else, have they ever been out of your sight? That was never asked before. You'll see something far more stringent, I would guess, coming out of Congress now. Far more attempts after the Oklahoma City bombing. There were attempts to increase the FBI's wiretaping, um, wiretapping, wiretapping mm -hmm. capabilities, and tracing gunpowder and other kinds of ammunition. And also after uh, Al Kobar, mm -hmm. more money for intelligence. You'll see that coming out of the but Congress. But you make a very good point, and we discussed it a little earlier today. I've forgotten. I think it was James Woolsey we began to talking to, and pointing out that how important it is for Americans at the moment to appreciate freedoms in the country. And I think uh, I think it was somebody very early in the day who, who quoted Edmund Burke when they ta he talked about ordered liberty, because there will be pressure in some communities in pursuit of ter international terrorism to make it tougher for Americans to enjoy all of their freedoms. Do you believe that? No question about it. After Oklahoma mm. City, there was even an attempt to start to catalog these domestic militias in a way that we would have never done um, before that, and that, that was something there was an outcry at the time, but I would suspect that after something like this, people will say, we're willing to sacrifice some liberties in order to get the security. Okay, thanks, George. Please don't go away. We want to go back downtown to hear one more time from Diane Sawyer. And I say <clears throat> one more time because if you think about it, she has been up longer and working longer on this story than any of us. It was late in Good Morning America when this happened. And Diane, I know you need in some way, at least I think you do, prepare for tomorrow. So why don't you just take some time now and tell us about the day from your perspective. I, I will, Peter, and we will be back on in the morning very early. And of course, I know you're going to be going along through the night, too, so we'll probably pass the torch sometime in the middle of the night. I want to tell you what we just did. We decided to make our way as close as we could get to ground zero, and I can now report to you that I've seen what's going on inside, if you go all the way up and inside. At the scene itself, where the Twin Towers were, one tower completely level. I saw no signs of fire there now. It is a truly eerie scene because, of course, there's no light. There's no electricity, and you see silhouetted firemen, silhouetted EMS workers, everyone moving around, and in unbelievable conditions because the suit is up to your ankles. You are tripping over piping. There are those horrible grotesque sculptures of the burned out cars and the burned out buses all around you every place. Uh, the, the other building, the other tower building, there seems to be the base of it still standing. They're still spraying it with water all the time, although they tell me they're going to really wait for daylight to do much more. Then we went over to building seven, which also burned and burned later in the afternoon. And over there, you're seeing you're hearing the crumbling sounds. It almost sounds as if you're going to have a rock fall or a landslide or an avalanche because the building is creaking and moaning as it continues to crumple. Now, there was still fire. I couldn't determine exactly where it was. I didn't know if it's that Marriott Hotel or not. We saw flames still going up in the air, but it was, it was impossible to determine from where we were exactly what that fire is right now. And Don Daler fanned out in a different direction. I'm going to bring him in once again to see what you saw, Don. Well, I just a moment ago saw a doctor in full medical scrubs walking from the direction of the scene, and I asked him, was there anybody that he even got to, to work on down there? And he said no, that they didn't have any victims or injured people who were coming out to the triage area. So either the people who were injured have been brought out and are already at the hospitals, or there's nobody coming out right now. And that, that just now happened. You think you saw a canine unit? deploying as we, well? We heard, we, yeah, we saw a canine unit and we heard reports that there were some, uh, some metro workers trapped somewhere down in that area and also there was a 911 cell phone call, a report of a 911 cell phone call from a Philadelphia area code that was traced to the region, to the area down near the Marriott Hotel. But we are, in the next couple days and hours, certainly we're going to hear 
probably as many tragic stories as the, you saw leaves of paper, but one of them was a fireman who just came by moments ago, did not want to go on camera. He was down there very early in the day and had actually witnessed one of his fellow firemen killed by a falling body, by someone who had jumped from, from the building. Unending, unending tragedy. Uh, the firefighters working down there now, the grit in your eyes makes it almost impossible to see. The soot is absolutely everywhere still. And we talked to you before, Peter, about the fact that all of these documents, I cannot tell you what it is like to see this sea of financial documents every place. And I just picked up randomly a couple of them and their analysis of someone's budget and then there's an analysis of an insurance filing and you just keep thinking how important all of these seem to someone 24 hours ago. Well, Diane, thank, you, you. thank you very much indeed for, uh, for your work today. <clears throat> it goes without saying we value uh, enormously. As you were talking, I was also trying to catch up to the ripple effect of this thing. We know that aircraft are grounded. Lisa Stark told us a short while ago that aviation authorities and various other governmental authorities are discussing whether or not this freeze on air travel in the country is going to last as long as the original 12-hour delay they put in it because, among other things, postal service officials are now saying that mail is only going to be delivered within 600 miles of its point of origin for at least the next 24 hours because uh, mail going beyond 600 miles goes by a commercial carrier and that's surely one of the things the government is talking about at the moment in terms of the interruption of national and one could argue international life at the moment. ABC's Betsy Stark who covers the stock markets, uh, national business affairs and international business affairs is with us at the moment. Betsy, uh, put together for us if you will the picture of a world um, or much of the world that has been brought to a halt in many ways by these incidents today. Well, Peter, we're, we're certainly reminded uh, of the, that we have a global economy and global markets. European and Latin American markets had a chance to respond to events today. As you know, U.S. financial markets were closed all day, but markets in Europe and Latin America were down sharply. Uh, trading was halted in some of them. Uh, Asia has, is now having its first opportunity to react to these events, and uh, in Japan, the Nikkei is uh, down around 6.5%. It's been open for about an hour and a half now. Incidentally, that's the lowest level in 15 years. Uh, you know, the U.S. has been the world's real economic engine, and the U.S. is, uh, as you know, the economy has been faltering, but uh, this uh, additional blow uh, to, uh, to the, those very visible symbols of the United States as the center of, of world finance has shaken uh, investor confidence and we're seeing that play out in global stock markets. Now all financial markets are going to here are going to be closed again tomorrow. The New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange will be closed tomorrow. That's right, Peter. Incidentally, you were talking before about parallels to World War II. Interestingly, U.S. financial markets will be closed now for 48 hours. It's the first time since World War II that that's happened. And I mean, keep in mind that the New York Stock Exchange is just a few blocks from, uh, from the World Trade Center Twin Towers. So uh, in a sense, it's not surprising. It's going to be a while before uh, rescue operations and cleanup operations make it possible for New York Stock Exchange employees to return to work. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, Treasury Secretary O'Neill, wh uh, who's in Japan today, no word yet on when he will return, certainly trying to reassure everybody, saying the U.S. economy is strong and resilient. Uh, we had the Fed issuing messages today saying it will do uh, what must be done to make sure that uh, money continues to flow through the U.S. economy and to make sure the banking system continues to run smoothly, which it did by and large today. In, in fact, the, the, the global economy and the greater number of stock exchanges in many more places makes 24-hour trading with or without the, well, to some degree, with or without the New York and the American stock exchanges today more possible, does it not? Yes, it does, Peter. Uh, you know, one other thing I wanted to mention to you is there were economists talking today about the possibility that this might be the straw that breaks the camel's back, that this mm. might be the event that tips the U.S. economy into recession. I mean, think about it. When markets don't trade, when planes don't fly, when, when businesses shut down, as we saw so many do today, when malls close, uh, th that's a drag on the U.S. economy. People aren't out there spending. And when you've got an economy that's growing at a snail's pace, uh, those kinds of, uh, th that kind of slowdown in the economy just for a period 
consecutive days has the potential to push an economy teetering on recession over the brink. Thanks very much, Betsy Stark, who will continue to report the, the uh, economic dimensions of this. Um, you know that so many, you know, largely depending on where you live, I guess, that, that uh, many of the government and both federal and state offices around the country are closed today. Ironically, the Texas governor granted a 30-day stay to an inmate who faced execution tonight after the worst terror attack uh, in, uh, in American history, at least on American soil. Um, in, in Georgia and in many other states around the country, the legislatures ceased doing business if they were in session at the time. And reflecting what we saw on Capitol Hill, maybe we could get that piece of tape up again for people who didn't see it. It was a very moving national moment um, when members of the House and the Senate uh, stood together and sang spontaneously or not, God bless America. Uh, the Emmy Awards, television's highest awards, which were scheduled for Sunday, next Sunday, have been postponed immediately, and, and so have another series of awards. There's a whole list of everything that has been postponed or delayed. And, and, and when Betsy Stark talks about the Treasury Secretary, Paul O'Neill, who's been saying to the, to, the, to the country and the world for the last couple of days, as has the President, that he expects the economy to come back by the end of the year. It, it, it is part of an important psychological process, as well as a business one, to say to the rest of the world, as Senator Tom Daschle did when he talked about Congress will be open for business tomorrow. And that has been reasserted as a government theme uh, at both the state and the federal level throughout the day. And so this scene on the steps of the Capitol building tonight, just as the sun was going down, was very, very moving. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide before. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet home. Well, we pretty cynical or skeptical about politicians, but there is an example of politicians doing what politicians are supposed to do, which is to give their constituents, all of us across the country, some sense of leadership. We're joined now by Pierre Thomas, who covers the FBI and the Justice Department for us. And Pierre, it's early days, but I gather they've, they've got the, the, the tiniest, tiniest direction to go, at least in one of the investigations. Yes, Peter, we're being told by sources that the FBI has begun to execute a number of search warrants, including in the state of Florida. My source will not give me additional information at this particular time. He emphasizes that it is at the very earliest stages of the investigation. This may turn out to be nothing, but the search warrants being executed are based on the passenger manifest. They have taken some of the names off of the manifest, and they're going to search some of the homes to find if uh, additional clues. So these are people we believe, or at least we believe the FBI believes are living in the United States? Uh, absolutely. These are some of the names that came up on the passenger manifest. They are going to their homes, conducting searches, looking for paper, any kind of information that might lead to answers to why this happened. We do believe, uh, Pierre, I think from earlier that one of the stewardesses, one of the flight attendants, my apologies to stewardess, flight attendant, uh, a flight attendant on the American Airlines flight was able to communicate to her base or to somebody else which seat one of the terrorists was sitting in. D does this contribute to the investigation now? It, it does, Peter, and uh, a number of sources told me tonight that uh, a number of passengers and flight attendants were able to dial 911 and also reach some of their relatives. And they describe a pretty horrific scene, scenes of people being attacked, in some cases being stabbed. And one source said he could only imagine the horror of what was going on on some of those planes. Okay, Pierre, thanks very much. Pierre Thomas, uh, who covers the FBI and the Justice Department, who says it's moving, uh, at least in terms of the investigation. And we've known since the, the, the last 12 hours of this massive coming together of intelligence operation. And, and, and John McCrethy, let me ask you about the National Security Agency, which uh, has the technical... You there, John? Jack? I'm here. I can't see you nor hear you. Well... Okay. I'm here. Okay, thanks very much. Not you, it's, the, it's our inability to see you. Um, the National Security Administration, the National Security Agency, rather, which tapes so much stuff, just tell us what basically they do that's uh, 
fairly common knowledge. And what will they be doing tonight? They have the ability to sweep up, uh, imagine a huge vacuum cleaner, all of the communications that are going around the world, they sweep them up uh, in a very sort of broad way. And then they look for certain phone numbers and certain things that are of interest to investigators uh, and try and single out some of those conversations. So what they are doing is they have millions and millions of phone calls that they have sucked up into this vacuum cleaner. They have to be very careful because uh, if it is an American citizen, there are very strict rules of the road for how you go about uh, dealing with those kinds of communications. But they will be sorting through all of the communications that have been going from phone numbers that they have a very specific interest in looking for clues. Okay, thanks very much, Jack. I just, uh, thank you very much. Let's turn around now because Governor Pataki is here. Hi, Governor, how are you? Thank you for coming. Have you got a microphone on? And if you couldn't, would you mind going and sitting down and take George Stephanopoulos' microphone? Governor Pataki, the governor of New York, we've seen him a couple of times today, um, uh, briefing in the first instance by himself and then with the mayor of New York, um, Rudy Giuliani. And I am grateful, sir, as I'm sure the audience is, that you take time from oh, pressing events at the least to come in and tell us what's going on. Well, Peter, we're doing everything we you can. You know John Miller, by yes, the way. Yes, of course I know John. We're yeah. doing everything we can to try to make sure that uh, we uh, rescue as many people as possible, provide the services to those who have been injured, uh, make sure we have the medical support staff and the emergency teams in place, and are also... You, are you, I apologize. I'm going to no, interrupt you right. several times. Sure. Are you rescuing people at the moment? Because we're uh, not certain. We have the equipment down in lower Manhattan right now. The city has its police and fire uh, emergency services down there, and we've... Uh, augmented it with our National Guard heavy equipment that down that is down there right now. I cannot say uh, that anybody has been rescued, that anybody has been uncovered, but I, because the first step is to put out the fires and to make sure that the rescue workers are safe, but that's the goal. There, there's some reports of people using their cell phones. In fact, John remarked on this earlier, people using their cell phones from under the rubble to communicate their location. Have you been able to get to people in those situations? I can't you know say of? that anybody's been able to, to, we've been able to get to anybody, but I do know that every step that can be taken is being taken. Okay, so go on with your, what have you been doing this afternoon and this evening? Well, I wanted to make sure that we had the, the, the support team, and we've been working with Mayor Giuliani to uh, augment the city services. I also spoke with the president and the mm -hmm. vice president, and we were getting security uh, briefings on a regular basis. And Peter, I got to tell you that uh, the outpouring uh, of support from around the surrounding area, from around the country and around the world has been enormous. You know, this is a very dark day in American history, but we're going to get through it. Uh, the people's resolve is strong, the spirit is strong, and uh, we will not allow our freedom to be taken from us. I, I know you, you said yourself, you've talked to President Bush and to Vice President Cheney. We had the impression that for a while there today, Mr. Cheney was the only person left in the White House. No, I, was, I spoke with the president early, uh, probably 9.20, 9.30 this right. morning, and uh, uh, he's been extremely responsive. All the help we've needed from the federal government, we've gotten. And do you need anything more? The, 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 uh, the attorney general said that they were sending in some different kinds of emergency teams in New York. Does that mean you are in real need at the moment? Uh, right now, all the needs that uh, we've been uh, uh, told about have been met. Uh, but as we go forward, this is not going to be a one-night or a one-day effort. This is going to go on for days and weeks. And the emergency forces that are there are going to need relief. We're going to have to rotate teams in and out. We're going to need specialized teams. And that's why we're very grateful that we have had this support from the federal government, from the surrounding governors, and uh, from everybody pulling together. John? Um, we're hearing the first reports of people being rescued at the scene, but, you know, there's a couple of ironies here. Your office, the governor's office, used to be That's in right. the World Trade Center. That's right. Um, at another time not long ago, you would have been there today. That's right. And we still have a lot of state offices there. And I have a number of friends who, who were there this morning. A number of friends who are unaccounted for even now? Unaccounted for it right now. Which means that, in all likelihood, you probably know people who were killed in this. Uh, we don't want to give up hope at this point. Uh, as I said, we're continuing to do everything we can to try to uh, continue the search and rescue operations. And until everything's been done, uh, hope is something you have to have. Governor, how close have you come to seeing for yourself what it's like? Uh, I've, I've been to the hospitals. I was with, uh, and the spirit is incredible. I was at uh, St. Vincent's with mm. some uh, injured police and firefighters who were in the hospital injured. And they wanted to go back. 
they wanted to go back down to help their colleagues. And uh, I was at Cabrini when we had lines of people blocks long on the street looking to donate blood. So uh, the spirit of the people, the response has been not one of allowing the terrorists to frighten New Yorkers off the streets. Mm -hmm. It's been one of pulling together, showing that spirit, showing that hope. And you know, we've seen death and we've seen destruction, but we've also seen hope. And but you, we you, will get through this. You travel through the city in pretty organized fashion at the moment. There are a lot of people out in the city tonight? Uh, no, uh, and they shouldn't mm. be. The vast majority of the people are home and that's where we want them, but uh, we need to have the highways and the streets clear for the emergency services and the emergency vehicles, and, and they are right now. Are all of the hospitals in the city able to cope with what's been presented to them? Do you, I yes. recall that earlier today you were, you were calling for doctors to volunteer and you were calling for nurses to volunteer. We have seen an outpouring of volunteers in the hospitals and we've seen an outpouring of donations of blood so that at this point uh, the hospitals have the supplies, have the staff, have the support to be able to deal with uh, the crisis as it moves forward. But what's going to happen, Peter, is those doctors, those nurses are going to get tired right. and we're going to need the relief teams and we've set up a statewide system to make sure that people don't just come here but they register so that as we need them we can call on them and bring them in in waves to help with that process. You and Mayor Giuliani have both gone out of your way today to say to people that they must be patient, that in time the United States will retaliate, and that's a matter for the federal government. You want to just give us your thoughts on that? Uh, Peter, that's right. This is something where I'm confident that the president and his team and our military have the ability to retaliate and take the appropriate action, and I'm confident they will. You know, we've seen anger on the streets, and there are moments when I feel it myself, but I've also seen hope. And we have to let that anger uh, not uh, overcome our desire to make sure we are still a nation of laws and a nation of uh, justice. So let the federal government deal with the terrorists. Let them make the appropriate response. And let's turn our anger to construct constructive efforts to rebuild and to pull us together. It's interesting, Governor. I'm not even sure you know this, but uh, we just heard a short while ago that Kmart is 2,100 stores in the country are not going to sell guns and ammunition at the moment. They've taken all their guns and their ammunition off the shelves, <coughs> which suggests that someone else besides yourself understands there's real anger in the community and these are those unfortunate times when prejudice sometimes tends to boil over. Uh, there is anger, there is prejudice, but we have to put that aside and understand that uh, the terrorist acts uh, that have devastated the city and, uh, and frightened the country uh, are, are aimed at taking away our freedom and we cannot take away other people's freedom uh, in retaliation. We have to be a nation of laws. Let the president, let the administration make the appropriate mm. response and let's turn that anger to hope, turn it to action, turn it to working to make sure that we come back as a city and as a country as strongly as possible. You have no doubt about it, I gather. I have no doubt about it. This city has been through an enormous tragedy today. This is one of the darkest days in American history and it's an ongoing nightmare, but we will get through this. Our freedoms will be intact and this city and this country will be strong Longer than ever. Governor Pataki, Governor George Pataki, Governor of New York, thank you very much for coming in. Opportunity to talk to you in person. We've seen you several times today on the television. I know exactly how busy you are. Thank you, sir. Let's thank go you, back sir. to the streets of New York and ABC's Bill Blake Moore, who is downtown. All of this, of course, is at the lower part of Manhattan on the western side of the city on the Hudson River, and ABC's Bill Blake Moore is there. And John, you've heard the governor say that uh, things are pretty quiet on the street. Is that the way you find it down there? Hang on, Bill. Hang on. Can't hear you just yet. Hang on. My apologies. Give us a, one of those one, two, threes, if you wouldn't mind. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Now I hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me, Peter, now? I, I can, Bill. Go ahead. It's very eerie down here in the financial district, Peter. We're just slightly north of the wreckage. Uh, the electricity is out everywhere, so we're only able to see things by the very harsh floodlights that have been brought in in a few places. There's still smoke billowing out of the wreckage and out of one or two buildings right next to it. We understand the Marriott Hotel is still on fire. They're pouring water on where they can. But within the past hour, firefighters have told members of our ABC News team that it's clearly going to be morning before they can begin to move any of these hundreds of uh, volunteers, firemen, other rescue workers in to begin to try to make something of it. People who have been right down next to the base of what was the Trade Towers say there's virtually nothing left. Maybe a few flights of stairs, a few uh, stories of one of the buildings, but that when they came down there was so much melting and so much demolishing of any kind of structure that they cannot imagine uh, much being left or much hope of finding anybody alive, though search and rescue is being mounted. We've seen dog teams being brought into position. There are hundreds of firemen just uh, to the west of me here over on the West Side Highway and dozens and dozens of uh, fire trucks and police cars ready to move in. But for the moment, 
Mostly it's just trying to get the temperature down at the base of where the trade towers were and to get the rest of the fire stopped. And Bill, one knows from past experience that a huge amount of heavy equipment is needed in the area in order to continue the searching operation. Do you see it showing up? Indeed, we've seen every now and then fleets of bulldozers and other heavy equipment moving through the back streets here. Um, in the dark as it is just now, every now and then a fleet of um, flashing lights and sirens will go by as the people working on the, the strategy here are trying to figure out how to get these pieces of equipment into position for what they're going to have to do in the morning. But we can see that it's clearly going to be many days of, of, of a great deal of grim work to try to take it apart and, uh, and, and to do what they can for anybody that they can find alive. But it's going to be morning before we can really see it. Thanks very much, uh, Bill Blakemore. One of the things that people who aren't familiar with this part of New York may not fully appreciate is that the Trade Towers stood, emphasis on stood, very close to the Hudson River. And the West Side Highway, which uh, comes down the west side of New York, past the World Trade Center, and then tucks around and goes up towards, that's Brooklyn, uh, in, in, in the map over to the right and across the Brooklyn Bridge and towards the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. The World Trade Center are very close to the edge of the river and all that stuff right underneath the World Trade Center at the moment is, is basically landfill. And, and so there is a very narrow physical window through which fact, the relief more. operators can work. Here's the mayor. Than we need at this point. Uh, we're very grateful for it and it'll be stored in areas and probably over the next two or three days we, we will need it. And uh, we'll do everything we can to support the efforts of the people who are trying to recover people from the, uh, from the debris and the horror that's uh, taken place down there. The number to call if you have uh, questions, I'm not sure we can answer all of your questions, but at least we can try to answer it, is one two one two. Five six zero two seven three zero. That's one two one two five six zero two seven three zero. If you have questions throughout the night and tomorrow, that's the number to call, rather than nine one one, which you should just call if if there is an emergency. We had over one thousand one hundred emer emergency room visits today, that we know of. Uh, so, so far. We have six fatalities that we know of, five at St. Vincent's. Uh, obviously and tragically, there are going to be a lot more than that, but that's, that's what we know of at this point. Uh, we had over 300 patients that were treated at St. Vincent's, over 160 at Bellevue, 250 at Beekman Downtown Hospital. And the hospital, uh, th these hospitals were probably the ones under the most stress, but they were able to get through. Uh, I want to thank all the people that helped uh, St. Vincent's getting the, uh, the water that they needed and the support that they needed. Uh, also, I would, I'd like to say to uh, people that, that might consider doing this that uh, services should be made available in New York City tomorrow on a fair and equitable basis. Anybody that thinks that they're going to uh, gouge consumers or uh, ask for extra amounts of money for food or anything else, we're going to have the police and the Consumer Affairs Department out there uh, so just be careful. This is a time in which we all have to cooperate and help each other. Alternate side street parking is uh, suspended. Sanitation services will take place in most of the city, except obviously in the lower part of Manhattan, where the sanitation department will be working to remove uh, debris, which has already started. And uh, the schools, again, will be closed tomorrow. And hopefully we'll get them open as soon as possible. Tomorrow, the effort will be at trying to recover as many people as possible and trying to clean up uh, the horrible mess that was created by all of this. And I would ask people to cooperate as much as possible in that effort. If you have to come into Manhattan because your business is essential, then obviously do it. The upper part of Manhattan will be open. But if tomorrow is a day in which you want to stay home and stay with your family and uh, give comfort and support maybe to other people that have been affected by this, it would, it would be a good day to do that. Yeah, I, I, the point that Richie Shira makes is we, uh, the, 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 the people are wonderful, yeah. and, and, we, it re, and I mean this in the best sense of the word. We've had thousands and thousands of people that have come to help us. When I was down at the 
site near the World Trade Center, I met uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the National Guards people that the governor has sent. Uh, really wonderful young men and women. Uh, we have enough volunteers now. You know, we have m more volunteers, frankly, than, than we need at this point. And what we need to do is to focus the efforts of the professionals that are there in being able to do the recovery and try to save as many lives as we can and restore services as quickly as possible. We, we may be asking for more volunteers tomorrow and the next day and the day after, but right now we don't need <coughs> any, any more volunteers. There are people who yes. Are still alive and well alive. Yes. There's hope. There's hope that there are there 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 will be there are people that are still that are that they're that are still alive. How and is the rescue effort hampered by the darkness? What do you what do you do? We we moved we um, we moved a lot of lights in, uh, so that the area is being lit now, so that I don't I don't think the rescue effort is is going to be hampered by the darkness. The rescue effort is hampered by the fact that there's still fire there. There are still, still unsound structures, and it's still dangerous, although the rescue effort is now taking place. But if you're asking me, is it hampered? It's hampered because of the conditions, not because of the, of the nighttime. Can you is there, is there a long procession of uh, heavy bulldozers and construction equipment making its way down to lower Manhattan? Uh, what is that going to be used for? That's going to be used to move debris out of the way so that the emergency vehicles can get in and out uh, quickly so that we can get the ambulances in. Tonight, thousands are feared dead from the worst act of violence on American soil. You have been watching our special coverage from our sister station, WTNH. The 10 o'clock news does begin right now. We want to start our broadcast tonight with the Governor Rowland speaking live on this day of terror in Stanford. And even into next week. Um, at